Tonight we're going through Lost Memories. And for those who don't know what Lost Memories is, go ahead and get this up here. Wow. So, Lost Memories is a book that was originally released as supplementary material, uh, part of a Silent Hill 3 official Konami strategy guide, game guide, uh, that came out alongside Silent Hill 3's release in 2003. So, basically, if you bought that guide, that Silent Hill 3 guide, if you read through it one way, um, it was your guide for playing through Silent Hill 3, and then if you flipped it over and turned it turned it around and went through it backwards, basically, um, it is this. It is Lost Memories. Um, so it's just basically a collection of notes and images and commentary from developers. Um, so it's information, basically a lore guide for the first three Silent Hill games. And most of the time when you're, if, if you're, if you've seen any of my story playthroughs in the past, if you've seen any story playthroughs or Silent Hill, uh, you know, informational content type of stuff out there, um, nine times out of 10, a lot of that information is for Silent Hill one through three anyway, is being pulled from stuff that's from this book, little bits of fact and developer commentary that comes from this book. So I figured it would be interesting. Um, I've been thinking more and more about doing these kind of streams. We, we did another stream the other night, uh, just kind of listening to and discussing a podcast interview with uh, the two writers, two main writers for Silent Hill Homecoming. And I've been trying to think about how to kind of incorporate some of these informational things into playthroughs and stuff like that for a long time and basically I'm at a point where I'm like it doesn't need to be part of a playthrough I can just make an entire stream out of doing this going over sources of information because that is also something that has always been very important to me when it comes to doing the story playthroughs and stuff is is giving a lot of accurate information um so this is, I figure, something new for a lot of people. Some people might be familiar with this, but maybe haven't gone through it uh, in its entirety. Um, some people, I'm sure many people might not know about this guide or uh, this book or anything at all. But um, yeah, so essentially this, this guide was only released uh, as part of that Silent Hill 3 guide. Uh, uh, which was only in Japan, but as you can see, Wall of Death uh, translated this, and uh, Femark and A. N. Weiss uh, designed a sort of website around translation and you scans from the actual guide, all of the images and stuff like that, to basically put together this English version of the Lost Memories Guide. So we're just going to go through it. We're just going to go through all of it. The Lost Memories, the Silent Hill series overview. Wonderful image there. Uh, Masahiro Ito actually posed the character models and did the lighting and stuff. Uh, for a lot of these images, uh, he's commented on Twitter about uh, putting together these promotional images and things was uh, was something that he enjoyed doing. The name of that town is Silent Hill. Although it is known as a scenic resort area, it is a cursed place where the town's former inhabitants were once driven away, brutal executions were once carried out, and a mysterious plague was once prevalent. The town is centered around Toluca Lake from which a thick fog perpetually enshrouds the area and makes vague the reality and dreams of those who visit the town. And according to those who have seen them, there are also times when things that should not naturally exist appear. A few incidents that have occurred in this town up to this point have gone unaddressed 
leaving behind a great number of mysteries. Here and now, looking back on it all, let's elucidate these mysteries one by one. Silent Hill area map. So, I mean, this breaks down everything from maps to characters and character relations. It goes game by game. You can see over here uh, for one, th one, two, and three. And then there's a whole lot of extra information, uh, citations for all of the works, inspirational works and things. So we've got a lot to go through. Hey, Kurt. Alright, so our Silent Hill area map. Silent Hill is a rural town located in Northeast America. To start with, let's look at the summary of the buildings and locations that have become the setting for the series. Lakeside Amusement Park. An amusement park built on the outskirts of town. The park is adjacent to the church. Lakeview Hotel. Before the second game took place, the hotel was completely destroyed by a fire. Though, even just little lines like that just it's stuff that's explained in the game but in case you weren't aware like james perceiving the hotel as looking just like it did three years ago the way that it is here is a false image that's james perception of reality not being correct and uh after he watches the vhs tape the hotel is like burned and there's water damage and stuff everywhere so that's like the actual state of the hotel The Silent Hill Historical Society. The Historical Society traces the history of the town with paintings and photographs. And that has been uh, something very important that gets cited quite often. In fact, recently we had a discussion in Discord where we were talking about kind of Pyramid Head and where, uh, like, whether or not Pyramid Head should be something uh, that can appear in the other games. Um, we were talking about a bit about that during the homecoming um, discussion the other night as well. <clears throat> and according to Masahiro Ito, things that he said on Twitter is the whole reason Pyramid Head looks the way he does is because James and Mary, when they were on vacation, they came to the Silent Hill Historical Society and they saw that painting, Misty Day, um, where it depicts Pyramid Head. It's, it's supposed to be one of the town's executioners, uh, you know, depicted in that painting. But that imagery is a painting that physically exists in the historical society. So it's like, oh, anybody could have gone to this same historical society and seen that same painting and also manifest that same image of an executioner under the right circumstances. But at the same time, Ito has also expressed that Pyramid Head was explicitly something that he made for James and that it doesn't feel correct using it in anything where James is not, you know, a part of the story. So it's weird. Over time, Ito has given sort of conflicting information. Um, and that brings up a point that I always try to make when I'm talking about information regarding the series and information in general, I guess. Um, with Silent Hill, I always sort of categorize how uh, relevant or how much you can trust information in sort of like a formation, like a tier list. And the top tier, you know, most reliable information is just what you get from the games themselves. Things that are very blatantly explained and expressed. It's not necessarily something that's like can be interpreted in multiple ways. Uh, that is sort of always like the strongest evidence that you have. After that, I would usually trust like developer commentary. Um, but the reason why I don't hold that in as high regard is we've seen provably that there's many times where developers either through just mistake or confusion or forgetting things, um, give incorrect information as well. So sometimes that happens. And then below that, I usually consider supplementary material like this. 
So supplementary material, you you have to have even more of a kind of grain of salt with it, because not only is it sourced from not necessarily the developers themselves, there are quotes and things from the developers, but usually these types of things are put together by different uh, writers and interns and, and different parts of Konami, not necessarily the game dev team. They'll, they'll have notes and resources given to them from the team, and they'll have like quotes and information from some of the developers uh, as part of this. But otherwise, some of these things written without a citation might just be written there by an intern who didn't really know better and just had to put something there for the guide. So, can't always take information at face value is, is the short version of that rant. But keep that in mind while we're going through and looking at all this. Regardless of all that, this is still a lot of really interesting information. Uh, Brookhaven Hospital, a hospital that was built in response to the outbreak of an epidemic that once swept the town. And you find uh, information about that in Silent Hill 2, examining some of the uh, notes and things in the historical society and around Brookhaven. Rosewater Park, a park on the water that looks out onto Toluca Lake. Stone statues and monuments here communicate the town's history. Uh, and that's where you'll find the statue of, like, Jennifer Carroll, where the description on the statue uh, says persecuted by the Christians. So, who was persecuted by the Christians in Silent Hill? The cultists, at one point. So, it's a statue sort of commemorati commemorating the, the cult and a particular cultist. Um, but it's interesting that you find elements of that throughout a game even like Silent Hill 2 where the cult is not really a main part of the story in Silent Hill 2 the way that it is with the other games but it still plays a big role in the history of the town the observation deck the entirety of Toluca Lake is visible from the viewing platform this is the starting point of the second game sure is That uh, iconic shot of the lake. The lake which is actually uh, in Keswick called Derwent Water in England. Which is uh, what the photos you for Silent Hill 2, Team Silent used photos of that lake. Derwent Water for the background of Toluca Lake to create that image. The residential area and we have like the map right out of Silent Hill 1 the area that became the opening scene of the first game is the new town situated on the north side of the lake among other things the church and elementary school are found here though so it even kind of discusses separation of where Silent Hill 1 takes place where Silent Hill 2 takes place like it's different parts of the town that are all around Lake Toluca. The business district. Uh, the business district across the bridge is the location of a shopping center and hospital, among other things. It's busier than the south side of the lake. So that's where Alcamilla Hospital is. You can see there the Silent Hill Town Center, which is the mall in Silent Hill 1, where you fight uh, the Caterpillar boss, uh, Twin Feeler, Green Lion Antiques. Uh, run by Dahlia Gillespie, where she has the uh, the other church, the hidden church uh, behind the wall. Police station, all the notable areas over here. In this area, you can see Coon Street and then Alcamilla Hospital at the very south end of the map. If you were to consider Silent Hill Origins, uh, Origins continues this part of the map down here and goes uh, further south. Don't forget the giant prison in the middle of the shopping district. Yeah, exactly. They they had to redesign the town a little bit when the tourism stuff fell through. Not really. Those games are just whatever. Not canon. <laughs> this only covers one through three because that's when this guide came out. This, this came out with the guide for Silent Hill 3, so it's interesting because the way it's 
sort of released and discussed, it feels like three was meant to, to kind of be the end of the series. Resort area located south of the residential area is the resort town. The amusement park can be reached by advancing west on the main road. So if you kept going west on uh, Sanford Street here, you eventually get to Lakeside Amusement Park. And you can see Silent Hill 1, that's where you run out uh, across the water to get to the lighthouse. And uh, yeah, here's the little side quest area where you meet Kaufman, go to the Indian Runner. Get the Aglophitus and the motorcycle. Timelines. Everybody always talks about timelines, and there are so many variations of timelines. There's official timelines that don't line up with other official timelines, and there's fan timelines that kind of line up, but not really. Time doesn't work well when you take in a lot of things, <laughs> take into account most of the series, but it's not too bad when you're just looking at the first three games, so... I think it's interesting that they gave kind of like an official timeline for some major events and things here. Uh, the history of Silent Hill, a town that possesses a mysterious power, Silent Hill. Using facts introduced in the games as a foundation, let's delve into the history of this town. We have the year, uh, the major events in American history, and how it's relevant to Silent Hill. Here you go, American history lesson. We're actually doing... <laughs> Just kidding. You're you're here to learn. You thought you were here to be entertained. So before the uh, 1600s, Native Americans conducted rituals in the area. This land is valued as a sacred place in Native American religion, and there will be. It goes further into uh, the folklore and everything that it notes uh, here down below. Around 1607, England begins colonizing North America. In the late 1600s, settlers begin to come to Silent Hill. Uh, 1692 would have been the Salem Witch Trials in Massachusetts. So, just to give an idea of, like, spirit mindset, uh, religious tones at the time. With people are being burned for, you know, and, and killed for uh, witchcraft or presumptions of practicing witchcraft. Early 1700s, a mysterious epidemic breaks out and the town is abandoned. So this is mentioned um, in in-game notes that before Silent Hill was settled, there was another town in the same place, but the name of that town was Lost Time. So this is kind of somewhat explaining um, that first town going and having this mysterious epidemic breaking out and the area being abandoned the first time around. 1776, the U.S. Declaration of Independence. 1789, the first presidential inauguration of George Washington. And around this time, uh, shortly after, between that and 1810, the town uh, is resettled as a penal col colony. <clears throat> Silent Hill Prison is constructed. Brookhaven Hospital is constructed in response to the outbreak of an epidemic. Uh, and Alan Smith paints the waterfront landscape. So waterfront landscape is one of the paintings that you can examine in Silent Hill 2 uh, that credits the artist and gives like a particular year. So that's why they include it as part of this timeline. Um, but that is how Silent Hill itself wound up being built. It was originally built as a penal colony. But the prison was basically the first thing that got built. 1820, Maine becomes a state. There's a lot of people who still argue whether or not Silent Hill takes place in Maine, whether the setting is in Maine or not. Um, why would this be part of significant timeline otherwise? Silent Hill 2 soundtrack also gives an address for Heaven's Night, a fictional address for Heaven's Night, and it's a, it's a main area code. So, 
if there was ever any doubt that Silent Hill takes place in Maine. There you go. 1830, beginning of forced removal policy for Native Americans. So this is when the settlers started forcing out all of the natives and obviously a whole bunch of horrible, horrible shit, both in actual American and human history, but also relevant to Silent Hill. There's a lot of extreme pain and suffering that is now being exposed to this area on top of the previous epidemics and settlers and everything else. <clears throat> Around 1840, Silent Hill Prison closes, so that's when it starts kind of converting from a penal colony into more of a generally functioning town. Uh, a coal field is discovered, and the Wilts Coal Mine opens, which leads to the revitalization of the town. Should be noted that the coal mine uh, just gets mined out, does not catch fire. Uh, there is not, like, a coal fire burning. That was all stuff that was introduced with the Silent Hill movie. A lot of people tend to confuse the lore of the movie with the lore of the games. Um, they are completely separate things. But, yeah, in terms of the games, there is a coal mine, uh, the Wilts Coal Mine, but basically it's what allowed the town to initially be built up, and then once they mined out all the coal the town needed to change to something else in order to continue to function economically. And that's when it switches over to tourism. <clears throat> but there's never any kind of disaster with the coal mine. Uh, 1861, outbreak of the American Civil War. And relevant to Silent Hill, a man called Chester and his son both participate in the war. Uh, Toluca Prison Camp is constructed for POWs, so they... Uh, expand on this. This is, again, things that are referenced. There are statues referencing uh, Chester and uh, things like that in uh, Rosewater Park in Silent Hill 2 and in some of the other notes and things. So cool that they take all of these little references from the games and kind of put them into the time overall timeline for the history. Um, you also see a little bit of this time period... Uh, much later on, uh, not very canonically, I don't know, however much you want to consider it canon, there's a comic book series called Silent Hill Past Life that takes place during this time period. And that's actually where the character of Howard Blackwood, the mailman from Downpour, originally comes from those comics. He's been in Silent Hill since the 1860s. And, uh, you basically learn a little bit of his backstory and some other history of the town through those comics, although it's not especially accurate and it's basically a prequel to Downpour, but, you know, if you like that kind of thing, if you want further reading, check out Silent Hill Past Life. Uh, the Toluca Prison Camp is constructed for uh, POWs during the American Civil War, culmination of the Civil War in 1865. 1866, the prison camp is converted into Toluca Prison. So, you can see there's like multiple variations of the prison. It wasn't always the same prison. And this prison, Toluca Prison, this variation, is what we wind up seeing in Silent Hill 2. Uh, when James essentially goes downstairs, he steps back into time, and you find a note, um, at the bottom of the stairs on the desk, and I think the date given is 1866 or or something like that. I think that's why this is put here, or it's sometime after 1866. But either way, that's like where the prison is at um, when you uh, when you delve into it in Silent Hill 2. Yurimi, thank you so much. 65 months, man. On the coolest driver's high. Good shit. Thank you so much, man. Uh, around 1890, end of the Native Americans' organized resistance. At this time, people everywhere in the town mysteriously disappear one after the other. So, again, they sort of are mimicking the, the real-life Roanoke uh, colony mystery uh, in a lot of this. 
uh, let's see it. Early 1900s, uh, Toluca Prison closes and Silent Hill becomes a sightseeing area. So this is when it starts converting over into tourism. November 1918, a sightseeing ship called the Little Baroness goes missing. That uh, Little Baroness going missing on uh, Toluca Lake in 1918, that also gets expanded upon in the Silent Hill arcade game. Uh, yes, there is a Silent Hill arcade game. It's a on-rail light shooter-like <laughs> type game, like House of the Dead. Um, and yes, it has story. It has lore. And uh, it basically delves into a little bit of the history of uh, the Little Baroness and uh, some of the descendants of people who were uh, a part of that ship going missing. 1939, strange events take place at the Toluca Lake, uh, or just at Toluca Lake in general. It doesn't specify. Those are the same notes where Little Baroness uh, gets mentioned. Yeah, and Pyramid Head is in it for reasons, of course, because Pyramid Head's in everything. Uh, and then in the year 19XX, when Mega Man takes place, uh, the mayor of Silent Hill dies suddenly, and one after the other, the staff at a development group die accidental deaths. So these are some of the events that are preceding the events of Silent Hill 1. You learn about the anti-drug mayor who uh, suddenly dies, and a lot of those are most likely uh, Michael Kaufman's doing. <clears throat> Metropole Modern. What the fuck is that emote combination? That pyramid head emote. That's wonderful. Hey, Mega Death Bunny. <laughs> Clearly, I'm important. Pyramid head is very important to the lore. Masahiro Ito, uh, unrelated, <laughs> Masahiro Ito also wishes he never fucking created Pyramid Head. For some reason. <laughs> Almost like he was unhappy with his character being paraded around as a mascot. Twitter ruins everything? Yeah, it's fine. It's fine. Folklore. Sacred ground where Native Americans conducted mysterious rituals. Before settlers came from Europe, Silent Hill was a holy place. Even then, the land seemed to possess a mysterious power. And of course, they cite uh, the Lost Memories uh, book that you find in Silent Hill 2. They called this place the Place of the Silent Spirits. By spirits, they meant not only their dead relatives, but also the spirits that they believed inhabited the trees, rocks, and water around them. They revered the town as the Place of the Silent Spirits. However, they were driven away by settlers and had to abandon the town. What website is this? This is the Book of Lost Memories. Uh, one second. More lore, more lore. Yeah, sorry. One second. If you would like to look through this or bookmark it and uh, look at it all on your own time, there's the link in chat. It's through uh, SilentHillMemories.net, which is already an excellent source of Silent Hill information for those of you who weren't already aware. Uh, but yeah, it's hosted through that. Um, again, this book was originally released as part of a physical Silent Hill 3 guide that was only in Japan in 2003. Um, Wall of Death translated it, and Femark and Kay and Wiss formatted it into the website that we are viewing today. So, that's what we're looking through.
And yeah, this is just a very commonly cited uh, source of information when it comes to the first three Silent Hill games. And um, I I figured a lot of people are either maybe not aware of it or not uh, haven't gone through all of it or anything like that. So I figured it would be interesting to go through all of it and just read all of it, narrate all of it, discuss it as we read. Um, Because, yeah, it's a very good source of some interesting Silent Hill information. And that's kind of what I'm all about here. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's the history with um, the spiritual power sort of surrounding the town, the Native American tribes that how they, you know, felt this was a holy place even before the town was settled. Gives an idea of where all of this is. In history, and then prison. After the spread of an epidemic, resettling of the town as a penal colony begins. Many people lost their lives on this abominable soil. Consequently, the town was used at first as a penal colony. It was at this time that it was given the name Silent Hill. So this is when, once that uh, initial prison was built, the penal colony started, and it was officially the beginning of Silent Hill. After the closing of the prison, the historical society was built on its former site. It conveys a sense of the town's history. So specifically, the historical society is built on the same location where the prison originally stood. So when in Silent Hill 2, when you enter the historical society and you go downstairs, those stairs are not supposed to exist. But those stairs that you go down, you're, you're going back in time. You're in the same location. You're, you know, you go in as the historical society in the same place, but James goes back, you know, a hundred years or more to this, uh, this prison instead. It gives a really interesting perspective to that whole segment of the game. You're not just like going into the ruins of a building that was supposed to be there. You're, you're somewhere that should not exist, that hasn't existed for such a long time. Epidemic. Once more, the threat of a plague steadily wraps the town in darkness. The town was stricken by an epidemic. It may be that because of the unforeseen deaths of the town's population, as well as, as, well as the thoughts and feelings of the prisoners, the original power that the town held was gradually distorted. So this even gives some inclination as to where the town's power started to twist since Native Americans treated it as like a holy land it wasn't always evil it wasn't always necessarily something negative it became distorted over time um, the thoughts the feelings the prisoners um, the people you know ill from the epidemic uh, again all of this sort of pain and suffering kind of twisted that power that was already present The current incarnation of Brookhaven Hospital has existed since it became large-scale in the late 1800s. So, just to give context as to how old Brookhaven is, how long it's been part of the town. Um, and you do get that information in Silent Hill 2 as well. The Civil War. The town is drawn into the Civil War that divided the nation in two. The Civil War occurred in 1861. The stone statue by the lake is a memorial to Patrick Chester, a soldier who fought in the war at this time. So, like I mentioned, there are some statues and things that you can examine in Rosewater Park. You get a little bit of town history in Silent Hill too. Things that are very, very easy to miss for most uh, casual players. Um, or even if you do examine them, you're, you're not always in the mindset to kind of put it in the context of the town's history. Uh, although the conflict was originally born from political op uh, opposition, it was distorted by future generations into an issue concerning the birth of the religious cult. So that's interesting to consider the divisions of the town not only being political during the Civil War, but there was further division in Silent Hill because of the the religious uh, the differing religious beliefs. You had people with more traditional, like, I guess, Christian beliefs based on the Jennifer, Jennifer Carroll statue, and then you had the early cultists. Toluca Lake. After becoming a sightseeing area, a series of misfortunes befall the town. 
With the closing of Wilt's coal mine came the attempted reinvention of the town as a tourist attraction. However, due to a succession of boating accidents, the town gained a poor reputation as a sightseeing area. So, Wilt's coal mine, nothing bad happened. It just closed. They, they mined all the coal out and switched over to tourism. But, excuse me, but because of the boats going missing, because of the uh, little baroness going missing and all of these strange things happening, it even struggled as a tourist town, as a sightseeing area. Which would explain why it never really grew beyond, like, a relatively small population. The famous Toluca Lake is a place that overflows with atmosphere. It is known as an ominous lake that has become completely shrouded in a pervasive mist. Alessa's History Silent Hill is a town where an ominous god is worshipped and where those who hold darkness in their hearts gather. This is a look back at half of the lifetime of the young girl from whom it all originated. 20 years ago. So, it says however many years ago, but this is from the perspective of the events of Silent Hill 1. So, 20 years ago. One after the other, the staff at a development group die accidental deaths. Mysterious consecutive deaths. The staff of a company that was working on developing the town as a sightseeing area died mysteriously one after the other. Because of the extent of the mystery surrounding the cause of these deaths, it was rumored that there was some connection to the town's religion. It was thought that the mysterious deaths overlapped with the strange faith from the town's past. And it's even got a screenshot there of Lisa when she's kind of explaining a bit of that history to Harry. And several people connected with developing the town died in accidents. People started dying mysteriously. Some of that could have been through the cult or through Kaufman's interference. Some of that could have just been the town doing weird shit to certain people. Um, a lot of that is left very much ambiguous. Uh, 14 years ago, Alessa is born. Alessa had unique abilities since she was very young. In school, they called her a witch and tormented her by excluding her and scribbling on her desk. In Nowhere, of the first game, we catch a glimpse of the pain that characterized Alessa's childhood. And I mean, we get more than a glimpse. I mean, you, you see this scene with her sitting and crying under the desk. Um in nowhere, but we also have multiple clues to that. You see the desk with all the writing on it in Midwich. And, uh, Twelve years ago, Claudia is born. Interesting to, you know, make sure and include that, because again, this came out with Silent Hill 3. Claudia is born. Two years after Alessa, Claudia is born. The parents of the two girls were of the same faith, and it seems that they were on extremely good terms during their childhood. In Alessa's room, memories of the two of them remain. There are playing cards on the floor. I used to play a lot, and that's a good scene to uh, cite there. As in Silent Hill 3, as Heather, after she gets her memories back, and she can remember her lifetime as Alessa, she's recalling all of these times where her and Claudia, as children, um, were very close and did things together. They played cards together, and Alessa would often win uh, playing cards against Claudia, and Claudia would cry. So there was, like, this specific, you know, history between the two. Wish there's a little book for Silent Hill 4, too. There are some supplementary things for Silent Hill 4, but not quite to this uh, extent yet. Cards Against Claudia. Yeah, it's the new Cards Against Humanity expansion. Eleven years ago, Harry suffers the death of his wife. Um, it goes through and mentions uh, the death of Harry's wife, and this is something that I've had to go through and try and cite and find sources for, because as far as I know, Harry's wife's name is, is Jody. Jody Mason. 
but I'm I'm I struggle to find what the very first thing that gave that information was. And I might have been the play novel. Cause I know it's not it's not in Silent Hill 1. It's not in the manual. Um it's not in this. This I'm pretty sure only ever refers to her as his wife, Harry's wife. So I think it might be play novel. <clears throat> Um, Harry suffers the death of his wife 11 years ago. Seven years ago, Cheryl is born. Dahlia's ritual. Wait, how did Harry suffer the death of Jody when they both found Cheryl? In the opening cutscene, it's Jody and Harry finding the baby. Is that just a thing for the sake of the game cutscene? See, this is why you can only trust supplementary material, even if it's official, so much. I, I'm glad you pointed this out, Future, because I wanted to get to it. They even talk about that specific scene later when we get into the like Silent Hill 1 story preview stuff. Um, they reference that. There's like the scene, if it shows it. Great image. jumping ahead a little bit. Harry stands with his wife holding a baby in his arms, although it doesn't appear in the main part of the game. This image is probably from the moment when Cheryl was found. But according to this timeline of Alessa's history, wife died and then Cheryl's born. But even in Silent Hill 1, this is not correct. Harry says um, four years. He says his wife died four years ago, implying that, like, Cheryl would have been three. Like, they found her together. They raised her together for the first three years. Then Jody died, and Harry continued raising Cheryl until the age of seven. Because in Silent Hill 1, Harry has dialogue where he says Jody died, or he says his wife died four years ago. He says, seven years ago I found Cheryl, four years ago my wife died. That's the, I think that's the cutscene after you save um, Sybil, and he's explaining that he adopted her. different wife <laughs> two different dead wives yeah really bad luck but yeah this is this just goes to show this there's a lot of interesting information in here but this is not altless you know Dahlia's ritual a fire breaks out that burns down six houses in the business district it was declared that Alessa's dead body had been found at the Gillespie house which was the origin of the fire. However, the cause of this fire was a ritual that Dahlia conducted using her daughter Alessa in order to bring about the coming of God. Lisa nursed Alessa, who was made to continue living by means of an incantation. Kaufman probably replaced the body. So given everything we just pointed out, where there is provably inaccurate information in this already. How does everybody feel about this information? The fire was part of the ritual. What, or rather, I mean, even that, it's not specific. The cause of this fire was a ritual that Dahlia conducted using her daughter Alessa in order to bring about the coming of God. It still doesn't even say whether or not the house burning down was an intentional part of that ritual or a side effect. I guess they didn't want to be too specific on that either. And then Kaufman probably replaced the body. So the idea being that for the for the, like the official report 
Hoffman put a, a decoy body at the Gillespie home so that they could say, oh, Alessa died in the fire. And then the real Alessa is kept, uh, is kept in, in Alcamilla secretly in, in the underground room. Just got here. Did you go over monster names yet? Just curious because of how many people get the names mixed up in Silent Hill 1. Not yet, but eventually, yeah, we'll get there. Dahlia could have been doing a ritual and candles or something caused a fire, but Alessa didn't want it to happen with her parents. See, it's not specific. I can see it as fire being a part, but then Alessa freaking out and causing the house to burn. So, like, fire was supposed to play some small role, but then Alessa's powers reacting made it an, an uncontrollable fire. Because Silent Hill 1 does have the boiler explosion note, but again, there's there's sort of two sides of belief on that one. Whether the note is a cover-up or whether the note is what actually happened. And that's why it was like hidden away. Because fire to cleanse But that that starts that starts going into movie territory. That's movie lore territory. Cause remember, Dahlia didn't think that Alessa needed to be cleansed. She fully believed in her daughter and her daughter's powers. They were not like a bad thing. She was not like, you're a witch and I must cleanse you. She's like, oh, you're very powerful. You will be a wonderful mother of God. Like you are perfect for this ritual. The ritual which is just impregnating her with the god to be born. The way it's implied in Silent Hill 1 is that the god has to essentially grow through pain and suffering. Which would be like why Alessa would be burned and kept in a coma. Like she's existing in a painful nightmare for years just to make the god growing in her as powerful as possible. Originally, it wasn't supposed to take that long, but because she split her soul, they couldn't complete the ritual. They couldn't birth the god. The fire was an accident, right? Alessa was just stressed and overwhelmed, and she lost control, leading to a fire. See, that's what's implied by the boiler room explosion theory, like that the ritual was happening and did not involve burning Alessa. And that while the ritual was happening, Alessa was freaking out about being impregnated with a god and caused a boiler to explode in the Gillespie home and that the fire was the result of an accident. But that's what I mean. Some people, the reason that theory exists is because of a note that's found in Silent Hill 1 that explains that, that boiler explosion. A lot of people don't know about that note because due to a glitch, it's not in the North American release of the game. It's only in the PAL and Japanese release of Silent Hill 1. So a lot of the North American audience doesn't even know about that, that note's existence. Um, and for people who started the series later and played Silent Hill Origins, Origins sort of retcons that note. Um, so it's a very complicated sort of idea of like what exactly happened origins lol and that's my response as well like you some people like again for people who started were younger and started like their psp was their first ever game console handheld whatever and origins may have been the first silent hill game they ever played some people consider the story of origins a lot more than somebody like me who's like yeah, <laughs> not only have I started with the original games and know them very thoroughly, but I know the history of the development behind Silent Hill Origin. Sam Barlow basically had to rewrite the whole fucking thing in a week, and even he thought it was a bad idea. So, if that puts Origins into any kind of context of whether or not it should be canon or not, even the guy who wrote it and directed it and basically created it was like, <laughs> this is a bad idea, and I had to rush it. <laughs> I don't think we should count it as canon. Probably shouldn't be considered. Hey. 
We could sit here and spend the next 12 hours discussing this, or we could continue reading the book. No time indicated. Drug circulation. After the fire in the business district, a drug known as PTV becomes prevalent in town. First a criminal investigator and then the mayor, who had redoubled efforts to impose control, met with mysterious deaths, one after the other. So that would be Officer Gucci. He has a name. He's not just a criminal investigator. His name is Officer Gucci. Uh, and the mayor, who, funny enough, did not get a name. He's just called the anti-drug mayor. Um, these are the people who uh, Michael Kaufman most likely uh, got rid of, had them killed or killed them himself in order to cover up his, uh, his drug ring because he's working in collaboration with the cult. He's not part of the cult, but he's working with them to make money off of them by... Uh, refining the white claudia that glows in the that grows in the area uh into the ptv drug and distributing it to the cult and the tourists are we really throwing gucci in here gucci is just a name believe it or not i know a lot of people associate it only with the fashion brand but it's called that because it is named after a person it, it it's a name um, and this officer's name who was involved in the, the drug investigation was Officer Gucci. I meant the cop from the film. Yeah, the cop from the film is named after a officer that's mentioned in a note in Silent Hill 1. Remember, this guide that I'm reading came out in 2003. This came out along with Silent Hill 3. The movie didn't exist yet. Nothing else existed except for Silent Hill 1, 2, and 3. Officer Gucci was in the original game. Yeah, Gucci's referenced by name. In, in there's a note that you find in the police station. Um, that that mentions Officer Gucci uh, being the drug investigator who is who is investigating the town, and mysteriously died of a heart attack. The same as the anti-drug mayor. So, that character for the movie is actually based, at least in name, uh, on. A referenced character in Silent Hill 1. That's why we're doing this, baby. That's why I love going through all the information and doing this kind of discussion. There's so much misinformation out there. Not even misinformation, just misunderstanding between elements of the games and elements of the movie. There's There's become so much confusion with a lot of the original game's lore and the original developer's intentions. It's become so muddied with all of the Western developed games, with the movies and, and the comic books and all this other shit. Like, it's nice to go back and look at something like this, a guide that came out in 2003. You know, here is what Konami would have put out, what you know, with a lot of resources that Team Silent would have used, no other complicated other sources or media, you know, just this. It's interesting to go back and, and kind of look at it before everything started getting kind of muddied. Silent Hill, the events of Silent Hill, Heather is born. I guess that would be at the end of Silent Hill 1. Alessa, 14 years old at the time, suffered from the burns inflicted upon her since the ritual that brought about the descent of God. In order to escape Dahlia's control, she calls out to Cheryl, her other self, 7 years old at the time, to return. Due to the power of Alessa's thoughts, the town is transfigured into the other world. Already there's a lot of stuff. So, in order to escape Dahlia's control, she calls out to Cheryl. So, is it Alessa calling out to Cheryl and causing Cheryl to return? Because according to the in-game dialogue, Dahlia used a magical spell to call the other half of Alessa's soul back to the town. Dahlia takes credit for that, or for Cheryl wanting to come back to the town. Not that it's Alessa wanting her soul. Why would she want her soul to come back? If her soul come back comes back, then the ritual can be done the one thing she doesn't want to happen.
Due to the power of Alessa's thoughts, the town is transfigured into the other world. This also implies that this would be the first, like, iteration of the other world. There's always been a spiritual power. There's always been weird shit happening in Silent Hill all the way back for hundreds of years. But it's this event that transfigures the town into the other world. In his attempt to rescue his daughter, Harry becomes involved in the events that take place in Silent Hill. After the two girls became one, a new life was born. Isn't there also the possibility of the translation here being wrong? So, I'm not perfectly fluent in Japanese. I, I know some, um, but I could not, you know, do like a better translation. Um, I know other people who are more fluent who have looked over the original guides and have said that this is a an accurate translation. There's there's a few notable instances where mistranslation uh, was a thing that have that had been pointed out in the past, but for the most part, this is a fairly faithful like translation. Uh, but that is another thing that's worth pointing out. This is a guide that was originally released in Japan only, and we're looking at a translator's um, a translator's interpretations of it. So even though most people can look at the translation and the source, uh, people who are fluent and and state that it's accurate enough, um, there could still be subtle things that might make a difference in the way some of this is phrased. So that is still worth taking. Uh, taking note of. Five years later, a murder case in Portland. After the events of Silent Hill, Harry took Cheryl, Heather, and moved to Portland. So this is after Silent Hill 1. Good ending. Harry takes the new baby, which he also named Cheryl and raises her. That's the baby that eventually is Heather. However, her whereabouts were discovered by a cult member who was searching for her. Apparently at this time, Harry kills a perpetrator. And you find uh, Douglas's notebook that talks about this. Lived in Portland until 12 years ago, got wrapped up in a murder case. Harry shot suspect. When you read this full uh, notebook, it gives a little bit more detail, but essentially, yeah. Harry took the baby, moved to Portland. Uh, a cult member found them. Harry shot the cult member to death. Um, renamed Cheryl to Heather. And uh, presumably went into hiding. I don't know. It doesn't necessarily say he moves away from Portland. This is another thing that's always a little bit confusing because of the way Douglas phrases it. Like, where exactly are we at the beginning of Silent Hill 3? We're not in Silent Hill because it's not until after Harry's death, uh, Douglas drives Heather to Silent Hill. So, are they in Portland? Douglas mentions Portland. He says, I thought you grew up in Portland. But he doesn't say, like, I thought you grew up here in Portland. Presumably Harry would move to a different city after somebody found him and tried to, you know, take Cheryl away. And he had to shoot the fucker to death. You don't recall the murder case note at all? I read it every time we do a Silent Hill 3 story playthrough, because those are some of my favorite notes. The, the Douglas notebook and the notebook left from Harry are like two of my favorite notes in Silent Hill 3. I always make sure to read those when I get to that point where you pick up Douglas's notebook in the amusement park. No time indicated. Expansion of the religious organization. After Dahlia's death, there was a period of inactivity in the religious organization. However, after around 10 years had passed, it became active once more. The structure of the organization was adjusted and the number of adherents rapidly increased. One young priest was behind this renovation. Vincent is the one whose efforts financed and implemented the structure of the organization. 
So, thanks to Vincent, um, the cult was basically able to be revitalized. After the events of Silent Hill 1, there probably wouldn't have been a whole lot of the cult left. What remnants there were, you know, would have been a bit more scattered. And as Vincent would have grown up, continuing to be raised, he eventually... It doesn't really get into it, but Vincent does something to become successful. He has money to invest into the church to get them the the big church that their cult is in and um, all of the things that he describes in Silent Hill 3. I love that conversation um, where he talks about that, uh, you know, I built this place with my money, the power of money that you view with such scorn. Um, really good line of dialogue between him and, and Claudia. I like the, the way that they follow the same belief structure, but Vincent, because he has to handle sort of like the realistic, the financial aspects of the church, he's a little bit more grounded in reality. It's really weird. It's an interesting dynamic, but I love it. Seven years later, or excuse me, question mark years later, so even with all the timeline stuff that the guide gave us earlier, they're still not giving specific years for like Silent Hill 1, Silent Hill 2, things like that. <clears throat> the materialization of delusions. Silent Hill 2. Starting with the first game, the power that the town holds has intensified greatly. It has reached the point that those who hold darkness in their hearts are called to gather, and each of their unconscious minds is manifested. So, the lore reason for why the power is different. It's intensified. It's basically been sitting and stewing since the events of the first game, to the point that it just automatically starts feeding off of people who have enough darkness in them. Not even feeding off of them. That's making, that's my own interpretation of these words here. Manifesting their unconscious minds. It is just manifesting. Just taking what's there and making it real. Deep holes appear to those who hold darkness in their hearts. Seventeen years later, Silent Hill 3, though that is seventeen years after the events of Silent Hill 1, a priestess behaves recklessly. Claudia, a priestess in the religious organization, discovers Heather, who is the reincarnation of Alessa. In order to bring paradise to the world, she tries to resurrect the god that sleeps inside Heather. Claudia attempts to nurture the god that sleeps inside Heather with hatred. And uh, I think she does a pretty damn good job of that, tormenting Heather, killing her father, or at least having a creature kill her father. Um, all of the pain and suffering, everything that she forces Heather to endure in order to nurture that god up until the event, uh, the ending of Silent Hill 3. And here we have the character relation map. Is that Comic Sans? Again, remember, this is made by fans. This is translated and, and formatted by fans who, uh, I don't know, chose Comic Sans. A diagram of the uh, interrelations of the series characters centered around Alessa, who is repeatedly reincarnated. A deeper understanding is likely to be reached from summarizing the relationship to the religious organization. So, red shows parent and child relationships, purple shows husband and wife relationships, blue shows a transmigration of souls. Very easy to follow. Underline is characters connected to the religious organization. Gray are Silent Hill residents, people who actually live in Silent Hill. So Silent Hill 1 and 3, 
Uh, Sybil supports uh, Harry in his search for Cheryl. I like that this has to be specified as like a character relationship. Uh, Harry, the parent and child relationship, even though, yeah, it does specify adopted. Cheryl, so Harry <laughs> is the father of Cheryl, child that was found and adopted. Harry uh, also adopted Heather, child that was born anew, picked up and raised. So Harry just keeps adopting the same baby and naming her Cheryl over and over. Not confusing at all. I can see why fans have a very firm, easy to understand uh, grip on the Silent Hill lore. Douglas to Heather supports for uh, support for her revenge. I support you in your quest for revenge. I mean, I guess technically he does. Vincent to Heather. Why is his name red? He, it's underlined because he's connected to the organization. It's gray because he's a resident. Why is the name red? Because he's a bad guy. Support in stopping Claudia. So he does support Heather in stopping Claudia, kind of. Mostly. Uh, Claudia to Douglas commissions him to search for Heather. Claudia to Heather seeks her to bring about the rebirth of paradise. Leonard to Claudia, he is Claudia's father, abused her when she was a child. Heather to Claudia, revenge. I will revenge on you. Cheryl plus Alessa. Transmigration of souls into Heather. This is not a very good way of formatting this. Let me just say, like, to show character relationships, this could have been formatted in, in a much better way. Alessa to Cheryl divided into two uh, due to resistance to the technique used to bring about the descent of God. Lisa to Alessa, responsible for nursing her during her hospitalization. Kaufman to Lisa, gives her drugs and oversees Alessa's nursing. Kaufman to Dahlia, alliance centered around drugs. Dahlia to Alessa, her mother, performs the technique used to bring about the descent of God and impregnates her with the deity. And then Silent Hill 2. James and Angela meet in Silent Hill. James and Eddie murder. <laughs> that I mean that is a way that those characters are related James does murder Eddie that's just very funny to see it that plain James Eddie James to Eddie murder I will do a murder to you uh, husband and wife James and Mary murders her due to the burden of nursing her James to Maria projection of his delusion Maria and Mary closely resemble each other. That's it? That's all? They, they just resemble each other. They just look kind of alike. I think the connection's a little, little deeper than that, personally. Ernest Baldwin to Maria asks her to search for items. We bring in Ernest Baldwin, bringing Born from a Wish into this even? Asks her to search for... He's such an inconsequential character. Why is he part of the... That's so strange to me. This is so bizarre. What a weird page out of everything else in this. Laura to Eddie meet on the way to Silent Hill. And Laura and Mary meet during hospitalization. Yep. It's just there for the sake of simplistic explanation. Again, I think this is not a good format for... How much... You need a little more description for some of these character relationships that it would be uh this this could stand to be visualized better okay moving on to each of the games that was sort of like the overall information introductory information 
now we're getting into specifically Silent Hill 1. Harry, who appears in the first game as the protagonist, is the father of Heather, Cheryl, the heroine of Silent Hill 3. Let's look back at each aspect of the story that became the starting point for all the events that occur afterwards in the town of Silent Hill. What? That's my face. Silent Hill Story Preview Not being limited to simple character introductions, the opening depicts events that take place prior to the start of the game. After the good plus ending, the image in one section of the opening is altered. And that's true. Most people should know that, but for those who don't know that, in the original Silent Hill 1, when you have no save data, during the intro sequence you see Harry and his wife Jody holding a baby, presumably the moment that they found Cheryl, um, if you get the good plus ending, this changes to Sybil. So it'll be Harry and Sybil standing there looking at the little baby instead of Jody. The fear of blood tends to create fear for the flesh. A photograph of Alessa is projected following the words, the fear of blood tends to create fear for the flesh. This just breaks down scene by scene the intro. Uh, scene two, Harry stands with his wife holding a baby in his arms. Although it doesn't appear in the main part of the game, this image is probably from the moment when Cheryl was found. Yeah, Kurt, this will all be archived. Image three, Cheryl stands amidst the fog. Harry comes to wander about the town of Silent Hill in his attempt to find her. Image four, Harry awakens on the sofa in the cafe. He was dreaming that he was pursuing Cheryl and had lost his way in the other world. Or was he? Image five, the nurse Lisa crawls out from under the desk where she was hiding. The image is from the scene in which she runs into Harry for the first time in the hospital. And I like that it sort of specifies some of these scenes are from in the game, but then others are only part of the intro. Scene 6, Dahlia turns around as she becomes aware that Harry has entered the church. Behind her is an image of Christ on the cross, and it also is there to show that the Balkan church is a typical Christian church. It is not Dahlia's church, but um, she might be trying to sort of fool Harry into thinking that she's like, quote-unquote, normal, that she's like a religious nut, but she's a Christian religious nut, you know, not a cultist. Uh, image 7, only for an instant, a vision of Alessa appears in the boiler room in the basement of the elementary school. She looks older than she does in the photograph in scene 1. So this is where we see Alessa's projection of herself at her current age, at the age of 14, just without all of her burns. And then still wearing the uniform that she wore when she was 7 for some reason. I guess it's the only real uniform clothing she's ever really known. Scene 8, imploring him to help her, Lisa clings to Harry. She appears before him whenever the world is transfigured into the other world. Because, because Lisa is essentially a part of that other world, she's a manifestation. Why uh, they specifically depict her that way. Scene 9, having killed a creature with his gun, Kaufman feebly sits in a chair. This image is from the scene in which he encounters Harry for the first time in the hospital's examination room, where he shoots at Harry immediately after being told not to shoot. Uh, image 10. Sybil walks up with a mysterious smile. When she encounters Harry in the cafe, she is not yet aware of the seriousness of the situation. She should be, considering like she also wrecked her bike on the way into town. Um, and the whole reason that she's there is because they lost contact with the police station. So Sybil should know things are pretty serious. 
Scene 11, a single car drives up a deserted count, uh, county road. Riding in the car are Harry and Cheryl, who are going to Silent Hill for their vacation. Scene 12, nodding off in the passenger seat, Cheryl holds the sketchbook that Harry gave to her. Later, the sketchbook is found in the other side alleyway. This is also one of those assets that changes slightly from uh, version to version and early demos and stuff. You can see that the text on this is all mixed up. Um, there are early demo versions where that says drawing block. It says the words drawing block on it. But for whatever reason, most versions of the game, uh, retail versions, of it got changed. So instead of that, it just says this. It's like gibberish. C-O-O... W I G R D N O K. Weird little detail. Scene 13. A woman whose skin is inflamed as a result of burns and is wrapped in bandages which cover her whole body. This is the only image seen of Alessa suffering in her sickbed. Uh, and it is pretty much the only time we see Alessa in her actual form, like with all of her burns, all of her bandages. You get that, just those couple little scenes in the intro, and you see the in-game model sitting on the wheelchair covered in a cloak at the very end for um, good and good plus, but that's about it. <clears throat> Scene 14, after getting confirmation over her wireless, Sybil leaves the room in a haste. This is a depiction of the sequence of events prior to her arrival in Silent Hill. So that's Sybil receiving that call, uh, learning that communications with the police station in Silent Hill have stopped, and that she's going to go and investigate. They also get into this a little bit more in the Silent Hill play novel. Sybil has like an entire scenario going over what happened, the call that she got, and everything leading up to her going to the town. Scene 15. Drawing near to Kaufman, Lisa quarrels in a vehement tone. The fact that, uh, the fact that the matter of Alessa's nursing is at hand indicates the subject of their dispute. So, yeah, you have that scene of Lisa, like, yelling, you know, very angrily towards Kaufman. Scene 16, Lisa laughs as if possessed by something. Could this be the state induced by the drug administered to her by Kaufman? I never even considered this until reading this guide originally, where during that intro scene, you see Lisa sort of like laughing. And you'd never see that in game. So it's like, oh, the implication is like, okay, so we see Lisa, she's angry, she's yelling at Kaufman. Things are too weird. I don't want to look over that little girl anymore. And then Kaufman's like, shut up, here's your drugs. And then here's Lisa after the drugs. A Walter Sullivan. Walter Sullivan. Thank you so much for the 17 months. Welcome back. Hope you're doing well. But uh, yeah, that's an interesting little little footnote to that one. Scene 17. Driving alongside Harry's car, Sybil uses her fingers to signal something to him. She passes Harry and continues to drive on head. <laughs> like I said, perfect translation. Drive on ahead. Uh, scene 18. Immediately afterwards, for unknown reasons, Sybil's bike is rolled over on its side. His attention attracted by the bike, Harry is unaware of the imminent danger he is in. So we see, yeah, Sybil tries zooming past Harry. The bike winds up tipped over on the side of the road, and Harry, like, stops and looks back at it. Scene 19, a close-up of Dahlia looking back in bewilderment as she becomes aware of someone's presence. This is yet another image that doesn't appear in the main part of the game. Interesting. Who could she see? Who would be after her? Who would surprise Dahlia? Presumably before Harry's there. Now 
Now, we know what Dahlia was doing before the events of the game. She was looking around for a Glophitus. She knows that Kaufman would have it. And she's trying to find it, where he's hidden it. So if she's looking around the town for it, she destroyed his office <clears throat> and destroyed a bottle of it. This could potentially be Kaufman running into her somewhere. Catching her off guard while she's looking around. She's surprised, so it wasn't foretold by gyromancy. Good point. Scene 20. A single house surrounded by disused telephone poles and a pool of water. Could this be Dahlia's house where Alessa was burned in the fire? So this is the Gillespie home. Again, you never really see it uh, anywhere else. It's just in this... This little part of the, uh, the intro. But... For those who are interested in a little history of, of the this house itself, the house is based on a real house uh, that is in Maine, in Cushing, Maine, called the Olson House, O-L-S-O-N. Um, and the Olson House is a very old historic building. There are many famous paintings of it. So that is most likely why Team Silent would know of it as far as referencing it and designing a house after it. They're making a little town that's based in Maine. They looked at a famous painting of a house in Maine in order to figure out the architecture and things like that. So the Olsen house was used as the uh, inspiration for the design of the Gillespie house. Those big columns make it feel like a huge room. Yeah, it really is like a kind of a nonsense area. We never see anything like this. She's in like a, a Roman Colosseum. Scene 21. Harry hurriedly turns the wheel as he realizes that someone has appeared suddenly in front of the car. And if you're subscribed to Silent Hill 1 speedrunner Bo Rizzle, you should have an animated version of this as an, as an emote. I've also got it here for better Twitch TV. If you have BTTV and do Harry Steer, there it is. <laughs> Scene 22. In front of the car is a young girl with the same appearance as in scene 7. Could the female figure that Harry saw really have been Alessa? So that is this version of Alessa here, which obviously cannot exist. 14-year-old Alessa without burns is just a projection. So Alessa projected her image in front of Harry's car. In order to uh, get him into the town. I mean, this is where they were headed anyway. He was going to wind up here, but that's how it wind up. Uh, she wound up getting Harry to stop into the town. But it was not actually her. It was a projection of her. Scene 23. Upon attaining the good plus ending, the image in scene 2 is altered. Sybil replaces Harry's wife. One of those neat little things that, like I said, there's still fans even today who didn't know about that. If you if you don't have any save data or you don't have a memory card in the system, you'll see uh, Harry and his wife Jody during the intro. If you've gotten the good plus ending and that's on your memory card, then you'll see uh, this version of the scene with Sybil instead. Silent Hill Character Commentary The story from which the horror originates. 
let's take another look at the significance given to the characters that appear in In the Game. Harold Harry Mason. Age 32, sex male, job, writer, profile, a writer who lost his wife four years ago. See, even this says four years ago, not four years before they found Cheryl, four years before the events of Silent Hill 1. A writer who lost his wife four years ago and currently lives with his daughter. He takes Cheryl to Silent Hill in order to spend a long vacation with her. With the occurrence of a sudden car accident, he finds himself involved in strange events. Creator's comment. When development first began on the project, because of his role as the doting, dutiful father, he was given the name Humbert Mason, which was referenced from the protagonist of Stanley Kubrick's film Lolita. However, since this is an uncommon name, it was changed by the English staff. Actually, Harry was the nickname of the person who named the character. I thought they're the same, but... Ellipses. So, uh... Just to clarify some of that. So yeah, he was originally going to be Humbert Mason. They decided that was too uncommon of a name. And they went with Harry. And they said that's the nickname of the person who changed the name of the character. So that would be Harry Inaba, who was the voice director and casting director for Silent Hill 1. Uh, and the overall project coordinator for Silent Hill 1. So Harry Inaba, uh, he's a, I, I forget what his... Japanese proper name is, but his nickname is Harry, and um, everyone on the project knew him as Harry, so he was the one who decided to change Humbert to Harry and used his own English nickname for the character. Um, Harry Inaba also does a voice in Silent Hill 1. When you have the flashback scene of the Doctors and Kaufman and Dahlia, talking about Alessa splitting her soul uh, and you can hear one of the doctors kind of has like a heavy Japanese accent as half the soul is lost uh, that's Harry Inaba Sybil Bennett age 28 also can I just say how much it hurts me to know that I'm older than every Silent Hill character <laughs> protagonist. Harry's 32. I'm four years older than Harry Mason. Anyway, Sybil. She's 28. Female police officer from Brames. Brams. Brahms Ice Cream. A town adjacent to Silent Hill. Due to a sudden interruption of correspondence, she comes to Silent Hill to investigate. Creator's comment. Her last name is an allusion to Lorencia Bembenek, a real-life policewoman who was a murderer. So that is an actual historical thing. Uh, Lorencia Bembenek, who was a police officer, I think, in the 50s and uh, murdered somebody. Um, so that's apparently where Bennett was, was influenced from, the name Bennett. It was slightly tweaked to sound more generic. The first name calls to mind both the model, Sybil Buck, and the action star, Sybil Danning. Shoutouts to Sybil Danning. Why would they reject Dolores Lola so much? <laughs> we'll get to that. Cheryl Mason. Age 7, female, elementary school student. Although she is Harry's only daughter, the truth is that they are not related by blood. It is because of her wishes that the two of them travel to Silent Hill. And that's expanded upon in the play novel as well, that uh, the, the reason for going to Silent Hill in the first place is that Cheryl wanted to go. She told Harry that she wanted to go. Now, as to what was influencing Cheryl to make her say that is, I guess, up for debate. 
Dahlia says that she's using a magical spell in the in the game, and I always take the game dialogue information over anything else, so that's what I go by. Dahlia used a magical spell to pull the other half of Alessa's soul back to the town. And that influenced Cheryl to tell Harry, I want to go to Silent Hill for vacation. Creator's comment, originally we wanted to call her Dolores for the same reason as Harry's character, but this met with fierce opposition and was rejected. The name originates from Cheryl Lee, but there is no particular significance. So Cheryl Lee is the actress who plays Laura Palmer in Twin Peaks. And twin and obviously Team Silent are big fans of David Lynch, so they know Twin Peaks, they know Cheryl Lee, and that's where the name Cheryl came from. But originally they were going to go with Dolores. Dolores was too much to say? No, 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 no. The fierce opposition came from Humbert Mason being the original inspiration for Harry, coming from Stanley Kubrick's f film Lolita. Humbert and Dolores from Lolita? For Harry and Cheryl? Like, that would give a pretty gross connotation to most American audiences, to most audiences who understand or are familiar with Lolita and would get that reference, that would be weird and gross. So I can see why that would be met with fierce opposition. Um, yeah. Yeah, a little, little context. Lisa Garland. Age 23, female, nurse, a nurse who worked at Alcamilla Hospital. She was charged with nursing Alessa, who was kept alive even with her severe burns by means of an incantation. Creators comment the name Lisa comes from an actress who plays a nurse and is a murderer in the movie Sanguelia. Okay, I have done pretty thorough research on this and most sources for lore uh, this is one of those ones that I always come up to a, a dead end on so first of all the movie um, Sanguilia so Sanguilia is an international title for the movie Zombie and Zombie is an international title for the movie Zombie 2. And if this all sounds very confusing, that's because it fucking is. So, here's how it works. There is a movie called Zombie 1, but Zombie 1 you might better know as Night of the Living Dead. So, after the Night of the Living Dead, everything sort of branched off and there were Italian filmmakers who were taking the uh, Romero films and basically editing and retitling as other things. So internationally, there was there wound up being a lot of confusion. So Zombie is basically Night of the Living Dead, or is it Dawn of the Dead? Dawn of the Dead? And then Zombie 2 is an Italian-made sequel. Well, in Japan, that Italian-made sequel is called Sanguilia. Following so far? <laughs> the unofficial Italian-made sequel to Night of the Living Dead was released in Japan and called Sanguilia. Now, in that movie, there is a nurse character but she is not played by someone named Lisa, nor is her name Lisa. Um, there's, there's a character named Menard, uh, Paola Menard, and Menard has a nurse in, in, in the story of Zombie 2, and the actress who plays that nurse is named Stefania De Mario. Not Lisa. Not even remotely close to Lisa. So I don't know what this comment is. Either they 
misspoke and remembered the wrong name or the wrong movie. Um, I, I don't know what this is supposed to be a reference to. I, I pretty confidently know what they're talking about when they talk about Sangualia, but the name Lisa coming from an actress who played a nurse and is a murderer. The only nurse in that movie is Menard's nurse, played by Stefania De Mario, who is not a murderer. <laughs> so, I don't know. The last name is borrowed from Judy Garland, who plays a character in The Wizard of Oz, who has lost her way in a dreamland. Judy Garland is um, Dorothy. So, that's where Lisa Garland comes from. Again, I still don't know the origins of that first name. That must be a misquote or something like that. Uh, Michael Kaufman. Age... 50. That's okay, I'm not Kaufman's age yet. Male, doctor, uh, a doctor who works at Alcamilla Hospital. Like Harry, he struggles to escape Silent Hill, but the truth is that he is closely connected to the, to the disaster taking place in the town. 50? Yeah, Pablo, he's 50. Which, by the way, that means that in Silent Hill Origins, where he looks like a completely different person, he's 43. His appearance in Origins and his appearance in Silent Hill 1 are seven years apart. He goes from 43 in Origins to 50, and he looks like an entirely different person. Uh, his name is a combination of the names Lloyd Kaufman and Michael Herz, two Troma Studios producers known for many B-movies, such as Toxic Avenger. There isn't a particularly deep significance. They just like Lloyd Kaufman and Michael Herz. They like Toxic Avenger. They like Troma. So they wanted to name a character after some, some Troma people. So that's where Michael Kaufman comes from. That's wonderful. He's just a trauma reference. Thought there was a longer gap between them? The end of Silent Hill Origins is Alessa splitting her soul. That's where Cheryl is born. And then the start of Silent Hill 1 is Cheryl, seven years old, coming back to the town. It's only seven years. But it's also Origins, it's not canon. Sam Barlow had to write it in a week, give him a break. Alessa Gillespie. Age 14, female, unknown, get a job, you lazy slacker. Uh, a young girl who carries God inside her body as a result of a ritual conducted seven years ago. Cheryl was separated when the ritual took place, but in order for the two of them to return to a single body once again, she was called back to Silent Hill. Creators comment, in the initial stages of development, we used the name Asia, which was taken from the daughter of the Italian film director, Dario Argento, his daughter, Asia Argento. Uh, however, because it's an uncommon name, yeah, it is, we decided to rename her Good Call. I cannot imagine the alternate universe of Asia Gillespie No offense to Asia Argento, but it's it's a silly name. Dahlia Gillespie. This one is fun because I get to explain a slight translation error between Japanese and English for the uh, inf inspiration, the influence. Dahlia Gillespie. She's 46 years old. That means that she's 39 in Silent Hill Origins. Uh, female unknown job. We know what her job is. She is the gyromancer. She's the town's gyromancer. Uh, a mysterious woman who is devoted to the occult. She conducts a ritual to bring about the coming of God using Alessa, her real daughter, inflicting extensive... I guess we forgot. 
to put some words there. I wonder what was extensively inflicted. She is the person responsible for setting a series of events that take place in Silent Hill into motion. I think it was extensive pain? Suffering? Yeah, that's probably the translation. Maybe just a translation error or something. Uh, creator's comment. She is named after a former wife of film director Dario Argento. Argento has made many horror movies, including Suspiria, and is a master of the genre. So, Dario Argento, if you pull up Dario Argento's history, if you know any about legendary Italian film director, uh, his former... The former spouse, Marissa Casale. No, 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 no. Um, Daria. Argento had a professional and romantic relationship with Italian actress and screenwriter Daria Nicolodi. So Daria Nicolodi is who they are referencing here who was uh, in Suspiria as woman at airport, uncredited. Um, she was in uh, Phenomena and uh, Pangiani Horror, a lot of Italian uh, giallo stuff. But uh, yeah, Daria Nicolodi is the reference that they're talking about here. So Daria, D-A-R-I-A, -A, uh, in Japanese, a lot of times will be misconstrued or mistranslated. Uh, L sounds and R sounds often get interchanged. So Daria wound up becoming Dalia, Daria in Japanese. Daria would be Dalia. Inflicting extensive life-threatening burns upon her from the scan. Thank you, Farnesia. So that's probably just the way it's formatted on the website. For some reason, the text is cut off. Uh, but it's more accurate, I guess, on the scans. But thank you for that. But there you go. Some history of characters, character names, uh, where a lot of it comes from. What a lot of the original names were going to be. I love this sort of info. Silent Hill 1 creature commentary. Hey, Dog Syrup, you're just in time. Is this a long stream? This is a very long stream. We're reading a whole book. We're reading it and discussing it as we go. So, welcome on in. We're currently on creature commentary. So, we've done all of this on the left side. We still have all of this that we're going to be talking about. The Silent Hill Creature Commentary, a look at the many creatures that suggest important elements of the other world. Air Screamer, also known as Bird. Area, Housing District, Business District, Character, Flying Creature that moves in groups of five, it's not specifically groups of five, but okay. They do typically uh, group up. Air Screamer. An image that comes from an illustration in one of Alessa's favorite books, The Lost World by Conan Doyle. So this is where you start getting where the creatures come from. Like, we know that they're manifested from Alessa, but how are they significant to Alessa? What aspect of Alessa are they manifesting from? One of her favorite books. It's all things that she knows. And this is stuff that I've talked about in uh, story playthroughs and stuff in the past. Well, this is where I sort of cite and source my information. Oh, by the way, CB3. I'm sorry. I was like in the middle of reading and, and doing all this stuff. Um, thank you so much for the resub. Very much appreciate the five months. Hey, EU dude. Love to drop my prime here. Fave place to be. Thank you so much. Really appreciate that. I'm sorry it took me so long to uh, get to the reset. It's a lot. We've got a lot of information to process. Thank you so much for that. 
Um, Groner, also known as Dog, in the housing district, in the business district, they're all over. Appears widely outdoors. It is sensitive to sound and will react to a gunshot. Metaphor, Groner, the image of large dogs, which Alessa has a strong dislike of, is the basis for this creature. And then the other world sort of like variations of the air screamer and the groaner here, the night flutter and the worm head. Uh, night flutter, bit, uh, bird of the business district. Business district resort appears in the business district's over, uh, other world. It is sensitive to light. Creatures that flutters, creature that flutters in darkness. The influence of the shift that the world undergoes is strong. Its head is completely covered in worms. These are the kind of details like, if ever there was a reason for a Silent Hill 1 remake, it would be to see these creatures in better detail. Dog of the Business District, Wormhead. Business District and Resort, a more powerful dog-type creature. Wormhead, the effect of the shift to the other world is strong. Its head is completely covered in worms. Mumbler, humanoid monster, hook-clawed monster. In the school and in the sewers, although its movements are slow, it has a powerful claw attack. Mumbler, the image of small menacing animals and small demons from fairy tales. And this variation, also called a claw finger, is... Uh, replaces all of the mumbler like childlike creatures in the North American version so if you play the PAL version or the Japanese version you'll see these mumblers uh, these claw fingers and remember this guide came out with Silent Hill 3 in Japan only so this was originally made for Japanese audiences and they would expect them to have played the Japanese version of Silent Hill 1, where you would predominantly see this in the schools, as opposed to the mumblers in the North American version, the more childlike of the enemies. So, just to explain that little disparity there. Puppet Nurses, Parasitized Nurse, Hospital Nowhere. Its speed and physical strength differ depending on its dress and hairstyle. Which is true. In-game, if you look at the color of the dress and the model, there are multiple distinct nurse models. What website is this? Silent Hill Memories. This is the Lost Memories Guide for Silent Hill 1 through 3. Uh, puppet nurse, a nurse that has, be, uh, that has been parasitized by something. This parasitized body is the same as Sybil's after she becomes possessed. So this is also one of those interesting things about the enemies. The fact that the nurses are described as, you know, they're, the body of the nurse is being inhabited by a parasite. You know, that... Uh, the nurses and doctors themselves are dead, and it's just like these manifested parasites that are controlling, puppeting their bodies. Very grotesque. Larval Stalker, small humanoid shadow, found in the school in the amusement park. Completely non-aggressive, except for in the very end of Nowhere, where they add aggressive versions of the stalkers. Uh, Larval Stalker, its laughter evokes memories of being teased at school. So that's what that little squeaky kind of sound effect from the Larval Stalkers is supposed to be. It's like a little laughter. The parasitized doctor that appears only in the first game. Although the female nurse type creatures have become typical of the series, that's pretty funny to hear even at that point, there was only three games. That was only Silent Hill 3. And they're like, oh, these are all nurses are already typical. Uh, although the female nurse type creatures have become typical of the series, there was also a doctor type, puppet doctor, that appeared only in the first game. 
In retrospect, or excuse me, in respect to the other world, the creature does not appear in the later works of the series. What do you mean in respect to the other world? More doctors, more puppet doctors. If there's nurses, why not more doctors? Romper, jumping creature, a.k.a. Jack. From now on, they're just Jack. Every romper. Friendship with romper ended. I'm now best friends with Jack. My official way of referring to this creature. You enjoy all the killing, don't you, Jack? Business district and resort area. Powerful monster that attacks with a body blow and pins down its victim. Jumper. Manifestation of Aless's fear of adults. Think about that for a moment. The romper. The specifically large male humanoid creature that attacks by pinning, pouncing and pinning you down. That is influenced from Alessa's fear of adults. This is why subtlety is important. You can convey something so distressing and, and uncomfortable and gross like that. And Silent Hill 1, like, if you don't look into this sort of stuff, like, you can infer certain aspects of it, but... This is why subtlety is, is important in horror. This is why when I show concerns over like Bloober Team's remake and I talk about Bloober not being very good at subtlety in their designs and their writing, this is sort of what I mean. Conveying the more disturbing aspects in a way that you can infer aspects of them without it being blatant, I think is very important. Bloodsuckers, tentacle monsters. Found in the hospital, literally just in one room. Tentacle creature that has no effective attacks. The bloodsucker, the embodiment of a strong aversion to worms and snakes and the like. Alessa don't like worms, she don't like snakes. Creeper, insect, cockroach. Found in the school, hospital, and the sewers. A giant insect that moves with great speed and reacts strongly to light. Creeper. The manifested image of Alessa's dislike of insects. Specific insects, since we see that she collects, like, moths and butterflies. But not a fan of, uh, roaches. Don't blame her. Hanged Scratcher. The long-limbed monster. Found in the sewers. Its hook-like claws are its weapons. It also hangs from ceilings. Hang Scratcher, the manifestation of an image that is a composite of insect specimens. And it is, when you kind of look at it, especially in-game, it is very sort of like insect-like. It's got sort of like praying mantis arms. Although the back half to me always looked very lizard-like. It always reminded me of reptile from the, the really bad CG reptile from the first Mortal Kombat movie. Splithead, the long-bodied monster lizard. Found in the school. Although its movements are slow, its attack is powerful. One of the only uh, one-shot kill enemies in all of Silent Hill 1. Its weak point is the inside of its mouth. Metaphor for Splithead, the incarnation and transfiguration of a great lizard that appears in a fairy tale from the elementary school. The twin feeler, found in the shopping mall, lurks underneath, utilizes a ramming attack as well as a poison gas attack. Twin feeler, the manifested image of an insect specimen from Alessa's room. And you even see in Alessa's room where she's got the mods and butterflies and stuff pinned that uh, the case is broken as though uh, something escaped or fell out. Uh, the Incubus, 
demon incubus found in school? Question mark? I mean, the final boss area is nowhere. You're, you're kind of in, like, a void. But sure, we'll go with school. Or, I'm looking at Splithead. Incubus, this way. Unknown Realm. Again, this layout. A little bit weird. Here we go. Incubus, Unknown Realm. Hangs in the air and attacks intermittently with a thunder strike. Uh, the Dream Demon, incarnation of the mental image of God that Dahlia had. So people also bring this up. Whether or not the gods in Silent Hill are real or not. Because technically, the town is just taking what, what is in your mind. It's taking what you believe. Um, whether it's a nightmare, a fear, or whatever. And it's manifesting it into reality. So the fact that, you know, this is... An incarnation of the mental image of God that Dahlia had. That Dahlia believes in the cult's, you know, religion and believes in the cult's deities and envisions them as this creature. So it's like that image, that way of imagining it that Dahlia has is what gave it its its form. Isn't this all your own personal nightmare like with Alessa 17 years ago? Such a great line from 3. Yeah, I is that the exact line? It's something like that. But but yeah, Vincent Vincent in, infers that it's like Claudia's just kind of doing the same thing. So it's all just a personal nightmare again. Who's to say Dahlia's own beliefs aren't influencing parts of the nightmare? I mean, straight up, that's kind of what this is saying, is that Dahlia is doing that. But because Dahlia is Alessa's mother, how much of that is also just like, Dahlia believes in these things so strongly. She raises Alessa to believe in the same things that she believes in. So if she visualizes something the same way, Alessa is probably going to interpret it the same as her mother. That's like all she knows. Um, we have the Float Stinger, giant moth found in the business district, specifically on the roof of the post office. Mature form of the Twin Feeler, attacks with poison gas and the poisonous stinger on its tail. Float Stinger, the image of an insect specimen that was used to decorate Alessa's room. Also just kind of the evolution from the, the twin feeler. Using with God, Alessa awakens. In the case of the bad ending, Alessa slash incubator appears instead of incubus. Alessa's mental image is projected. The name incubator signifies incubator for a premature baby. Um, and yeah, for those who don't know, the final boss is referred to as incubus or incubator. So you're either going to have a good ending where you're fighting the Incubus or a bad ending where you're fighting Alessa's projection, a.k.a. the Incubator, for the Growing God. It's interesting to contrast this to Silent Hill 2, where you can interpret the town as benevolent sometimes. It really goes to show how the setting is totally influenced by the individual. And, and it just shows how much things changed over the course of the first three games, even. Uh, and, and Team Silent even kind of mentioned that, it, or this guide, rather, kind of mentions that the power at the end of Silent Hill 1 to the beginning of Silent Hill 2 has intensified to the point where it's acting completely different than the way that it is in Silent Hill 1. This guide explained that already. So... We're about to get into Silent Hill 2 now. Silent, But first, Silent Hill ending analysis. The first game has four conclusions that play out depending on the protagonist's actions. Let's reaffirm their respective differences. The good ending. The orthodox ending, which is connected to the third game. That's their way of saying this is the canon one. This is what's canonical. Orthodox is kind of a 
interesting way to put it, but... This is the one intended to connect to the third game. After Incubus is defeated, the woman appears once again. She presents Harry with a baby. Harry escapes the town, and once again raising a child found in Silent Hill. Sorry, Sybil. It's canon. You're dead. Bad ending. It was all a delusion. The incident ended with the crash. Suffering from the knowledge that his daughter may have been taken away from him, Harry involuntarily collapses. This can't be happening. Cheryl! The final scene depicts Harry's form with blood streaming from his head. He already seems to be unconscious. And Harry even alludes to this during the gameplay. He mentions that after waking up from the Lisa conversation in uh, Green Lion Antiques, after everything goes to the other world, and he's like, maybe I, you know, maybe this all just is a dream. Maybe I crashed my car and I'm still uh, in a hospital bed or something. So he he infers that this this could be what's going on. And the bad ending is basically like, yep, Harry crashed and these are all just the final thoughts of a dying man. Which also kind of sort of is the lead up into Shattered Memories. That's kind of the alternate universe where Shattered Memories happens. Not really, but kind of. Good plus, an ending that has a hidden aspect of changing the opening image. Sybil is one step ahead of Harry and finds her way to Dahlia before he does. However, her handgun is useless because of Alessa, who has regained her powers. Yep, she tries to shoot. The barrier is there. When the woman presents Harry with the newly born baby, she shows him which way to go in order to escape. Alessa uses the last of her power to stop the falling sparks. Harry and Sybil escape to safety. Harry already spoiling Shattered Memories ten years before it came out. That's eh, fine. And the bad plus ending. Sybil rescues Harry, who is crushed by despair. The bullet that Sybil fires is repelled, and Alessa, who has returned to a single being, attacks Harry as the Incubator. Incubator expresses her gratitude to Harry, after being shot multiple times in the face. Her voice is unmistakably that of his daughter. Sybil roughly forces Harry to snap out of it. She smacks him across the face as he has crumbled from the pain of the loss of his daughter. And it just kind of leaves it there. It doesn't tell you if they escape or not. Presumably not. Bad endings. And that is Silent Hill 1. At least everything that's covered in the Lost Memories Silent Hill Chronicle. So hopefully by now, anybody who's kind of been watching from the start and might be questioning, like, why would Nub just read through all of this stuff? There's interesting stuff to discuss. I, I, I hope now people kind of understand why I want to go through this. It's This is a very often cited piece of, of lore, um, you know, as far as supplementary material goes among many, many Silent Hill uh, fans and content creators, people who've been making videos and things like that, um, very, very often cite this guide. And that's why I wanted to go through it and just read through all of it and discuss all of it with you guys, because there are some things that are really interesting and informative and other things that are kind of questionable, either from a translation standpoint or maybe just from a you know, how this was put together, like as supplementary material standpoint, there's, there's some interesting stuff there, but, uh, we're not done. That was just Silent Hill 2, or excuse me, Silent Hill 1. Now we're moving on to Silent Hill 2. Uh, but before I get into it, 
I'm going to take a short break. So stretch my legs, grab a drink, give my throat a few moments to recover before we do a whole bunch more talking and reading. And uh, I'll be back in a few minutes and we will read through Log 2, all of the Lost Memories Chronicle lore for Silent Hill 2. But I'll be back in a bit. All right. Hey, Rambo Rachel. Good morning. Now, reading us a book. I am indeed reading a book. Today, we are reading and discussing Lost Memories, The Silent Hill Chronicle. This was a uh, supplementary lore guide that came along with a Japanese Silent Hill 3 strategy guide back in 2003 that was uh, translated by a fan into English many years back and this is a very commonly cited source for a lot of uh, Silent Hill information so I thought it would be uh, interesting to go through and just read the entire thing front to back live on stream and share it with everyone because it is an interesting source for a lot of information, but there is also a lot of questionable stuff that I think is worth discussing. Um, yeah, there's a lot of neat stuff to it. So I figured this would be something kind of new and interesting and different to kind of go through and talk about. Bring this back up. We've, uh, we're about two and a half hours in little less than that and uh we've gone through the introduction and just kind of overall information and we just finished going through all of the information covering silent hill one so we're now going into silent hill two the complex story of the second game attracts attention with its shocking conclusion and various possible interpretations. If one plays with a deeper understanding of the elaborately integrated scenarios and the backgrounds of the characters that appear in the game, one should be able to gain a deeper appreciation for the story. Silent Hill 2 Story Preview an opening movie featuring many images and various speculative situations that do not appear in the main part of the game. Spoken dialogue is added once the game is cleared. So that is another thing that m some people might not be aware of. When you very first play Silent Hill 2, if you don't have any save data um, and you've never finished, don't have any completions on, on whatever platform you're playing it, the intro cutscene is only music. The cutscenes do not have any voice dialogue. But once you finish the game at least once, and then watch the intro again, all of the clips from the scenes that it use, uh, that it uses, all have their dialogue. So cool that they uh, mention that little extra thing. Scene one, Maria speaks to James from the other side of the bars. For some reason, she seems to possess the memories of his wife, who is supposedly dead. And yet, the opening scene of the game, for the, for the intro anyway, that scene with Mary, uh, Maria. I'm getting confused, just like James. Scene two, James and Maria hold a conversation through the bars. James is confused by the fact that Maria has Mary's memories. How could you know that? Aren't you Maria? Scene three. Light streams in through the window of the vacant sick room. It appears to be the same as Mary's sick room, which is seen in the endings. Uh, funny enough, my good friend Ekdysis, good friend, fellow horror streamer and speedrunner, uh, Ekdysis posted up a thing on Twitter the other day talking about this room where Mary's sick room when she would have gone back home because she was staying in the hospital uh, and then eventually got sent home from the hospital to have her last days with James which is the room that you see in the endings the room that's depicted here during in, in the intro and Ekdysis commented on like why do they have such a small bed 
Like, well, clearly that's not their, like, the bed that they have as a couple. James would have gotten Mary, like, her own bed. They wouldn't have been able to share a bed with her illness. But it's just funny that Ecdice is like, why is their bed so small? Are they stupid? <laughs> like, all right. Much love. Shoutouts to Ecdice's. One of my very good friends and uh, awesome, awesome streamer. Super entertaining, super funny. Really, really talented speedrunner. Definitely go check out Ecdysis if you don't uh, if you don't already know. Shout out. You're not already following Ek. Definitely. Rectify that. Scene four. Countless objects are sucked into a hole at tremendous speed. This image does not appear in the main part of the game. This is like such a good part of that intro too. It's very abstract. It's just the feeling of something just rushing past you. It's all that sort of dirty, dried blood kind of brownish, off-white texture, too. Much more abstract in the uh, visuals of Silent Hill 2 compared to Silent Hill 1. Uh, scene 5. <clears throat> a strange creature lurks in the innermost darkness. It is also a vision that represents what lies hidden in the depths of people's hearts. I believe that's Flesh Lips. Isn't it? That little scene. The strange creature in the innermost darkness. Uh, scene six, a light shines into the vacant private room as if searching for something. Could the shadows of bars indicate that this is a prison cell? And this is the room where this scene takes place. You can see this back corner of the room right here is where this is taking place just uh, zoomed in at a different angle with the light source behind the bars so that the bars cast the shadow this way scene 7 James stares at the player it's set oh wait his reflection in the mirror oh huh would have thought. James stares at his reflection in the mirror in the observation deck's restroom. This is the scene that leads into the story. I mean, it says pretty plainly. I wonder how someone could ever possibly misinterpret that. I love that Ito himself has had to, like, go on Twitter and be like, you're stupid. <laughs> That's my favorite. That's my absolute favorite, is when, when people bring stuff like that up to Ito and he's just like, all right. <laughs> you need to stop. Do not buy Silent Hill 2 Remake. Never speak to me again. <laughs> Scene 8. When Mary visited Silent Hill with James three years ago, James made a videotape recording. Come on. Scene 9. James wanders through a place that resembles a prison, holding a woman in his arms. Could this scene, which doesn't appear in the main part of the game, be an image from James's mind? So, it would have to be. The scene wouldn't make sense in a realistic, like, standpoint. Because, yeah, that's James carrying Mary's body through the prison. Through the Silent Hill prison. So... The prison itself doesn't exist. It's something that James's twisted sense of reality is, is allowing him to perceive, um, but physically has not existed for at least a hundred years. But it is an interesting sequence. Definitely something projected from James's mind. Or, more likely, in a, in a more realistic sense, it's a cool-looking shot. The, dev, the devs put together some cool-looking shots 
for their intro, and they don't always necessarily need to make any sort of literal sense or even figurative sense. Sometimes it can just be, this makes for a really cool shot for an intro, for a trailer. I kind of get the feeling that's what this sequence is. You can interpret it in some ways to make it relevant to the story, if that makes you feel more satisfied. But I think it's... It looks cool. Devs probably thought it looked cool too, and that's why they put it there. Scene 10. As in scene 8, an image from the recording that was made three years ago. Mary likes the location of Silent Hill very much. Well, area used to be a sacred place. Scene 11. Maria meets James again in the hospital's other world. She becomes angry at being mistaken for Mary and vehemently presses James to explain himself. Anyway... What do you mean, anyway? Scene 12. James encounters Angela for the first time in the cemetery. She stares suspiciously, suspiciously at James, who is using the trail to pass through to the town. Lost? Love that theme. Good encounter. Scene 13. As the light is suddenly directed onto him in the underground prison, Eddie loses his cool. His agitated expression betrays his consciousness of his crime. I do like that this kind of points out the direction of the lighting, too, where Eddie is a little bit more passive sounding when he's just sort of sitting on the ground in the dark. And once James focuses on him, points his light at him, that's when Eddie starts feeling like that that James is kind of picking on him, insinuating that he's done something wrong. Making fun of me with his eyes. His agitated expression betrays his consciousness of his crime. So even that is... He's aware of what he's done, but he's trying to mask it through his, his frustration. Scene 14. James meets Laura again on the way to the park. She clearly harbors some animosity towards him. Laura does not like James. Mary met Laura in the hospital and would have been going through the various terms of acceptance of her illness and her mortality, which caused her to both have many good and many bad things to say about James to Laura. So Laura kind of got like a negative impression of James based on uh, what Mary would have been saying. She may have even observed James from a distance. Times where James would have gone and visited. He would, he would have been more focused on what else was going on rather than someone like Laura being around, possibly. <laughs> yeah, Tinkerbell, that's that scene. I don't know, maybe I did. Or no, that's, uh... Yeah, 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 that's it. It was you, wasn't it? Scene 15, lying in front of a mirror, Angela gazes with vacant eyes at the kitchen knife that she holds in her hand. She entrusts James with the knife before she leaves. Oh, it's just you. Eddie puts the gun muzzle to his temple. Like, 13. This is the scene in which he encounters James in the prison, so yeah. Little bit further along part of that same sequence. Scene 17. Laura gives Eddie a kick while he sits on the street. This scene indicates that the two of them met by chance on the way to Silent Hill. This is one of the things that I've brought up during uh, story playthroughs as well. 
this part of the intro, Jane, uh, excuse me, Eddie sitting here with Laura, Laura kind of kicking his leg. I always looked at this as like Eddie has like a map or something laid out on his lap. It's hard to tell from the quality of this image, but I'm pretty sure he's look he's like sitting and looking at like a map. So it's inferring that they're like stopping and double checking directions on the way to the town or something. Um, because of this intro sequence where they're sitting outside of this white van, that's where the Eddie's van thing comes from. And for those who don't know the Eddie's van thing, a little bit of history on that because it's such a meme and not everybody knows Not everyone's been around on this channel and follows all that stuff that closely. So, uh, several years ago, uh, Guy Sihi, the voice actor and mocap actor for James Sunderland, uh, did a playthrough of Silent Hill 2 with um, the YouTuber Fungo, YouTuber and streamer Fungo, uh, one half of the Twin Perfect uh, YouTube channel. And during that playthrough, every time um, they would come across these white vans, because the white van is just kind of like a reused prop, in Silent Hill 2, you find it, the car models are repeated all throughout the town. So you find that white van many, many times throughout the town. Uh, but because of this one specific scene of the intro, where Eddie is seen outside of the white van, uh, Guy Sihi is like, oh, that van is Eddie's van. And throughout that whole playthrough with Fungo, every time they came across a white van on the streets, which is like five or six times throughout the game, Guy see he every time he saw it would be like, oh look, there it is, there's Eddie's van again. He'd get so excited about it. Uh like it had significance. <laughs> and I think it's just a reused car prop. Like it I think the one maybe in the observatory, like, is supposed to maybe be Eddie's. This could be inferring that that is Eddie's. Seeing it all throughout the town, I think, is just reusing car props to populate the streets and give some interesting uh uh, things in the environment without being too resource heavy, having a ton of unique car models. You're able to repeat them a few times. That's where the Eddie's van thing comes from. Mean lore explanation. No, no, all those models of James were really James. See, in the case of something like a corpse model, they have generic looking corpses. They specifically went out of their way to use recurring, recurring corpses that resemble James. So that's something that's intentional. Reusing a car, using a car model on the streets in a couple different parts of the town, that's totally different. There's, there's different levels of intent with the use of something like that. Uh, scene 18. Maria speaks to James from the other side of the bars. Like scene one, this is an image from the scene in which she meets James again in a passageway in the labyrinth. Scene 19, in contrast with scene four, this time a large quantity of something is ejected out of a hole. The objects seem to resemble mannequins and body parts. So yeah, you basically get this scene slowed down and reversed for this part and you can make out the stuff that's sort of moving around that that the camera's sort of like rushing past a little more clearly and yeah it's like mannequins scene 20 a close up of a mouth that writhes bizarrely it belongs to a being that portends that portends of mary the flesh lip Good old flesh lips. The mouth that writhes bizarrely. And that little scene, it's only like a few frames of uh, the close up on flesh lips with that mouth writhing around is very distinct Silent Hill imagery. Scene 21 Eddie vomits into the toilet. He appeals to James to believe that he hasn't killed anyone. Excellent performance by Dave Shoffley, uh, regurgitating water into a cup. 
which is uh, how he recorded it. Another little fun fact that comes from that playthrough of uh, Silent Hill 2 with Guy Sihi and Fungo. Um, Dave Shoffley, Eddie's voice actor, joins them partway through the playthrough since he's friends with Guy Sihi. So, he gives some backstory on recording the, the vomiting scene. He basically used a glass and uh, took a sip of water and swallowed it and then threw it back up into the cup and that's how he recorded Eddie's vomiting sounds. Scene 22. Maria lies sprawled on the stage at Heaven's Night. Although this image doesn't appear in the main part of the game, she possesses a key to this establishment. Again, we don't see this in the, in the game. We don't see this in Born from a Wish. It's just a scene of Maria laying on the stage. From a standpoint of making an intro trailer, you know, eye catch type thing, it's a very striking image. Um... It adds a bit of sexuality to it, which is always marketable in terms of that kind of thing. Um, in terms of lore implications, I mean, Heaven's Night, Maria is essentially created. She's like born there. Um, so there is this sort of connection of between Maria and Heaven's Night. And uh, take it for what you will, but... Silent Hill 2 Remake has recently been rated, and uh, a lot of the descriptions for the rating include uh, depictions of a pole dance, specifically a pole dance, as part of the sexuality rating for Silent Hill 2 Remake. So, Bluber might be adding a little something extra. I don't know if it'll be a throwaway scene that's just part of an intro like this, or if it'll actually be more of a sequence in the game, but for anyone who was holding out hope foolishly, thinking that Bloober Team won't change anything from the source material, there's going to be a pole dance somewhere. That's not in the original. Scene 23. Laura visits Mary's room. She enters tentatively while assessing the situation. Who could be there that she has set her eyes upon? This is the scene of her coming into the hotel room, into their hotel room, right? At the end of the game, where she comes across James after watching the tape. Scene 24. Reaching through the gap in the bars, Maria touches James's cheek and says, See, I'm real. Good breakdown of the intro, especially because there are these scenes that are specific to the intro and not anywhere else in the game. Silent Hill 2 character commentary. For a certain reason, they were drawn to Silent Hill. What darkness do each of them hold in their hearts? We've got James Sunderland, age 29. I'm seven years older. James Sunderland. Male. He's a clerk. I've mentioned this in story playthroughs, and people people are like, how do you know James is a clerk? Because Lost Memory says so. Is Ascension cancelled? Nope. It is still going. It's going until August. Um, profile. The protagonist. A letter from his late wife, Mary, has led him to Silent Hill. Creator's comment. In the initial stages of the scenario... He was a character who had two personalities, Joseph and James. The name Joseph was borrowed from the name of a man suspected of being Jack the Ripper, and James is a derivative. So, early, early iterations of Silent Hill 2 were going to be much different, where James would have been someone with multiple personalities. The initial stages of the scenario, he would have also had a separate personality of Joseph. Some people, yeah, some people theorize that the return to Silent Hill, the current movie being made by Christoph Gans, well, it's in post-production now, but it'll be coming out later this year. Um, that movie, Christoph Gans made the original, the first Silent Hill movie. 
Return to Silent Hill is going to be based on Silent Hill 2, and some people suspect based on some leaked synopsis uh, or Return to Silent Hill that he might be using this concept, the dark world of Jacob Crane. Jacob Crane could potentially be a, a personality or persona or aspect of James himself. Who knows? We'll see. It's Christoph Gans. But interesting little backstory there. Would have been a much, much different type of game. I'm glad they decided uh, not to go with that idea. That is a very kind of tropey idea. There's a lot of tropey ideas in Silent Hill already. This, I think, would have been a little too corny. Raison d'etre. The letter James received from Mary was an illusion. Weary of nursing his wife's poor health, he took her life with his own hands to release her from the misery of her illness. However, he was unable to withstand the weight of his crime, and immersed in his own delusions, one can think that he was drawn to the town of Silent Hill. And this is proved throughout the game, for people who don't know that. The, the letter that James gets at the beginning is, is just an illusion. Over the course of the game, the letter actually vanishes from your inventory, little by little. When you examine it early in the game, the whole thing is there. Um, but then towards the end of the game, you'll examine it and the, uh, the letter, the paper will just be blank. And then eventually the paper will just be gone and it'll just be an empty envelope. And then ultimately at the end, after you kill the two pyramid heads, the entire envelope and everything is gone from your inventory. So, it's revealed to be an illusion in the game, but if you're not paying attention to the state of the letter in your inventory, it can be easy to miss that fact. Mary Shepherd Sunderland, age 25, female housewife, James's wife who supposedly died of an illness three years ago, definitely did not, ever since visiting Silent Hill with James it has been a place of memories for the two of them. <laughs> not necessarily good memories, a bit of a mixed bag, but yeah, it's a place of memories. This is one of the first times I think you get her full name, the the shepherd um, name being an aspect of, of that, which there's supplementary material for Silent Hill Homecoming, where Alex is reading about Mary Shepherd Sunderland and is like, I wonder if she's a distant relative of mine. Creator's comment, her name is taken from the victim, Mary Kelly, in the Jack the Ripper case, who is living with the suspect, Joseph, as detailed in case files regarding the murders. So they very heavily inspired James and Mary around Jack the Ripper and, uh, or a, one of the original suspects of who Jack the Ripper might have been, plus one of the victims, one of the wrongfully accused suspects. I wonder if the name Shepard was provided by Jeremy Blaustein, uh, like the name Sunderland was. Most likely. According to Jeremy, he provided pretty much all of these names. So, if, if it's not something that's specifically cited in this, where the name came from like a specific uh, inspiration, it was probably something that, that Jeremy included. Uh, Mary says various things in each ending to James, uh, who has become aware of the crime he has committed. It is conceivable that her death three years ago is merely James's delusion. Yeah, that's pretty. That's pretty clear from the from the game. You don't need. Uh, thanks for clarifying, but th that doesn't seem necessary. Maria, 
no middle or last name given. She's like a mystery because she is just created specifically for James um, and is not actually a real person. Little fun fact, in Dead by Daylight, there is various Silent Hill characters. There was a Silent Hill crossover for the Dead by Daylight game. And one of the uh, skins that you can get for Cheryl, uh, Heather, it transforms her into other characters. So you can get a skin that lets you play as Maria. And Maria is the only character in Dead by Daylight who only has a single name. All the other survivors have a first and last name, except for her. Hey, Ginger Gamer. Uh, Maria, 25, female, dancer. A woman who bears an uncanny resemblance to Mary, although her personality and taste in clothing are completely opposite. For some reason, she tags along with James. Creator's comment. In the original scenario, the heroine also had an existence characterized by a double personality. The first personality is Mary, so for the other, the name Maria is derived from that. Pretty straightforward. Yeah, Maria Aguilera. And Maria's appearance is loosely based, at least her clothing and stuff, is loosely based on... Maybe not so loosely, it's pretty directly based on an outfit that Christina Aguilera wore at the 1999 Nickelodeon Teen Choice Awards. Maria was produced by James's delusions as a result of his inability to bear the weight of the crime of killing his wife. It is established in the third game that her model was a dancer at the club Heaven's Night. This is interesting because in Silent Hill 3, you do find a poster that says like the return of Maria, but the Maria depicted in Silent Hill 3 in that poster is like a different woman. She has long black hair and like she's, she's completely not this Maria. So that was always one of those very strange kind of ambiguous things. I figured it was meant to be more of just a little nod, a little a little Easter egg referencing Silent Hill 2, rather than a more lore implication, lore-heavy implication, that Maria just exists now and continued to be a, a dancer in Heaven's Night. Okay. Laura, eight years old. A uh, female, young girl who was a patient in the same hospital as Mary. Having no mother of her own, Laura loved Mary as if she were her real mother. Creator's comment, her name is taken from the non-fiction work No Language But a Cry by Richard D'Ambrosio. The story of a young girl's search for happiness while struggling to overcome the scars of abuse. Interesting. I'm not familiar with that uh, non-fiction work. I'll have to look into that one at some point for some further reading. But the idea that Laura would have been... Because she is an orphan. And I mean, you don't exactly become an orphan by having a happy childhood. So clearly there would have been some reason for that. Uh, the inference if this is what the name is taken from if it's supposed to parallel that story the idea that Laura would have come from like an abusive family been had been put up for adoption is uh gives a whole different context to her character and to a lot of things but that's interesting the having no mother of her own Laura loved Mary as if she were a real mother that aspect is expressed in the game and Mary loved Laura as a daughter, Mary basically expresses in the game's dialogue uh, through one of her letters that uh, one of the letters that's real, that if she hadn't been ill, if things had been different, um, she would have adopted Laura. Of all the characters, she is the only one who does not hold any darkness 
<laughs> dark Nessin <laughs> uh, does not hold any darkness in her heart. It may be that she came to Silent Hill looking for Mary. To her, the town appears to be normal. She does not see any monsters, nor does she see Maria. So they specifically go out of their way to mention she does not see Maria. She doesn't see manifestations. To her, the town appears to be normal. Now, when it says normal, I'm not entirely sure people infer the same thing from that. Some people think that that means that normal meaning it's a functional town. There's people around. There's businesses open. It's it's a normal town. I don't think that's the case. I think normal means she's not seeing the other world. She's not seeing the creatures, but she's seeing an abandoned town, a mostly empty town. It's otherwise not harmful, like there's not all the same darkness and monsters that James, the player, you know, characters are experiencing other than Lauren, but that's up for interpretation, I suppose. Not sure if I want to bring this up, but is Laura was left like Walter? I don't know. We don't know anything about that. Uh, the the consequences or circumstances behind Laura becoming an orphan. We don't know. Even this guide doesn't say. Angela Orozco, age 19. A lot of people don't realize what age Angela is supposed to be because it's not given directly in the game. And in the making of Silent Hill 2 documentary, um, the host of that, the narrator, describes her as being, I think, 17. So there's also a lot of conflicting information depending on what supplementary info you're looking at. But she's supposed to be a high school graduate. So... I would say 1819. This is probably more accurate than uh, what was given in the making of. Uh, age 19, a girl who came to Silent Hill in search of her mother. After graduating high school, she ran away from home but was found and brought back by her father. Um, creator's comment. Her name is borrowed from the protagonist of the film, The Net. This religious name, meaning angel, is common among Hispanics, thereby giving rise to the implied immigrant as well. What? I mean, Angela is a common name in Spanish-speaking families and cultures. But what is that last line? Her name is borrowed from the protagonist of the film, The Net. So that's where Angela comes from. It's a reference to that film. Um, this religious name meaning angel is common among Hispanics, thereby giving rise to the implied immigrant as well. What does that... That seems like a mistranslation. This is one of those lines that I would question what the original Japanese may have been versus what was translated. Are they trying to infer, like... <laughs> I don't know. That's strange. That's, that's such a strange line. Second generation foreigner. To what? From From what? Because Orozco is, is not, like, really a... I don't know. <laughs> Do they just mean from outside of the town? I think. Not, not immigrant in the sense of, like, to the country or anything. I mean, she is not from the town. She has moved to the town, or her family moved to the town from somewhere else. Because they're supposed to live on the outskirts. Like, she's supposedly not far from 
where the town is. From the article in the Bloodstained newspaper, the conclusion can be made that Angela was unable to bear her abuse and took her father's life. After this incident, being in a state of emotional turmoil, one can think that she was called to Silent Hill. So even this refers to her as being called there. Like, obviously, the events happen outside of the town. <clears throat> My first guess is the Japanese side didn't realize Angela is a reasonably common Caucasian name too and they had the idea that it's a more Hispanic name. Maybe? Maybe they thought they were giving her a, a more specifically Hispanic sounding name even though Angela is like yeah it's a, it's just a very common name in a lot of cultures even if it has Latin origins. A lot of names do. I mean, interesting. And Eddie Dombrowski, age 23. He's a gas station employee, part-time, a young man who is teased because of his weight. Although he is usually passive, there is a side to him that is extremely violent. Maria is more quote-unquote Latin. And let me specify, when I say Latin, I mean as in like old Latin, as in the origin of Latin language and words, names that originate from Latin. I don't mean to confuse things like Hispanic and Spanish-speaking cultures. Some people might be uh, unsure that there's a difference there. That's not what I mean when I say Latin. I mean Angela meaning angel coming from Latin word roots, not Latin X. <laughs> no, I don't mean that. I don't mean like in a Hispanic sense, in a Spanish speaking sense. I mean in a Latin word root origin sense. Um, Eddie. Here's Eddie's van again. He's a gas station employee. A young man who's teased because of his weight. Although he's usually passive, there is a side to him that is extremely violent. Creator's comment. In the initial stages of the scenario, Eddie was actually a very cheerful character. Therefore, the name was borrowed from Eddie Murphy. In the end, however, we changed his personality completely. He's named after comedian Eddie Murphy. Beverly Hills Cop. Can you imagine a much more cheerful Eddie? According to one of Eddie's monologues, his anger and frustration at the way he was treated by others reached a climax when he killed a dog in a fit of rage and also shot the dog's owner in the leg. While running from the police, he began to have feelings of guilt, and one can think that he was called to Silent Hill. Yeah. Imagine him being cheerful. Here we go. Creatures. The Silent Hill 2 creature commentary. Grotesque creatures brought forth by James who is tormented by feelings of guilt. This section will examine the significance of these creatures. Lying figure, found in the streets of the town and the prison, attacks by spewing a poisonous mist, falls to a prone position and moves by crawling along the ground. Uh, lying figure, a being that represents the image of a patient writhing in agony, a manifestation of James's suffering. Masahiro Ito has also sort of uh, expanded on that on Twitter and in some other interviews that uh, specifically the patient writhing in agony is Mary herself. Those images in James's mind of her suffering from her illness and writhing in bed uh, from the pain that the illness caused her um, is what this creature 
manifests from. Early design incorporating a pair of red boots. And some of this design is making its way into the uh, Bloober Team remake. Not so much with the lying figures, but with the mannequins and the nurses. Um, Ito is redesigning them for Bloober Team to uh, more closely resemble a lot of this concept art. It has a mouth that allows it to nourish itself by feeding on corpses. Rough sketches. An early design in which the upper half of the creature, uh, the creature's body is wrapped in cloth and the image of restraint is strong. And I believe this idea, uh, so these two concept ideas, um, the way that they were intended to move as well, uh, and sort of the way that their arms are positioned, Masahiro Ito has expanded on that as well. He's commented that uh, another developer, one of the other members of Team Silent, came into the offices wearing a hoodie, and they had the drawstring for the. They had their hood up, and the drawstring pulled tight so that the hood was just like a small circle around the very central part of their face. And they had their pockets, their hands in the front pockets of the hoodie. And they sort of like walked into the office like that it, with this strange stride, keeping their hands in the front pockets and keeping that hoodie drawn shut. And that that was what inspired Ito for the design and the movement of the lying figure, having those arms kind of bound in the front and uh, this cloth cover here more closely resembling that hood that was drawn shut. A little more history behind all of this as well. Why I love uh, that Masahiro Ito is so active on Twitter. There's a lot of these things that he's uh, added more commentary to over the years. Bubblehead Nurse. Everyone's favorite. Hospital and streets of town. Attacks by swinging the iron pipe it carries. Uh, Bubblehead Nurse, its grotesquely swollen head faces the wrong way, a being that is suggestive of Mary's hospitalization. And you can even see in the concept art here, you can sort of make out features being twisted and skewed off to the side. One detail that it doesn't mention here uh, that Ito has pointed out on Twitter as well, the design of the Bubblehead uh, Nurse's face is supposed to be... Uh, similar to a, a fetus there's there's like a a baby form in the way that it's swollen and shaped so that was another little detail you can if you really look at the texture and the shape of the bubblehead nurse there's like an infant curled up in like a fetal position the way the uh, the facial features are skewed Mannequin, found in the apartment building and the hotel, reacts strongly to light and comes alive when approached. A manifestation of James's natural urges and inclinations. Accordingly, it is abused by Pyramid Head. Sexual frustration. So, I mean, it is a part of this game. For as overblown as that aspect of the game is like it's important to remember that that is an important theme of silent hill 2 and a lot of the silent hill games in general i feel like the sexuality aspect of it really does get overblown by a lot of um a lot of fans and a lot of people who just attribute absolutely everything anything even remotely sexual to just like oh it's james's sexual frustration and then writing it off I feel like there's a lot more nuance and depth to those kind of aspects of it, but this one, it's two pairs of legs stuck together at the torso. Like, it's pretty, it's pretty in there about it's the way this is portrayed and uh, a lot more, a lot more blatant, less subtle, especially given the circumstances, the scenes that we get where it is being abused. And it does specify here. It just says abused. That's another thing that Ito has gone out of his way to talk about on, on Twitter. Um, I like to joke about it just because of the way he phrased it. <laughs> um, 
Masahiro Ito literally tweeted at somebody, Pyramid Head ain't fucking, uh, which is like one of my Hall of Fame all-time greatest tweets from anybody ever. Pyramid, like, Pyramid Head ain't fucking from the guy who made Pyramid Head. But I get what he means, <laughs> you know? The creatures themselves are designed to reflect the the sexual urges and inclinations of James. The creature, the mannequin, they're sexual in nature by design. So when you see Pyramid Head abusing them, even though the intention is not sexual abuse, because the creatures are designed in a sexual way, the abuse comes across as sexual. It's a much more nuanced way to sort of in get what Ito was saying when he says he ain't fucking. <laughs> Pyramid Head ain't fucking. Uh, oh yeah, early uh, rough sketch for the nurse here too. In this design, it carries an IV stand instead of an iron pipe. Didn't have IV stand technology till Silent Hill Origins. The Mandarin. Some of you might recognize this instead as the closer from Silent Hill 3. Uh, although when we get to the Silent Hill 3 monsters, I'm sure it will... Uh, make note of the similarities. I think it does. Anyway, Mandarin, found in the labyrinth and hotel, hangs from a mesh grating by the lips, excuse me, by the tips of its arms. There are lips on the tips of its arms. That's the weirdest Dr. Seuss book ever written. Hangs from a mesh grating by the tips of its arms and reaches out to attack with its tentacles. Mandarin symbolizes feelings of overwhelming, incomprehensible anguish. For this reason, it is not permitted to stand above ground. At least not until Silent Hill 3. Red pyramid thing! Found in the apartment building in the hotel. With great knife and spear, he stalks Maria unrelentingly. That's very specific. Because he shows up before Maria. So that's definitely not accurate. He does attack Maria. But the way that's phrased, it's like, that's not what he's really there for. I mean, I guess it is. Yeah, you do find him in the labyrinth also. He's not only here. You find him in Brookhaven also. He's everywhere. It's weird that they only mention those locations. Pyramid Head takes the appearance of an executioner of times past, but is actually incarnated from the part of James's subconscious, excuse me, James's consciousness that feels that he deserves punishment. Is he holding the end boss? He's holding a corpse in a cage. Um, you can see similar caged corpses in the room where you find the great knife hanging from the ceiling um, as just like a recurring theme. Other victims or previous people who have been executed in the town's history. Um, but the end boss is in a similar cage, so I, I understand what you mean. Abstract Daddy, Labyrinth and Hotel, attacks by attempting to grab and envelop its victim. Ideal Father. I don't know if that's what I'd call it. Look at this perfect father figure. This is the peak, peak father body. <laughs> And if you can't handle that. On top of its bed-like form are two covered reclining figures, a symbol of Angela's past. Yeah. Just look at them reclining. This figure has taken this figure to fuck butt point. That's all I'm saying. 
I don't care what Ito says on Twitter. Creeper. Apartment building, prison, an insect-like creature that moves with great speed. Creeper, since it also appears in the preceding work, one can think that it is derived for the most part from the town's power. So it's implied these are supposed to be the same sort of roach-like creatures uh, from the first game. So it's something that's just a holdover. It's derived from the town's power. Not necessarily something from James. The prison's unseen monster. In the prison, an ominous voice resounds from one of the cells. This is the voice of the of the creature called Prisoner that appears only in the prison. Although it can't be seen, readying a weapon confirms its existence. I guess it is just a creature. Maybe it's not a ghost. Maybe it's not a person. It's funny that they put this note right next to the creeper, because if you use cheats to, like, break the camera angle and look inside of the uh, prison cell, uh, clipped into the environment, there is a creeper there that's being used for you to target the the prisoner creature. Uh, since there's not an actual model or anything there for the prisoner, uh, they needed a way for the, the player to lock on to it. So they use a... Uh, a creeper, a bug that's hidden in the environment. Flesh lip. Found in the hospital. Lattice based monster. It's lattice based. That hangs from the ceiling and attacks. Lustful lips. The lattice, the lattice, which signifies a bed, and the mouth located on the abdomen symbolize Mary. And I love the way it just looks like a mangled bag of human limbs. You have the lips poking out, the feet that hang down, and like grab and strangle James. It's hanging onto the ceiling with a hand. It's one of those things that you very, very briefly see it in game. Um, if you break the, if you use hacks to break the camera, you can see this part of the model in game as well. But yeah, wonderful enemy design. And it so much of it is obscured by the environment when you fight it, which is how it fucking should be. You should never get too clear of a look at these things, enough to know that you're looking at something disturbing and fucked up. But otherwise, you gotta really go out of your way if you want some detail. I think that's the best way to present these types of, of creatures. A rough sketch that is very similar to the final design. Instead of a mouth, a protuberance is visible in the abdominal area. Look at that protuberance. Though. So, they decided to change it from a ball sack to a mouth. Good call. Good call. Mary. Found in the hotel, the final boss hangs in the air and attacks with a vine-like tentacle. She is accompanied by insects, a being that embodies James's conflicted emotions towards Mary during her final days. Her face is like the Virgin Mary's, and her posture is reminiscent of a crucifixion. The religious iconography is very intentional. Wonderful uh, boss design, though. I've always loved the caged creature design theme of, uh, of Silent Hill 2, especially. It starts with Silent Hill 1, with uh, some caged corpses in the environment in Midwich and stuff like that, but... I, I love this design, you know, the uh, theme from Ito. All right. Now the Silent Hill 2 ending analysis of the four conclusions. There is no one correct interpretation. Each ending indicates a different possibility. And the developers uh, even 
quite recently uh, have gone on record as saying that is still the case. They never intended a canonical ending or anything like that for Silent Hill 2. Um, every ending is supposed to represent a, a possible outcome with none of them being correct. So I like that in this guide, Silent Hill 1, when it went through the ending analysis, specifically was like, good ending is the correct ending. This is the one that leads into Silent Hill 3. It specifies that. Silent Hill 2, it the same way the developers intended it, like doesn't have a concrete canon ending. In water. He came to this town to take his own life in a place of memories. My preferred ending. James lifts Mary's lifeless body in his arms and leaves the sick room. His destination is... The lake. After the violent sound of breaks, a view from beneath the surface of the water fades in. Finally, the screen fades to total darkness. James tended to take his own life. That was the whole reason he came to the town in the first place. He had a delusion, put that idea out of his head, spins the course of the game, fighting through that delusion until he comes to the truth. And then once he realizes the truth, he does what he set out to do in the first place. He's going to be together with Mary in death. He can't live without her. That's the ending I prefer. Leave. He leaves the town as a man who accept, who has accepted reality. As James expresses his anguish, his wife lies on the bed and imparts her final words to him. James makes his way through the cemetery where he met Angela and leaves the town with Laura. An ending that sounds like a nice ending until you really start thinking about it. Mary's body is in the back seat of James's car. That's presumably where he's walking to with Laura, which is either going to lead to a very, very awkward exchange where James tells Laura, we're not getting in the car, we're just going to keep walking. Don't go look at the car, we're just going to walk and leave the town. Uh, we're, do you have Eddie's keys? Let's take his van. Um, <laughs> or a very traumatic event for Laura. Even if somehow that gets avoided, Mary's body has been missing for, at the very least, a couple of days. Um, since Laura would have turned eight, since Mary would have been home from the hospital, since James would have killed her and then come to the town. People know that she was going home to die. Hospitals and doctors are aware. People are going to be doing wellness checks on the Sunderland household uh, soon, if not already. The leave ending is not a good ending, if you really think about it. There's so much other shit that would have to follow <laughs> James just walking away from, from all of this, walking out of the town. So, yeah, some people like the leave ending. I, uh, I don't think it's as nice of an ending as you might think it is. <laughs> James is going to jail. Laura's going back to the orphanage. Maria. A man who has murdered his wife a second time continues to live immersed in a delusion. In the case of this ending only, not Maria, but Mary waits on the rooftop of the hotel. She vehemently blames James for killing her. James makes the decision to continue to depend on Maria, the product of his delusion. Leaving the town from the observation deck that is the starting point of the story, could this suggest that nothing has been resolved at all? That's definitely the implication. This is the James didn't learn his lesson ending, and he's going to make the same mistake all over again. They even have the you'd better do something about that cough in the in the screenshot there implying that maria just gets sick and then he would presumably have to go through the entire experience again james is gonna have to go on the run and change his identity at the very least yeah at the very least 
leave is the ending I got. Never thought of all that other shit, but you're right. I mean, where do you go from there? There's there's not a whole lot of happy ending after that. Like, yes, he's come to terms with it and accepted his life and, like, leaves the town. That aspect is good, but once you're going back to, like, your life after that, there's nothing. That's a difficult life to try and return to. Uh, like I said, he's on the run or he's going to jail. He's not going to be able to adopt Laura in, in any situation. Not legally. But then you have the Maria ending, which is also a very confusing one. So nothing is learned at all. That's the implication. But from a logistic standpoint, what happens here? She's a manifestation. Like, does she continue to exist outside of the town? If James tries to leave with her, does she just vanish? If she does exist outside of the town, she's a manifestation. So does everybody who ever meets her see her differently? How does that work? There's so many questions on this ending, too. Rebirth. To resurrect his wife, he carries out a forbidden ritual. The four special items all have to do with Silent Hill's long-standing religious tradition. This reveals a point of contact with the preceding work. James rejects even the fantasy that he himself has created to escape. That unadulterated emotion is mysterious. Finally, James is driven to carry out the forbidden ritual that can bring the dead back to life. So, you find ritual items, you find books detailing the history of the town and its power, you find a book detailing the cult's beliefs and rituals, James finds the information and the items necessary to perform the ritual and tries to perform the ritual. The necromancer ending. And presumably, considering we know how these sort of rituals usually work in Silent Hill, even if it does succeed in doing something, that's not going to be Mary. That's not going to be Mary that comes back. You're, you're going to have a pet cemetery situation on your hands. Which is probably what this was influenced by, inspired by. Considering there are Pet cemetery posters in Silent Hill 1, Team Silent is very clearly fans of Silent, uh, Stephen King and uh, Pet Cemetery. so this is the Pet Cemetery end. And that is Silent Hill 2, or the Lost Memories book. These wonderful, wonderful people who worked on Silent Hill 2. Next up is going to be Silent Hill 3. We'll go through all of the lore for Silent Hill 3, and then even after we're done with Silent Hill 3, yeah. No dog ending. No mention of dog or UFO ending. Don't worry. We'll, uh... It, I think it covers that in a separate thing later. But, um... Before we get into Silent Hill 3, I'm gonna take another short break. Um, just to give myself another drink. Give my throat a bit of a rest, because this is a lot of talking and reading. Uh, and my throat is already trying to give out on me, so... I appreciate you all who've been sticking around. I hope everyone's been enjoying this. This is a very different kind of stream um, that I've been wanting to do lately, where we're not even playing the games. We're just sort of delving into a lot of the other supplementary information and materials out there, uh, listening to the podcasts and stuff like we did last stream, going through the books and lore and guides and stuff like this. So it's something different. Hopefully some of you guys appreciate it and enjoy what we're doing. Um, because I like doing this kind of stuff too. But uh, yeah, I'm going to take a short break. When I come back, we'll delve into all of the Lost Memories, Silent Hill Chronicle information on Silent Hill 3. Back in a bit. All right. We 
back to lost memories. This is an official Konami, pu Konami published lore guide for Silent Hill 1 through 3. This was released alongside a Silent Hill 3 uh, strategy guide, game guide that was released in Japan only back in 2003, along with Silent Hill 3's release. And it features uh, a lot of interesting lore and information regarding the first three Silent Hill games. We just finished reading up the uh, overall introduction and prologue and uh, general sort of town lore and specific lore to Silent Hill 1 and Silent Hill 2. So we are now on the chapter regarding Silent Hill 3. Here we go. Silent Hill 3, the third game is a depiction of what Excuse me. The third game is a depiction of what takes place 17 years after the story of Silent Hill. It is the story of the young girl who carries God inside her and stands in opposition of the cult, whose presence has grown. The truth about Alessa, Heather, who is repeatedly reincarnated, is likely to be revealed if one reaffirms the dialogue spoken by and objectives of each of the characters that appear in the game. So this is definitely one of those games where a lot of people went into Silent Hill 3 without maybe the best understanding of Silent Hill 1, and uh, having a better understanding of Silent Hill 1 and a little deeper understanding of 3 really makes the story come together. So this is a really good instance of uh, kind of drawing the two games, those two stories together. Silent Hill 3 Story Preview. A strange opening that begins with the symbolic appearance of the legs of two young girls. For the theme song, a vocal accompaniment was used for the first time. Here's a little fun fact about that vocal accompaniment that I found out recently. So, um, there was a interview. Maybe we'll do, uh, do that for a stream soon. Um, since we watched the interview with the Homecoming writers, we might go through and watch this other interview that uh, came out recently. So Kevin Key, uh, who is the founding member of the industrial uh, band Skinny Puppy, which Skinny Puppy was one of the bands that Akira Yamaoka was influenced by when writing the industrial pieces of music for Silent Hill 1. So Kevin Key founded Skinny Puppy. Skinny Puppy influenced Akira Yamaoka. Akira Yamaoka made music for Silent Hill games for several, several years. And then Silent Hill Ascension came out last year. And Silent Hill Ascension's music is done by Kevin Key. So it's very bizarre. Kevin Key wrote music that inspired Akira Yamaoka to write music. And then Kevin Key had to write music for Silent Hill Ascension and make it sound like Akira Yamaoka music that was influenced by his own music. Yeah. So there's an interview recently of Kevin Key interviewing Akira Yamaoka and talking about their history of music and how they're involved with Silent Hill, because that's such a unique situation for musicians to be in. And um, it's a really interesting interview. We might watch, make a whole stream of just watching that. During that interview, Akira Yamaoka dropped some interesting knowledge about Mary Elizabeth McLynn. So Mary Elizabeth McLynn was not hired on to sing vocals for Silent Hill 3. Like, this goes out of its way to be, like, for the first time, vocal accompaniment is used for the theme song, with Mary Elizabeth McGlynn singing those vocals. She was not originally hired for that. She was hired as a voice casting director, because that's predominantly what she was doing at the time. She was a voice casting director for a lot of anime and video games, and was voice acting in a lot of anime and video games. Uh, she did have a music career that was, you know, going on alongside that as well. Um, but that wasn't what she got hired for. She wasn't hired for her musical talents. 
So Akira Yamaoka mentioned that they auditioned probably like, you know, a dozen other people to do the vocals for Silent Hill and just none of them worked out. And after they were getting basically tired of interviewing people and it not working out, Mary Elizabeth McGlynn was eventually just there and was like, hey, I sing. And the rest is history. <laughs> Um, so yeah, little little more interesting backstory on the vocal accompaniment being used for the first time for Silent Hill 3 there. We'll, uh, like I said, we'll, we'll make a whole stream of watching that interview with Kevin Key and Akira Yamaoka. It's super interesting. Um, but here's our Silent Hill 3 intro breakdown scene by scene. Scene 1, Valtiel turns the handle. Overhead, the legs of two young girls that resemble those of Alessa and Cheryl are hanging. So these are supposed to uh, make you think about Alessa and Cheryl, the longer legs belonging to Alessa at the age of 14, the younger uh, Cheryl at seven with the shorter legs here. So these two other versions of Alessa, other incarnations of Cheryl, of Heather, Um, scene two, Heather awakens from a bad dream in the hamburger shop. The Happy Burger. The interior of the store is strangely enveloped in the red of a setting sun. Beautiful lighting of that intro scene in the Happy Burger. And a good parallel to Silent Hill 1 of Harry Mason waking up from his nightmare in uh, the Cafe 5 to 2 diner. Scene 3. Valtiel clings to the ceiling in a long corridor. His head trembles and vibrates oddly. Straight up Jacob's Ladder imagery. This is the game where Jacob's Ladder imagery really started shining through in the uh, design and, and art aspect, especially with creature movements, the rapid head shaking. This is really where that all started uh, becoming a lot more apparent. Scene 4. The church is the setting of the final stage of the game. Claudia stands before the pulpit with her back turned. Beautiful uh, setting, the, the church here, with all of the stained glass, and there's also paintings on the walls uh, depicting... It's sort of like the cult's version of the Stations of the Cross, where you have all of these paintings that tell the story of Alessa, like the way the cult believes in Saint Alessa, the god, from, you know, coming from the sun and being offered reeds and being reborn, all of these aspects told through the paintings, all of this background artwork, the setting, those paintings, the stained glass, all of this is done by artist Hiro Usuda. So Hiro Usuda, uh, Hiroko Usuda, uh, who was the, did a lot of the backgrounds and uh, uh, artwork and stuff for Silent Hill 3 and Silent Hill 4. Um, and she's actually also pretty active on Twitter. A lot of people follow Masahiro Ito, um, but Hiro Usuda is also uh, very frequently on Twitter and quite active. Um, she's been kind enough to, you know, in engage in conversation and answer some questions from me. Uh, and she also streams on Twitch. Uh, she's a, a freelance artist and does commissions and a lot of times she will uh, live stream when she's doing art and uh, commissions and things and she actually streams here on Twitch. Um, so let me, give me a second and I can shout out a member of Team Silent on Twitch. Just want to make sure I get the username correct. There we go. So you can uh, click that little heart in the top of your chat window and follow Hiro, 
uh, Hiroko Usada, background artist and uh, general artist for Silent Hill 3, Silent Hill 4, many, many other things. Absolutely love her artwork. Definitely go support her on Twitch. But yeah, that church setting. Wonderful. Scene 5. In the confessional, Heather listens to an unknown voice that expresses repentance. The owner of the voice committed a murder in order to get revenge for the murder of her own child. And this is one of those things that's left ambiguous, who this voice is supposed to be. Most likely, there's been theories around it being Dahlia, there's been theories around it being, uh, you know, various different characters, but ultimately, the, the voice and the dialogue does not line up with any other established characters. It is just an unknown character, probably a member, you know, of the cult, but... Still, interesting the way they phrase this. The owner of the voice committed a murder. I think just supposed to be that that parallel, trying to kind of give some context, be a parallel as far as situations go, wanting to get that revenge. You know, Claudia in many ways feels like, uh, you know, Alessa was taken away from her even though she's reincarnated. It's interesting. Scene six, Douglas drives Heather to Silent Hill. In the car, secrets regarding her birth are revealed. A uh, letter from the Lost Days is the name of the track that plays during that sequence. Excellent piece of music. One of my favorite cutscenes, just in general. I love this car scene. The performances from Heather and Douglas, the setting with the sound effects, the ambience of the rain, driving in the rain while having this emotional conversation. Wonderful scene. Scene seven of the intro, Heather passes through the gates of the amusement park. Uh, in the main part of the game, she experiences the same sense of dread from the beginning of her nightmare all over again. Uh, another parallel to Silent Hill 1, having a nightmare where you're exploring an area that you later have to uh, visit in real life. Uh, and of course, recurring location of Lakeside Amusement Park from Silent Hill 1. Scene 8, Heather and Claudia confront each other in the church. Alessa, who exists inside Heather, regains her memories, indicating that the birth of God is near. Um, that's an interesting bit of, of lore, because I always interpreted Heather sort of regaining her memories after defeating the memory of Alessa. Like, I thought that was kind of the, the whole inference of even the name of that boss being the memory of Alessa. Like once she overcame that, those memories became a part of her. Like she she was able to defeat that aspect of her and recognize that she is not Alessa. Even though she's reincarnated, she has her own will. She she is her own person, despite having those those memories from those previous lives as Alessa and as Cheryl. But this in, this seems to infer that it's just because the god is much closer to being born at that point. Um, which I guess also makes sense. The god is growing gradually the entire course of the game. And by that point, uh, I guess the memories of that god would be more closely tied with Alessa and sort of bringing that aspect back to her as well. Thought Heather is pretending slash mocking Claudia in that scene. Well, I think she is pretending. I think there that she is making a conscious effort to deceive Claudia, but she is doing so with confidence now that she has Alessa's memories. Again, she knows that she's not Alessa, she is her own person, but she knows enough, she can recall her life as Alessa enough to like convincingly try to deceive Claudia. 
That's the way I interpret that scene. Like, she's hoping she doesn't have to just, I don't know, confront her so directly if she can sort of talk her down. Although she's very much wants revenge at that point. She walks in and it's like an action movie. She pulls up the gun and says, checkmate. So I don't know how much she really wants to talk Claudia out of it. It seems like she's really dead set at that point on just killing her. But Heather's also supposed to be a good person. He doesn't want to just murder, even if she does very much want revenge. Uh, scene 9. Heather sees a closer creature for the first time. It becomes aware of her as she enters the room and attacks her. So, again, we saw the description and stuff for the Mandarin for Silent Hill 2. Essentially the same creature here, making a reappearance in Silent Hill 3, just with new, new animations. Uh, scene 10. Vincent appears before Heather and gives her an enigmatic, po uh, enigmatic piece of advice. When she first encounters him, his intentions are unknown. And I do like a lot of the little things that are hinted at in this scene. Because Vincent is aware that he knows who Heather is. He knows that she's got the God growing inside of her. And he knows that that God grows from negative feelings. So when he mentions Harry and Heather starts getting mad, Vincent very quickly is like, whoa, 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 please calm down. Because he, he doesn't want to trigger that negative anger he knows that's just making the god grow more. But he doesn't want to, like, let that much information... Like, he doesn't want to give that much away to Heather at that time. So when you have the context of what's going on, and you know what Vincent knows, his reactions make sense. Really good scenes. I love this this type of stuff in, in the original games. This is the sort of th things that are desperately missing from a lot of the later games. When I talk about the quality of writing and, and how well the characters come across, this is what I mean. These are the types of like moments where you can replay a game and get so much more value and context out of a scene um, after playing the game and understanding things that you didn't know the first time through or the second time through. Characters have depth. They have motivation and, and reason behind the things they do. And it makes sense. As opposed to, like, downpour. <laughs> you know? Where they go out of their way to completely contradict character motivation. Hey, Mirage. A hey, number. Fell asleep to this earlier, had a dream you were playing a horror game. Woke up to the sensation that some demon was hitting my head against the pillow. Pretty cool. I never have dreams like that. Sounds interesting. Uh, scene 11 of the intro. Heather in the car on the way to Silent Hill. She holds her father's notebook, which was found by Douglas. Again, going back to that uh, car scene. My favorite scenes in the game. Scene 12. The split worm creature attacks Heather. Its appearance resembles that of the split head that appears in the first game. Again, more parallels. You have all these parallels between Silent Hill 1 and Silent Hill 3. And uh, encountering that first boss in Silent Hill 1 being the split head lizard as opposed to the split worm that Heather encounters. Very, very similar in nature. To kind of allude to that, uh, that parallel. Scene 13. An unmanned subway train enters the station at high speed. Heather seems to be in imminent danger of being run over and killed by the train. You can be run over and killed by the train if you fuck around on the tracks for too long in the wrong spots.
Scene 14, Valtiel drags Heather's body away after her strength has run out. In certain locations, seeing this scene is the same as getting game over. Um, and this does only happen in certain situations in certain uh, areas throughout the game. Uh, for those who have never seen it, um, it is it, it can happen in, in a lot of places. But uh, yeah, there are times where Heather will die and instead of going directly to a game over screen, you get a short cutscene of Valtiel dragging Heather's body away. The implication being that Valtiel or can can just keep bringing Heather back to life and forcing her to continue. So all of the pain, all of the suffering, everything that is necessary for the god to grow, Heather can experience all of the pain and suffering of death only to be brought back by Valtiel and forced to continue. So Valtiel, he's not there for Heather. He's there for the god. He, he looks over the birth of the god. And Heather is essentially just the way it's described in, in Silent Hill 1. She is the incubator for the god. And the god grows off of those negative emotions. So the more pain, the more sadness, the more suffering that Heather has to endure, the more the god grows. So that's what Valtiel is doing. That's what uh, Claudia is doing. But yeah. Interesting scene. If you don't die a lot in Silent Hill 3, especially in certain areas, um, yeah, it can be very rare to come across this, uh, this sequence. But uh, I've definitely shown it in a few uh, story playthroughs. Scene 15. Heather sets foot in the other world for the first time in the shopping mall's elevator. Not even a kid could believe this. I love that sequence. Scene 16, a scene connected to scene 9. Heather, who has picked up a gun, takes the life of another for the first time at this point in the game. Yep, she picks up the gun and fights off the closer. Are the specifics of how to trigger the Valtiel scene unseen uh, known? Uh, they are. I don't know how well documented they might be out there. I might have to look into that, and if it's not already charted or anything out there, I might make uh, a little chart or infographic or something myself. But uh, it's it's specific locations and specific monsters that kill you. So there are certain locations that you have to be in. And I when I mean location, I mean it's specific to like the camera angle. So if you're at like the top of the escalator in the mall, that's one spot. But if you're in the hallway where the camera switches to show like the corpse that the dogs are eating, it won't happen there. Or if you're too close to the door where you use the, the moonstone, it won't happen there. But if you get killed by the closer at the top of the escalator, it has a chance of happening. And then even in the right spot in the right monster, I think there is some random element to it. It doesn't always happen. So I don't know if there's more info on that. Gave me something to look into, Surreal Palazzo, but yeah. Scene 17. Douglas, who has collapsed due to his injury, aims his gun at Heather's back as she walks away. I always kind of like the implication of that scene. Douglas kind of has a point. Like, if you could kill Heather, if he just shot and killed Heather right there. But presumably, Valtiel would show up and just bring her back. So that even that might not work. Might at the very least delay things until she reincarnates. If you can keep Valtiel from bringing her back. But even without Valtiel, presumably Alessa just reincarnates. So who knows? Scene 18. Valtiel's silhouette wriggles behind a giant ventilation fan. He first discovers Heather's existence in the shopping mall. That same elevator sequence here. 
continued on that scene. Scene 19, on the revolving merry-go-round, countless strange shadows reminiscent of burn marks crawl. Yeah, and they are. It's like burns crawling their way across flesh. Very reminiscent of Alessa being burned. Since this is where you fight memory of Alessa, everything is sort of thematically around Alessa and her burns. Um, and sort of the the way Ito has described it is like this aspect of Alessa that continues to exist through Heather that has just gone insane. You know, having experienced this horrible nightmare for your entire life and then being reincarnated into another being that's not even really you, that's not really your will anymore, but you're still a part of it. So Ito wanted to express something to show that part of Alessa still inside of Heather kind of going insane and losing itself. And that's the memory of Alessa confrontation. But I like the detail of the burn marks crawling across during the cutscene uh, where memory of Alessa is introduced. Scene 20, as in scene 1, Valtiel continues to turn the valve handle. What meaning could his behavior hold? They leave this pretty ambiguous. Um, considering you usually see him doing this action around the same time as a transition from the fog world to the other world, a lot of people theorize that Valtiel is also somewhat controlling kind of the flow of reality between reality and the other world using this this valve. Um, it was also recently discovered, uh, and I mean like last year recently discovered, someone doing a camera hack through Silent Hill 3 discovered some uh, like fleshy cables that are in the environment in the building world where the bath, the bloody bathtub is in Silent Hill 3 and um, connected it to Valtiel's valve, like these... So there's like the blood filling up the baths and these tubes connecting all of these things and Valtiel's valve. Uh, there's the smoky, bloody chamber that Valtiel is in that he's torturing the Fukuro nurse in, in Brookhaven. Um, so there's all these like recurring images of rooms filled with blood and smoke and uh, tubes, fleshy tubes connecting all of these things, all kind of linked to this valve. So some some way of kind of symbolically referencing this this flow of reality that is being tampered with through this valve. Turning the handle could be the cycle of rebirth of vessels, Alessa to Heather. That's another good way to look at it since everything is very uh, cyclical in nature, the way the reincarnation happens and even the parallels of Silent Hill 3 to Silent Hill 1, the events uh, as they happen. Could very much just be a way of kind of representing that visually. But this is the kind of thing that I love not necessarily having an answer to. Because it's not ultimately at the end of the day super significant to the overall story and plot, but it's a it's an interesting detail to kind of think about and theorize on. That I love that aspect of, of Silent Hill games, and it's a thing that I think a lot of newer Silent Hill games tend to get wrong. They, they try to make the wrong aspects of a story um, mysterious. Things that should have more of an answer don't. And things that are made mysterious are made that way just for the sake of it. Rather than to sort of enhance an element of the lore through ambiguity. If that makes any sense. I promise I'm not just saying words. <laughs> I 
have shower thoughts theory, but it's about Silent Hill 1 and 2. We'll only say it if it's okay. Yeah, go ahead. This is all about discussion. This guide, even though we're specifically on the Silent Hill 3 part of the guide, um, the Lost Memories covers Silent Hill 1 through 3. Um, so I'm fine with discussion with any of it. Um, but let's continue on with the scenes, the scene breakdown for the intro. Uh, scene 21, when the vinyl bag filled with blood is offered to the altar in the hospital, a huge hole appears in the room. Again, great sequence of events. I have an entire Google Docs. <laughs> I have like a whole fucking note uh, of, of crazy thoughts surrounding Brookhaven and Leonard um, and this sequence in Brookhaven that I've uh, read out during Silent Hill 3 story playthroughs in the past. And, uh, yeah. Not gonna get into that right now, because it's a lot. But next time I do a Silent Hill 3 story playthrough, I'll bust out the, uh, the, the word document. <laughs> All of my crazy thoughts on, uh, Leonard. Scene 22. The bottom of the hole that becomes the scene of the final battle. Here, Valtiel is present, continually watching Heather. And he also seems to be specifically caring for the god. He's like carrying the, uh, crawling up and pulling the veil off of the god's face after she's been born. Valtiel to me comes off more as like a caretaker to the god rather than specifically related to Heather. Like Heather is important because she is the mother of God, but Valtiel is in service more to the god than Heather. Here's Mirage's shower thoughts on Silent Hill 1 and 2. So in Silent Hill 1, the nurse Harry encounters dies when she finds out she's not real and born from Alessa's mind. In Silent Hill 2, Maria is born of James's mind. So after the ending when James leaves with her, wouldn't she die in the same way if she ever realizes the truth? Okay, so a lot of stuff to, to talk about on that. First of all, it's not a fair comparison uh, of Lisa and Maria. Maria is born completely from desires. She was never a real person. She is entirely manifested by the town. Lisa Garland was a real person who was born and lived and existed in Silent Hill, worked as a nurse uh, under Dr. Michael Kaufman, cared for Alessa, and then eventually died of a drug overdose induced by Michael Kaufman. So the Lisa that's being projected in Silent Hill 1, she's not just created from Harry's mind or Alessa's mind. She's a recreation of Lisa out of a living person's memories, Lisa's memories. Well, previously living person's memories. So like there's there's some similarities, like she is a manifestation the same way that Maria is. Like if you really get down to it, I'm just kind of splitting hairs, but they are, they are not the same. They are not equatable in that regard, just because Maria is born entirely from James's desires and Mary's memories like, but she is not Mary. She's also got her own will. That's what born from a wish is all about is that She's manifested using this dead woman's memories and James's desires, but the town is not controlling her. They, the town also gives her her own free will to decide what to do with her existence. So after the ending, when James leaves with her, wouldn't she die in the same way if she realizes the truth? See, that's what I mean. Maria realizes the truth. In Born from a Wish, Maria already realizes what she is, and she still chooses to do what she wants with her existence. Her her interactions with um, Ernest Baldwin cause her to realize that she is manifested, like she is not a living person, just the way Ernest is is like a ghost of somebody. So she realizes what she is and born from a wish. 
and she realizes who James is. She, she calls him a bad man, but then also says, but he's also kind because she has those memories from Mary of James being kind. So I, I don't think it's, it's not uh, equatable, Lisa and Maria. And what would happen to one if they left the town would not necessarily be what happens to the other. Maria has some self-awareness. And, and that self-awareness does not cause her to not exist the way it does for Lisa. Cool shower thought, though. Good discussion. And again, I'm, I'm just spitting theories. So don't take this as me being like, yeah, well, you're wrong. Um, no, I just have a different interpretation of the characters. So, but I get what you mean. I, I get your, your thought process on it. Hey, Reverend. I'm doing all right. We're reading the Lost Memories lore, official lore guide for Silent Hill 1 through 3. This is a breakdown of the Silent Hill 3 intro. So, scene 23, Heather stands motionless at the unmanned merry-go-round, sensing that someone is there. She turns her head. Scene 24, the image of Heather looking over her shoulder is completely enveloped in a shade of an orange that is quite like the color of flame. Again, more references to Alessa being burned, since that's the encounter with the memory of Alessa. Really good visual transition. And uh, yeah, the Silent Hill 3 intro in general, combined with the, uh, the song, You're Not Here. Excellent, excellent intro. Silent Hill 3 character commentary. Silent Hill 3 develops a rich story using a limited number of characters. Let's look at a deconstruction of the transitions of their designs. We have Heather. Real name Cheryl Mason. Age 17 in parentheses 24. Because her existence as Heather, as this version of Cheryl, is 17 years old. But if you count the seven years that she also existed as Cheryl, she would be 24. But then you can also count the 14 years that she existed as Alessa, which is why the happy birthday caller gives three different ages during that scene in Brookhaven Hospital in Silent Hill 3. The happy birthday caller wishes her three different ages of happy birthday, representing how old she is herself, how old she is as Alessa, and how old she is as Cheryl with those numbers combined. Uh, various part-time work. So she's a part-timer doing all sorts of stuff. An ordinary girl that could be found anywhere. She visits the mall to go shopping and finds that she has set foot into a nightmarish world. She is so far from ordinary. She has psychic powers. She can loot. She can shoot lasers from her eyes. Creator's comment. Her name comes from Miss Heather Morris, who did Heather's voice and motion in the game. At first, we had chosen the name Helen, but it was pointed out that this name is old-fashioned, and so it was changed. Uh, this is a bit of lore that I often bring up in my Silent Hill 3 story playthroughs, and this is the source for it. Uh, that is exactly it. Heather Morris, the voice actress and motion uh, actress, um, gave them permission to use her first name as the character's name instead of Helen, and they kept the name Helen in the name of the bakery, Helen's Bakery, where you pick up the tongs and the flamethrower on New Game Plus. Yes, this will be on YouTube. No worries. Early concept art. Look at this uh, early versions. The outfit designs included uh, coloring. Many of these drafts were considered. French actresses uh, such as Charlotte Gainsborough, Gainsborough and Vanessa Paradis were the models for these sketches. 
And they uh, they usually do this with concept art. They'll use uh, actresses and models for uh, some of their concept art and then sort of alter the appearance when they're making the actual 3D models. But uh, some interesting outfits. Douglas Cartland, age late 50s. He's 50 something years old. He's a private detective, middle-aged private detective who handles missing person and personal conduct cases. He originally worked as a police detective, but retired 10 years ago. On that occasion, he and his wife were divorced. So a little bit of extra backstory there on Douglas, with because he never really mentions too much about that. But uh, in-game, he talks about why he retired. Um, his son was a bank robber who got shot robbing a bank. And uh, that must have driven a divide between Douglas and his wife, uh, causing the divorce. Douglas had a very sad life there. Lost his son, lost his wife, became a private detective, couldn't be a cop anymore. And because he's not a cop anymore, some people, uh, and I've even expressed this theory during some story playthroughs in the past, but some people speculate that he may have been one of the police who was there handling the bank robbery, possibly even the one who shot his son. That would definitely make you want to retire. Another day on the force, shooting a bank robber turns out to be your own kid. And I, I always kind of got the implication that was like, the tragedy that that drove Douglas away from police work. But just implied, it's not not canonical, not official. Creator's comment. His name comes from a famous actor from the 1920s, Douglas Fairbanks. Simply put, this name just seemed to suit him. There is no real connection to his namesake. It seems like a lot of times they just kind of pull names from actors and, and things that they like the sound of. So, Douglas Fairbanks, Douglas Cartland came from. It seems that his image as an unremarkable middle-aged detective was solidified in the early stages of design. Actors such as Ian Holm and Giancarlo Giangini were the models for these sketches. You can really see the Ian Holm coming through. I believe specifically he was based on Ian Holm as he was in uh, Fifth Element. Claudia Wolf. Name Claudia Wolf, age 29. She's a priestess in a religious organization. A priestess who believes deeply in her religion. In order to create paradise, she shadows Heather and attempts to cultivate the hatred inside of her. Creator's comment. Her name comes from an Italian actress from the 1960s, Claudia Cardinale. Originally, we had named her Christy, but it was pointed out that this name is too cute. And so we decided to change it. Yeah, Christy would have been strange. I could see Christy as being like a Stephen King reference and wanting to use that initially, but cult leader Christy <laughs> comes off a, a little bit sillier than, than Claudia. Claudia is definitely a little more, I don't know, regal. Rough sketches, a draft featuring a long robe that trails along the ground. You can imagine a lot of hardware limitations <laughs> would have prevented uh, some of these ideas. Of her four characters, her design was the most difficult. Dressing her like a holy woman was considered as well. I can see why they stepped away from that, because then it goes a little bit too Dahlia. You want her to be a parallel to Dahlia, but not Dahlia exactly. And that's 
That's a little too much. Interesting alterations on hairstyles. The model for these sketches was Hollywood actress Julianne Moore. I can see it. An early design in which she is a skinhead covered in tattoos. This design was discarded. This is the best Claudia design. Screw your long robe. Screw your final design with no eyebrows. I wanted completely naked skinhead covered in tattoos, Claudia. This would have been so bizarre. It, it, more like a fucking um, Hellraiser. It'd be like a Cenobite more than a just a, a, a cult leader. Something so much more sinister and, and creepy about this, but clearly you can't get away with that kind of design. Uh, unfortunately. Vincent. Would have felt more edgy than scary, like a villain from Blade. I don't know. It depends on how she would have been portrayed and carried. I think you could make that design work, but it definitely would be... It would be completely different, you know? A completely different vibe from the character. It wouldn't be the same. But interesting to consider. Vincent, age 24 to 26, somewhere in there? Let's say 25. Just split the difference. A priest in a religious organization, a young priest who's at odds with Claudia and supports Heather in order to thwart her plans. The prospect of putting himself in physical danger scares him. Creator's comment, his name originates from Vincent Gallo, an actor known for films such as Buffalo 66. The association is suggested by his unshaven look. He isn't cool, like his namesake, though. Not cool. What do you mean, not cool? Vincent's kind of cool. He's a dick. He's an asshole. He's not... He's a creep, yeah. But there is something... Look at him. Let's look at him. Modeled after the actor Ethan Hawke. These sketches emphasize derangement and moodiness. Love these designs. I kind of wish he got the... <laughs> the little bit longer hair here. The casual clothes. Imagine getting sports jersey. <laughs> sports jersey and blue jeans. Yeah, it is very John Lennon. More than more than Ethan Hawke. This one is very John Lennon-y. Although Vincent's clothes in the game are formal, casual outfits were considered as well. See, when you put in the code, when you put in the Konami code to, to make Douglas not wear any pants, it should have also put Vincent in this outfit. Silent Hill 3 creature commentary. Creatures that have come... Let me start over. Creatures that have come... <laughs> to have abundant variations. Each of them holds a certain significance. The numbody, found in the sewers, creature with long, slender legs, comes in various sizes. It's given the name numbody due to its slow and clumsy movements and the fact that its body appears pale as if frozen. Closers. Monster that has an extremely large body, attacks with blades that come out of the ends of its arms. Named Closer because of its ability to obstruct a route with its huge body. Oh, so there, there is our official pronunciation. It's closing off uh, a route of escape. It's, it's obstructing. It's closing. It's a closer. Some people have, have and including myself, have brought this up. Is it, is it closer or closer? Closer. 
It also has the appearance of a mandarin from the previous work that has risen above ground. That's pretty much the only mention of that, but yeah, it's, it's essentially just a mandarin from Silent Hill 2, but it's above ground with new animations. In fact, um, there is an unused animation for the closer in the game files for Silent Hill 3, where you can see it climbing up from something like a grate. So originally it was supposed to have some of its Silent Hill 2 animations where it would have been hanging under things and then climbed up above ground to start attacking you. But I guess technical limitations or whatever, they did away with that concept and uh, some of the animations are still in the files but unused. Double head. Found in the office building and amusement park, monster resembling a dog that has a split head with sharp fangs. Split head. Its appearance is greatly influenced by the image of Alessa after she was incapacitated due to the fire. So, not only do we have kind of the recurring theme of dog enemies, which were significant in Silent Hill 1 uh, due to Alessa's fear of dogs, but... The appearance of the dog itself, it's burned all over and covered in gross-looking bandages, the way that Alessa was depicted in her hospital bed uh, towards the end of her life, and the head being split in two, giving the idea of the two halves of Alessa's soul, Alessa and Cheryl, sort of the split existence that Alessa had to live. So. Both of those aspects come through in the double head creature. Good stuff. Pendulum. Worst enemy ever. Found in the sewers and the amusement park. Monster with two heads and a metallic body. Although it has no wings, it revolves in midair. Uh, pendulum, so named for the way that it moves and attacks while the upper half of its body rotates. Fuck these things. They're such a pain in the ass to fight. The sound they make is so grating on the ears. I mean, it's a horrible design. Like, it's it's doing its job. You don't want to fucking be anywhere near it. But fuck these things. Slurpers. Found in the office building in the church. Humanoid being that crawls along the floor. Plays dead in order to lure its prey. Slurper, named for its habit of slurping up the rust-colored blood and bits of flesh that stick to the floor with its pointed bill. Good old Slurper. And unfortunately, they don't show you the best angle of the Slurper, where you can see the, f the front of the mouth, that pointed bill that it's talking about. Because when you really look at the Slurper, like, it looks like a human that has been deformed. Like, the body, the arms and everything look humanoid. The head is a human head. You can see right here, that's like a human ear. And the area where the bill starts is a different color, a different texture than the actual skin of the closer. Or, excuse me, of the slurper. So, this is like stitched on, attached to a human head. Some other piece of something that's just like stitched onto the front of it. And on the front of the bill, there is a mouth with teeth and everything. So it's like, is this all like, it's, it's so gross and unnatural. I love this creature design. Insane Cancer. Found in the subway in the office building. A monster with a soft and flabby whitish body. Hey, that's me. Cancer Running Wild. So named because its outward appearance is suggestive of a cancerous mass. And if you think about how Heather would feel about this god growing in her, she probably likens it to cancer growing inside of her. And thus, we get this portrayal. 
nurses found in the hospital. Nurse-type monster that carries a handgun and iron pipe. A nurse that roams the halls of the hospital. It may be that the nurses of the hospital transformed into monsters, but the details are unclear. They even leave this ambiguous. They kind of hint like, eh, are these actual nurses that have become monsters? I assume they're just manifestations like everything else rather than a person or formally a person. But uh, it's creepier when it's ambiguous. And they got that fucking thing on them. The nurses in Silent Hill 3 do not fuck around. They will shoot you. Split worm. Found in the shopping mall. Gigantic worm with jaws inside the tip of its head. Split worm. It is patterned after the split head creature that appears in the first game. Now, personally, I feel there's some more symbolism to it than that, considering the themes of impregnation uh, and the very phallic nature and appearance of the creature being a, a split head worm is very different from being the the way the split head lizard was in Silent Hill 1 this one you know a little more peen like is what I'm trying to say I feel like that is not a coincidence but maybe we just see the things that we want to see Missionary, found in the apartment building. Humanoid monster that obeys Claudia and carries out her commands. Missionary, cult member transfigured by Claudia's power. To Heather's eyes, the appearance it takes is that of a monster. They look like monsters to her. But one of the things that's worth pointing out about the missionary, and you can kind of see it down here for the artwork for the scraper as well. See this like little part right here where the the light is hitting and highlighting this is like a human nose and human mouth where it's just got like a bag over the head um so again very very human looking rather than the more abstract creatures and things that you're encountering and we know that it's supposed to be, you know, a cult member, somebody that Claudia is giving orders to. Humanoid monster that obeys Claudia. So they look like monsters to her, but in reality they're people? No. So this is this is the thing. And that's the way a lot of people interpreted uh the manifestations and the creatures all the way back to Silent Hill 1 that was a, a popular fan theory, is that your protagonist is just crazy, they're running around a normal town uh, and killing real people and, and think they're killing monsters. Um, that's a fan theory that goes all the way back to 1999 in the first game. Team Silent wanted to sort of turn that fan theory on its head and kind of give fans their response to that theory and they do that through Vincent's comment. They look like monsters to you. He throws that line in just to kind of make Heather and the player reconsider the context of what they're doing. Because it's scary when you're when you're unsure about something. Um, that adds doubt. That adds dread. Rather than having something be intentionally and deliberately, blatantly defined. More likely, the way that Vincent's line is meant to be interpreted, and again, this comes from Team Silent being very, very big fans of Jacob's Ladder. So in Jacob's Ladder, there is a philosophy that is described by one of the characters towards the end that when you're nearing the end of your life and you start to see, you know, you're having trouble passing on if you're trying to cling on to the idea of life and not move to the other world that 
you'll feel like demons are trying to tear you apart. They'll rip you away. But if you accept that you're dead and you're moving on to the other life, they're actually angels that are taking you away. So from the perspective of the cult's beliefs, they don't see these things as monsters. These are deities. These are angels. These are things that they believe in, parts of their belief system that Heather sees as monsters, interprets as monsters, and as creatures. They are manifestations. They're not people. They are not real things that are being perceived incorrectly. You know, they're not living creatures in that sense. They are manifestations. They're not just illusions. They're real. They're physically there. But they're not naturally occurring creatures. They are uh, the thoughts and fears and memories resembling cult members, resembling Alessa's fears or Heather's uh, trauma that is being given a physical form through the power of either the Silent Hill town itself or through the power of the god growing inside of Heather. So they're not real people, but they are perceived differently to different people. Vincent doesn't necessarily... He wouldn't call them monsters. And ultimately need to listen to the last part of Vincent's line where he tells Heather, don't worry, it's just a joke. Just a joke. He's just fucking with you. Because ultimately, however you want to interpret it, Vincent's intention with the line is to just add a little bit of doubt into Heather's reasoning. He likes to mess with people. And he was in a position to mess with Heather and he took it. That's the, ty that's the type of person he is. Yeah, the little silent laugh where he pushes up his glasses. Yeah, that's the... <laughs> I got you. I got you. You think you're getting used to this place? You think you're getting used to living in my world? I can still freak you out. And he wanted to portray that. He wanted to impart that idea onto her. And that scene does it wonderfully. The fact that it also casts so much doubt into the player just shows how perfectly executed the writing and performance was. Because it's one thing to just write in the script, like, oh, Vincent says this line and Heather is taken aback by it. Because you can have your actors perform and react however you want them to. But to get a genuine response out of a player, out of a real person, that takes some, some good writing. You have to be immersed into what you're playing and into the performances the characters are giving. So if you played this game and Vincent's line made you second guess what the monsters were, regardless of what they might be at the end of the day, however you interpret it or I interpret it, if you second guessed yourself, that was a well-written line. That was a well-delivered performance. It got you. Vincent got you. Moving on. The glutton found in the office building, an extremely large cylindrical monster. Regardless of what weapons are used on it, it is impassable. Glutton. Although it is a monster that appears in a story from a picture book, its form is manifested by the power of the other world. And yeah, it's there to kind of play a parallel to the, the story book about the creature blocking the gates to the castle. Um... But still, I love this creature design so much. Even for being a creature you don't necessarily fight. 
to me, this is like peak enemy design, creature design, where you can sit here and stare at it and recognize parts of it. There's some human looking feet. It's a somewhat humanoid shape for this like center mass. There's human looking lips on it. But other than that, it's very abstract. Being able to sort of piece together little bits of what you're looking at, but not know what you're looking at as a whole. Um, that is that is good, good creepy abstract creature design. I love that shit. I I hate monster design where it is just you know. Look, it's just a it's just a guy. Even stuff like the scraper, like I love the design of the scraper, and it's very intentional for it to be humanoid because of what it represents. But like, think about like I don't know, downpour the the screamers or the uh, the prisoner enemies, where it's just like a dirty lady with claws, a crazy prisoner man with a metal thing on his face. No. Give me this. Give me... Give me something that will make me say, what the fuck am I looking at out loud? <laughs> Scraper. Found in the church. Humanoid monster that carries a weapon in each hand. Moves with great speed. Scraper. So named for its habit of incessantly scraping the two sharp-edged tools it carries together. And it does that in-game as well. Walks around scraping them together. Annoying ass enemies. They have knocked me down in the last little hallways, narrow hallways of speedruns many times. Memory of Alessa. Amusement park. A facsimile of Heather that attacks and attempts to kill her. Alessa's obsession... Alessa's other mind that was separated 17 years ago. It is a memory that clings to this place. I love the, the memory of Alessa. Although so much of me wishes the model looked different instead of just being dark <laughs> shadow Heather. Um, I, I would have liked if it actually resembled like Silent Hill 1, Alessa, a bit more. I get why you do something like this, because it's less resource intensive. You use your, your character model and sort of modify it uh, instead of making a whole new model. But it would have been really cool if, if Memory of Alessa more closely resembled Silent Hill 1, Alessa. Dark Heather is good. I Don't get me wrong. I like the Dark Heather memory of a lesser design, but I would have preferred something more reminiscent of Alessa being distinct from Heather and resembling her, her own self. Leonard. Found below the hospital, lurks in the water and surfaces to attack without warning. Leonard's transfigured form, the shape he has assumed, is the embodiment of Claudia's hatred or of Heather's terror. You decide. Like I said, I have a whole, like, multi-page document of my th thoughts and theories on Leonard Wolf. Um, I know I've read through it in Silent Hill 3 story playthroughs in the past. I'll probably do it for a Silent Hill 3 story playthrough in the future. Um, I don't want to go through all of it right now because that'll detract from all of the stuff we still want to go through in, in this book. But yeah, there's all sorts of interesting thoughts behind Leonard. Is he alive? Is he dead and manifested as a creature? Um, you know, why is he distinctly different from other creatures? He can speak and understand. Uh, uh, other characters, he can communicate telepathically through phones. Uh, but even when he's communicating telepathically through a phone, he can confuse who he's talking to. He can talk to Heather and think he's talking to Claudia. 
There's a lot of weird shit. When you really start thinking about Leonard, there's a lot of weird shit, which is why I've got like a fucking eight page document that I wrote with all of my crazy theories about Leonard. Altiel. Uh, hospital and church. He definitely shows up more than that. Appears in various places, but does not attack Heather. Derived from valet. As God's attendant, Valtiel observes Heather in order to ensure the birth of God. Or, as it was pronounced in the by the host of that Crimson Head podcast, um, Vitali. The sect of Vitali. Derived from valet. That always felt funny to me, even if it makes sense. Yeah, it's like I get it, but then you can't help but just think of Valtiel like standing around waiting to park your car for you. Like. <laughs> Look, Valtiel's got to get work where he can find it. Eventually, he winds up passing uh, shitty weapons out to teenagers in Silent Hill Book of Memories, so it's all downhill for Valtiel after this. The God. Area, church. Character, God that manipulates flames. The lower half of its body is in an immature state due to its birth. That's why it's all bony and gross looking as a result of being born from claudia's womb its form is close to the image of god she believed in that of alessa so a lot of people have brought up the appearance of the god in silent hill 3 and why it's different looking from gods in silent hill 1 and stuff like that silent hill 1 the god took the form of what dahlia believed the god looked like for Silent Hill 3, Claudia worshipped Saint Alessa. She was obsessed with Alessa. So the god took on that form. Much more closely resembles Alessa instead. Silent Hill 3 ending and theme song analysis. A review of the ending, along with a look at the significance entrusted to the theme and insert songs. Ending analysis. After God was dead, what was it that she saw? Summary. After Heather has defeated the monster, all of her stress and tension seems to loosen at once, and she breaks down crying while calling out for her father. However, immediately afterwards, she senses that someone is there and looks back over her shoulder. After this, Heather returns to where she left Douglas and cheerfully discusses how her assumed name is no longer necessary. Heather kicks the monster in the head and puts the church behind her. Valtiel is already nowhere to be seen. A little note about this. So, she senses that someone is there and looks back over her shoulder. That sequence is still part of the Silent Hill 3 ending. One thing that was cut from early versions of the game, uh, internal versions of the game during development, there was originally going to be a baby crying uh, after the sequence of God dying. So that's what Heather would turn and look back at, is this sound of the baby crying, giving the implication that the God or Claudia or whatever once again reincarnated the same way that she did um so team silent i guess for whatever reason decided maybe that was too obvious or they didn't like the idea that it leads into yet another potential continuation of the story since they seem like they kind of wanted silent hill 3 to be like the, the bookend to the Alessa story. They wanted this to, to be the conclusion and adding that cry like leaves too much open maybe. Whatever their intention, they decided to remove that baby crying sound effect. The opening theme, You're Not Here. 
The opening theme is sung about the feelings involved with the loss of an important person. These feelings of loss become an important factor in what drives the heroine in the latter half of the game. Then we have the lyrics to You're Not Here, Blue Sky to Forever, The Green Grass Blows in the Wind, Dancing. It would be a much better sight with you, with me. If you hadn't met me, I'd be fine on my own, baby. I never felt so lonely. Then you came along. So now what should I do? I'm strung out, addicted to you. My body, it aches. Now that you're gone, my supply fell through. I don't know. When you consider the feelings of loss are between a daughter and father, I feel like I don't know. I don't think that's... I don't think that's the best thing to interpret. It's a little much. I mean, it's still dealing with the loss of an important person. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> Uh, insert song, Letter from Past Days, or Letter from the Lost Days. This insert song is in the background music for the scene in the car driving to Silent Hill. In a voice expressing pain, it is sung about hope for the future. Letter to my future self, am I still happy I began? Have I grown up pretty? Is daddy still a good man? Am I still friends with Colleen? I'm sure that I'm still laughing. Aren't I? Aren't I? Hey there to my future self, if you forget how to smile. I have this to tell you, remember it once in a while. Ten years ago your past self prayed for your happiness. Please don't lose hope. Oh what a pair, me and you, put here to feel joy, not be blue. Sad times, bad times, see them through. Soon we will know if it's for real what we both feel. Little reference here to uh yeah the the put here to feel joy chorus i love yeah great song great lyrics um had the pleasure of seeing this performed live back in 2014 when akira yamoka mary elizabeth mclinn and their touring silent hill band uh came to san antonio texas and played at uh, san japan which is a, an anime convention that I was working for at the time. I was the night events director, so I got to work with them directly, um, setting up for their concert and their event. Um, and I even got the band to autograph uh, a guitar for me, which is uh, currently in my friend Hirimi's possession. Who's Colleen, though? I Yeah, I think they just made up a name to go for the rhyme. You'll have to ask <laughs> Mary Elizabeth McGlynn. Insert song, I Want Love. This is the insert song for the scene in which Heather and Douglas meet again. The two of them are in the mutual situation of having lost a family member, which overlaps with the, wor with the world of the lyrics. The song emphasizes sorrowfulness. I love this song. This is the only lyric here that makes me kind of laugh about it. I love this song. But Swiss cheese heart will never not sound slightly comical to me. Want a cup that overflows with love, although it's not enough to fill my heart. Want a barrel full of love, although I know it's not enough to fill my heart. Want a river full of love, but then I know the holes will still remain. I need an ocean full of love. I know the holes will still remain. And the Swiss cheese hot nose. <laughs> it's just so funny because it's sung with such like 
reckless abandon Mary puts so much into it, and it just sounds it it the, you can't say cheese in in a serious context. <laughs> And the Swiss cheese hot nose. <sighs> Only kindness can fill its holes. I'd love to dry my tears <laughs> as pain disappears. Great song. Cheese is funny. Ending theme, Hometown. The memorable lyrics of the ending theme seem to be about the story of Silent Hill being told in a town somewhere far away. Nothing, no notes to add. Hometown is perfect. Uh, Joe Ramersa is a national treasure. Hang on. Time to get the stream DMCA'd. Just listen to Joe.
Surprise music change. Uh, so they changed some of the lyrics. Some of the lyrics here are actually not accurate to the song. Funny enough. But that could be, again, translation error. Maybe something from the original. Such a great track. That one, I'm like, I love these songs. We just have to play Hometown. I'm just going to play Hometown. <laughs> Let everyone listen to the entirety of it. I don't care if it means my videos can't be monetized. Which, by the way, most of my videos are not monetized, or at least not by me. Uh, because I play a lot of video games with licensed music and stuff in them. Even Akira Yamaoka stuff for the most part. So, if you like what I do and you want to support... Uh, support me. I don't really get a whole lot of support through YouTube itself, but following, subscribing, especially on Twitch, helps out immensely. But yeah, I don't worry too much about monetizing my videos on YouTube because most of them can't be. Not without basically removing all the music and then what would the point be? Footnote. The lyrics in Silent Hill 3 were made to fit the songs from the original Japanese verses and produced with the English translation. The Japanese is written strictly in poetic verse and the English translation isn't exact in quite a few sections because it was fitted to the music and converted to English. So that is worth pointing out. Um, the lyrics for these songs are originally credited to uh, Hiroyuki Owaku, who was the scenario writer. So he would have written poetic verses. He basically wrote poems to then have converted into English. Um, and I believe the, the English translation would have been done by Joe Ramersa working with Akira Yamaoka and then performed by Mary Elizabeth McGlynn. Can you listen to the Japanese versions anywhere? No, they weren't performed. They were written by Owaku and then given to uh, Joe Ramersa and Akira Yamaoka and Mary Elizabeth McGlynn to translate and uh, restructure to the music. But there would be no Japanese, there, no, there would be no recording of the Japanese original. Um, as far as I know, even in writing, uh, Owaku's original lyrics are not out there anywhere. So that's probably something that was only shared internally. And that is the end. Uh, the staff credits for Silent Hill 3. Um, hey, Voltiel. What are we reading up on? So this is Lost Memories, the Silent Hill Chronicle. This was a Konami published lore guide for Silent Hill 1, 2, and 3 um, that was printed uh, on the reverse pages of a Silent Hill 3 strategy guide that only released in Japan. It was translated by fans and made into a 
browsable website format by fans. Um, and this particular uh, book, Lost Memories, is one of the most commonly cited sources of information for a lot of uh, Silent Hill content creators, YouTubers out there. Uh, a lot of people who know interesting little facts and stuff about Silent Hill, a lot of it comes from this book. So I figured it would be fun to just read through the book in its entirety on stream and discuss it as we go. But that's what we've been doing for the last um, five hours. So we've gone through all of this from the start all the way up through. We're now on staff credits making of Silent Hill 3. And then we still have all this extra stuff to get into. Making of Silent Hill 3, summary, profiles of those present. Producer and sound director Akira Yamaoka, born in 1968, responsible for sound in the first game as well as in the subsequent games of the series. Uh, and they're saying that back when it was just Silent Hill 1, 2, and 3. There wasn't one for Silent Hill 4. Nope, this book came out before 4 was a thing, and they never made another one of these lore guides after this one. Um, so, <laughs> even back when it was just Silent Hill 1 through 3, you know, they're mentioning Yamaoka was doing the sound for the subsequent games, and, of course, Yamaoka winds up being basically one of the only uh, concurrent members in the Silent Hill series after Silent Hill 3, um, going through Silent Hill 4 and Origins, uh, basically everything except for Downpour and Book of Memories uh, and Ascension, and The Short Message. Everything else is a Yamaoka. Wait. No. Short Message is Yamaoka, isn't it? Now I have to look. Yeah, short message was Yamoka. Okay. So it's everything except for Downpour and Book of Memories. Those two were composed by Daniel Leaked. Also, the producer on Silent Hill 3, although funny, in an interview, uh, someone asked him about his promotion to uh, a producer role between Silent Hill 2 and Silent Hill 3, and Akira Yamaoka's response was he honestly didn't take it seriously because he was completely focused on releasing Silent Hill 3's soundtrack. He was more focused on the soundtrack than any other part of Silent Hill 3's production. In addition to the series, uh, he has worked on games such as Contra and Beat Mania. Yeah, that's just a tiny sliver, but Yamaoka's been with Konami, like, forever. And, uh, been doing music for Contra, Silent Hill, Beat Mania, Dance Dance Revolution, Guitar Freaks, tons of shit. 4 does have, like, the victim files and stuff, but it doesn't have a full-on, like, book like this. Art director and creature designer, Masahiro Ito, born in 1972, responsible for background and creature design in the first game, held the position of creature designer and art director in Silent Hill 2 and 3. Um, one of those things that some people might not be aware of, that yeah, Ito also did the backgrounds, especially, uh, specifically for the other world segments of the game in Silent Hill 1, more than just creature design. Um, Masahiro Ito, also one of the only active sources of information regarding Team Silent in the original games today, uh, since he's very active on Twitter. He's basically one of maybe like three members of Team Silent that are uh, regularly active and posting on Twitter. The other two that I know of are uh, Hiroko Usada and uh, Usagi Tanaka. The Hiro Usada being the background artist for Silent Hill 3 and 4, and uh, Usagi Tanaka being the character designer for Robbie the Rabbit, among many other things. 
Uh, character model, chief designer Shingo Yuri. Born in 1970, in charge of character motion in Silent Hill 2, acted as chief of character team in Silent Hill 3. Besides this series, he's worked on games such as Hyper Olympics. Shingo Yuri more recently has worked on things like Luigi's Mansion, uh, some of the newer Luigi's Mansion sequels um, Shingo Yuri is a uh, director and producer on. Graphics engine programmer Norihito Hatakada, uh, Hatakeda, who uh, Ito has often cited as being one of the most important members of Team Silent when people ask him uh, about such things on Twitter, basically without Norihito Hatakeda, there would be no engine for the game to be made on. Born in 1972, he's had a hand in the Silent Hill series since the second game, in charge of programming related to effects throughout. In addition to the Silent Hill series, he's worked on games such as NHL Blades of Steel 2000. Classic. <laughs> Character programmer, Yuki Mizouchi, born in 1972, responsible for character programming since the first game, puts together everything related to fighting and action. So whenever you say mean things about the combat in Silent Hill games, old Silent Hill games, you are making Yuki Mizouchi very upset, and you should stop it and consider his feelings. Uh, work he has been responsible for besides this series include Fairway of Glory, Virtual Golf Simulation. Planner and Scenario Writer, Hiroyuki Owaku. Born in 1975, responsible for all event programming in and after the first game. Also worked on the scenario in Silent Hill 2 and 3. Even though he wasn't the original scenario writer for Silent Hill 1, uh, he was the event programmer. Um, Hiroyuki Owaku became very, very crucial to the creative team because of his scenario work with Silent Hill 2 and 3, like to the point where multiple members of Team Silent uh, in other interviews when asked about the lore basically say that nobody on the team knew all of the lore except for Hiroyuki Owaku. Like this was the guy. Uh, when it came to the cult and its history and like the characters and the backstories, like everything involving the history and the scenario, like that's a walk. That's a walk. Question. First of all, please let us know. Uh, oh, excuse me. First of all, please tell us about how you got started on the development of the game. Hiroyuki Owaku. We finished working on our previous project on the PS2 in August of 2001, and then in October we were hard at work on Restless Dreams. We began working on Silent Hill 3 immediately after that. Shows you how quickly the turnaround process was as they were working on those games, where they'd finish one and basically immediately start working on the next. Um, it looks like you rarely saw any vacation time. Was this painful for you? Everyone laughs. Masahiro Ito, I felt that it was dis dispiriting at times, but then if you take a vacation whenever you feel like it, you'll lose your job, so... Um, considering what we know now about working conditions for employees at Konami, I'm sure this is, you know, much, much, much worse and harsher than they let on. In fact, I mentioned uh, Hiro Usuda being one of the other active members of Team Silent on Twitter who recently had been talking about, uh, you know, how proud she is of the work that she did back then, but at the same time, how damaging to her it was living that sort of life where you are just constantly working. You don't have time for any sort of life outside of what you're doing for your company. Um, and how like harmful that was for her during those years. So, I mean, at the one hand, we got some amazing work out of it, um, absolute masterpieces, but on the other hand, fuck Konami. Fuck you, Konami. Owaku mentions that one reason for starting the game someplace other than Silent Hill is so they could include locations that wouldn't be found in a small countryside town, such as an urban shopping center and subway. 
Ito says the use of visual noise in the game isn't constant. It's very slight at the beginning and increases as Heather gets closer to Silent Hill. Those are notes regarding other things. Um, I think that is important to point out, considering the current direction of the series, where they feel like they're so... They're like, we, we're too confined to write stories that are just taking place in the town of Silent Hill. So we want to have stories that take place all over the world, which is why Silent Hill Ascension is taking place in Norway and Pennsylvania. That's why the short message takes place in Germany. That's why Silent Hill F is going to be in Japan, is because they feel like they're, they just want to tell Silent Hill stories anywhere not related to the town. All the way back to Silent Hill 3, Owaku addresses this. They wanted to be able to include locations other than Silent Hill, so they wrote it into the story and made it make sense. This is one of the biggest things that, like, I'm sorry I'm going off on a sudden, like, angry rant, I promise. I've seen so many fans, you know, talking about this, this point when it comes to the direction of the series right now of having Silent Hill games take place in other places and, like... I'm not against that idea. I, I also think that other settings and locations are good for the series and good for variety when it comes to telling Silent Hill stories. The difference is in Silent Hill 3 and in Silent Hill 4 where they do that, it still ties back to the town in a meaningful way. As opposed to something like the short message where Silent Hill is mentioned twice. It's mentioned in the title of the game, Silent Hill The Short Message, and it's mentioned in one note that explains all of the weird shit happening all over the world as just being the Silent Hill phenomenon. And that's it. Like, it's such a lazy way to try and tie things in to the, to the series just for pure brand recognition, for pure marketing purposes, and no sort of intentions the way it was for these games of having a story that is central to Silent Hill focused around the town even though it takes place partly in other locations. Sorry. Just had to go on that rant for a little bit. Moving on. Ito says that the use of visual noise in the game is a constant. It's very slight at the beginning and increases as Heather gets closer to Silent Hill. That's true. Um, if you play with the noise effect on, on Silent Hill 3, which if you're playing on your own, you should, I usually turn it off. <laughs> Excuse me. I usually turn it off when I stream because it destroys the bit rate um, when you're broadcasting. But if you're playing on your own, you should play with noise effect on. And it is a dynamic noise effect. It is constantly getting stronger over the first part of the game and then it sort of fluctuates depending on things that are happening in the environment but note number three in silent hill 2 noise was used to express james's delusions in silent hill 3 one reason there's very little noise in the early stages of the game is that heather hasn't yet recovered her memories that's another reason behind it Awaku says that he wrote the scenario in Japanese and then Jeremy Blaustein, uh, Blaustein, the English supervisor, translated it into English. In order to breathe life into the English version of the script, many small revisions were made during the translation process. Um, yep, and Jeremy has also done interviews and talked about the same process where Owaku had the script written out. He gave it to Jeremy. Jeremy would translate it. And then as Jeremy was translating it, he would very closely be working with Owaku and say like, hey, this thing, particular thing might not translate well to an American audience or this particular thing might not, you know, work in this context and gave suggestions on things to alter and things to change. So there were little revisions and things made, but that's a... A very interesting process considering so many games produced in Japan, especially at that time, were really just you make it in Japanese, you release it in Japanese, and then a different company picks it up and does an English dub and does their own translation and script and stuff on top of it. 
Whereas this was a Japanese game developed by a Japanese team specifically for an English audience, an English speaking audience. So the translation and, and localization had to be done in a much more direct way. And I think that makes that's one of the things that makes sort of the script for Silent Hill, the Silent Hill games, first four games, very distinct, is that process. <clears throat> but that's also from, you know, my standpoint, my viewpoint as an English speaking, you know, English speaking, first language speaking experience with the game. I don't know what it would have been like for someone uh, playing this in Japanese, hearing English that you only sort of understand and reading Japanese uh, subtitles. Possibly, uh, I mean, obviously a very different experience. Or wherever in the world you were, whatever version you played. Because no matter what, the language for these games is the same in all regions. There's no alternate dubs for these games, any of the Silent Hill games. Um, they're all done in English. The only thing that changes is the subtitles, depending on what region you play in. So if you play it in, you know, Spanish-speaking regions, you'll have Spanish subtitles. If you play it in Japanese, you'll have Japanese subtitles, but the voice acting is always English. It's always the same. So makes these games very unique in their just development. Uh, he also mentions that one of the reasons for choosing a main character that was a girl is that, is that he was getting bored with male protagonists. Um, making the protagonist female gives players something new, and depicting the storyline as well as fear and other emotions can take on new aspects. And of course, a male protagonist can't be the mother of God. That would just be silly. Um... I will say, I think that is something that needs to happen more often. Not just for the sake of happening, but you you do get so many different viewpoints. So so many so much of the Silent Hill stories are about resonating with different people, and not everybody is going to resonate the same between you know Harry and James and having characters like Heather to represent you know not only a female part of the audience that is looking for someone to resonate with, but also just a younger protagonist in general. Um, as opposed to like Harry and James, which when I played these games, you know, I was a teenager, so Harry and James being in their 20s and 30s and at the time feeling like these are, you know, old men, grown, grown adults. Now I'm older than them. Um, versus playing Silent Hill 3. I was 15 uh, when Silent Hill 3 came out and Heather was 17. So like even even then, like I resonated so much more with the character, even not being a male protagonist, but just someone closer to my age, someone who acted like that as well. The way that she responds and reacts to things felt appropriate to me. Um, in character, believable as something a 17-year-old girl would say or do. So I think that that also plays a big aspect of it. Uh, the reason for having only four central characters, five if you count Leonard, uh, is that the team had planned to keep the story relatively simple from the beginning. Simply. Relatively simply. Uh, yep, I've heard that as well, um, and I believe in some other developer interviews, the intention was to be a conclusion to Alessa's storyline. So they didn't want to do a whole bunch of endings, that's why there's only so many endings, compared to five endings, six endings of the previous games. Uh, this one's only got good ending, bad ending, joke ending, only three. So this one, I think they wanted to simplify it a lot so that it was easier to make it a a satisfying conclusion to Alessa's storyline. 
Shingo Yuri says that the overall quality of the character designs benefited from the fact that there were so few characters. They get to focus more time on really fleshing out their few characters rather than trying to uh, make a whole lot of them, so that makes sense. Footnote number eight, the development team made a point of including characteristics like freckles, spots, and moles for the character models. Yeah, the textures on those character models for Silent Hill 3 are still some of the most detailed textures in a PS2 game. Like, Metal Gear Solid 3 has some, like, kind of comparable stuff, but there are so few games on the PS2 library that come anywhere close to the level of detail in character model textures, especially in Silent Hill 3. Like, the detail for that time period is insane. But note number nine, certain characteristics that members of the development team possess were also included to make the characters more realistic, such as asymmetry between the left and right side of the face, Vincent's tendency to squint, and Douglas's hair thinning at the back of his head. Yeah. Even some of the stuff they don't mention there, like Vincent's fucking yellowed teeth. Like, there's so much detail in all the characters. There's You get aspects of their personality just through the details of their character design. It's so well done. Owaku mentions that he feels the uh, that the insertion of pre-rendered movies disrupts the flow of a game. Part of the reason for animating facial motion so meticulously was so that pre-rendered scenes would not be necessary. Uh, and that's true. Silent Hill 3 has, like, two pre-rendered cutscenes, and that's it. It's, like, the intro movie and the uh, the UFO ending, and that's it. Everything else is in-engine. Everything else is, is done in the actual uh, engine character models and everything, so... Silent Hill 3 is even more impressive when you look at everything that it's doing visually, and it's not pre-rendered. Like, this is so forward-thinking. For 2003, dude. Where they're, they're worried about disrupting the flow of a game at a time where, like, load screens in between every single room was still commonplace. This is one of the, the things that I think is also missing in a lot of modern game design. And when it comes to a lot of modern Silent Hill, you know, games, a lot of the ones post Team Silent, it never felt like they were trying to do anything to, like, push the boundaries. Silent Hill 1, 2, 3, and 4 all tried to do things sort of at the very apex of what the hardware allowed. They, they pushed the visuals as far as they could go. They tried to push the engine as far as it can go to allow for as much immersion as possible, as few load times, uh, explorable towns without breaking it up with a bunch of load screens, using the fog and darkness to mask rendering distance so that they could have those open feeling areas. They were going out of their way to like make advancements on the hardware that they were they were given now for everything that came after it it felt like they were trying to stick to a mold rather than than expand outside of it it felt like they had all the pieces in place for what a silent hill game is supposed to be and never tried to work outside of those boundaries both from a technical standpoint and a creative standpoint but the fact that this was, like, part of Owaku's mindset, even back then, like, don't do pre-rendered cutscenes because it disrupts the flow of the game, even if that's the standard at the time. Yuri says that since certain things, such as the movement of fingers and eyes, can't be motion-captured, 
um, video recordings of the voice actors were referenced while programming the facial animations for the characters they voiced. So again, the mocap technology for that time was not that good. You could record a body, you could record limbs moving, arms moving, legs moving, head moving and turning, um, but you weren't recording the way you are now where you've got fully accurate facial, you know, uh, renders being made off of an actor's face. You know, they weren't, they were, you couldn't even get the fingers separated from the rest of the hand. So all of that still had to be animated, you know, by hand. Somebody had to go through and, uh, Takeyoshi Sato did it for one. Um, I think Sato and I forget who else, Shingo Yuri, might have been just Sato and Yuri doing this for two and, and three. Um, but yeah, going through and making this. Music? There it goes. Um, making these adjustments to the overall mocap stuff to give it more life really, again, shows how talented they were for doing all of those facial animations in Silent Hill 3. God, the faces and the animations and stuff for 3 look so good. Like, you would think that that was mocapped with modern technology, where they had dots on an actor's face and tracked their facial expressions. But instead, they just recorded video while they did the mocap and used that as reference. Did it by hand. Owaku says that the nature of horror in Silent Hill 3 is a bit different from 2. In Silent Hill 2, this aspect of the game sinks in quietly, bit by bit, while in 3, it's more vivid and intense. For example, the gap between the right side world and the reverse side world is more distinct. 3 is definitely much more kind of aggressive, visceral horror compared to 2. 2 is very much the slow, gradual build of dread. He also mentions that when he first saw the scene in which the office building undergoes the shift to the other world, this was a point at which he felt this game would be able to surpass Silent Hill 2 in some respects. And I agree. I think there are a lot of things that Silent Hill 3 does better than Silent Hill 2. I think at the end of the day, Silent Hill 2 is the better standalone game um, because it's a, a nice self-contained package. You don't have to play any other Silent Hill game to understand and appreciate Silent Hill 2. Silent Hill 3 is better in a lot of technical aspects, but I feel the story is a little bit lacking if you don't have the context of Silent Hill 1 to go along with it. And that sort of hurts it a little, a little bit, just as a, a game on its own. But in a lot of ways, I agree with this. It does, it does do things better than Silent Hill 2. Norihito Hatakeda feels it's ideal for events to take place in real time. The shift to the other world that takes place in the office building, as well as the shift during the transition from the subway to the sewers, are both examples of this. Yeah, a lot of good examples where you're just descending stairs or, you know, seeing kind of the transition into the other world happen around you. Something that, uh, while we were listening to the writers for Homecoming on a podcast the other day, uh, mentioned, you know, wanting to do this even in Homecoming and still struggling to do it even on, you know, later hardware. Even though Silent Hill 3 already achieved it five years earlier. Akira Yamaoka mentions that he'd had an interest in including songs with vocal tracks for a while, but there was a question of finding a vocalist with a quality in his or her voice that would be suited to the atmosphere of Silent Hill. Most game music makes use of sounds that are synthesized instead of using real instruments, and Yamaoka feels that it's desirable to utilize the expressive power of the human voice. So we have more context on this now, thanks to that recent interview with Akira Yamaoka and Kevin Key. Um, 
We'll do that next stream. Next stream, we're going to watch that that interview and uh, talk about a lot of that because that's pretty interesting. According to Owaku, the combat in Silent Hill 2 had not been particularly well received. The team was careful to include more enemies in the third game so that players could enjoy devising strategies to fight them. I also feel like the combat for Silent Hill 3 is so much better, so much more well refined, having a lot better control over the animations for each of the weapons, the variety of the weapons, and um, the way certain enemies kind of respond to things. Breeze combat is, is really nice. I enjoy it a lot. It still kind of has that trademark Silent Hill clunkiness to it, but it feels very satisfying to, like, perfectly block an attack and counter hit with a, with a particular weapon and make use of things like that. According to Owaku, uh, oh, that was it. We just read that. Yuki Mizuochi uh, says that he had decided from the start to include more enemies and weapons. He was also able to program more specialized vibrations for the dual shock to correspond to each weapon. One of those things that I don't even take into consideration very often because I play the PC ports of these games and I'll play through emulators and things uh, where I typically disable vibration. I don't like vibration in the controller for most of my games, but it does add a little bit of immersiveness to, you know, playing the game for some people and having accurate, you know, rumbles corresponding with your weapons and animations and stuff makes a difference or if you if you like that kind of thing i don't like it when i'm holding a controller i like feeling like i'm in control of the controller and when it starts vibrating around in my hands i feel like it causes me to position my hands differently move my fingers differently i don't like that maybe that's the the years of speed running wanting to have very specific control over the game that i'm playing coming through but uh yeah, I don't like vibration, personally, when I'm playing games in my controllers. Asked whether he feels that he has a complete grasp of what happens in the Silent Hill games, Yamaoka says he wonders if anyone besides Owaku understands it all completely. This is what I was commenting on earlier. And also expresses his shock at having recently heard that some of it is based in Freud's psychoanalytic theories. Waku is very well versed in human psychology and likes to make use of a lot of that uh, when it comes to his scenario writing and character uh, writing. Obviously, it makes a difference. Atakeda thinks that understanding it all might be possible. Owaku says that there are things about Ito's designs that he doesn't understand himself, and that he actually didn't understand Valtiel's significance completely until data was being gathered for this book. Ito says jokingly that he'll be sure to explain it to other people from now on. <laughs> and then he made a Twitter account and kept his word, and he is continuing to explain it to everybody to this day. Shingo Yuri jokes that when the book is released, he and other members of the team will be reading it and saying, Ah, I see. Ah, so call. Naruhodo. Hatakeda mentions that he created a certain effect with the images of Alessa's burns, fire and blood in mind, and asks the other members of the development team what sort of understanding they have of it. Owaku says that he has the same understanding of it as Hatakeda. But note number 19, Hatakeda did all the effects that have to do with the real-time shifts to the other world and the moving walls. This effect represents the intense suffering that Alessa endured as a result of her burns. Yamaoka is asked whether or not there will be, a sub, uh, there will be subsequent games in the series, to which he replies that he simply doesn't know at this point. This, again, this book came out along with Silent Hill 3, so that was where they were at that point. So 4 would have been in development 
very early on, I imagine, at this point. Since it was started uh, during the development of 3. Yoshioku, thank you so much for the raid. Welcome, everybody. We're reading Lost Memories, the Silent Hill Chronicle, a very often cited source. Silent Hill information, an officially Konami published lore guide for Silent Hill 1 through 3. So we're going through it, reading it and talking about it. Uh, to the question, what would you like to do next? Chingo Yuri replies that he would like to work on something that isn't a horror game. Atakeda says that he would like to do something along the lines of Half-Life 2 and suggests that it might be possible to do a game of this type of, of this type in the world of Silent Hill in which a different other world appears before each player. Ooh. Mizouchi says that he would like to do something more colorful along the lines of a game about an American comic book hero since he feels that the fact the protagonists in Silent Hill series are merely ordinary people is a bit restricting. Ito says that he'd like to do a game with a science fiction theme. Uh, Owaku says that he's always wanted to work on the kind of game that could affect or change someone's life. He feels that there are novels and movies that have had an impact on his own life, but hasn't yet had that sort of experience with a game. Well, good news, Hiroyuki Owaku. You made a game that has deeply and drastically changed many people's lives, including my own. Do you think we'll ever get back to the peak Silent Hill days? I think that the original Silent Hill games are, are a perfect storm, lightning in a bottle. A combination of the people and the time period um, and the hardware available to them and the general cultural feeling of things at that time that cannot be recaptured or recreated. Um, that is not to say that I don't think we'll ever get good Silent Hill games again, but I don't think they'll be the same, um, as those. I don't think we'll ever have anything that compares to those, uh, Team Silent games. Uh, the interviewer suggests that there are probably people for whom Silent Hill has had an impact comparable to the impact that books and movies can have. He then asks each member of the development team to say something to players in closing. Owaku says he worked on Silent Hill 3 with the intention of giving players something that would be fun and interesting, as well as frightening. So he'll be happy if he was able to achieve this. You achieved it, Owaku. Great fucking job. I've put tens of thousands of hours into Silent Hill 3 since 2003, and I still continue to play it. It is one of my absolute favorite games of all time. Ito says that he'd like aspiring game designers and art directors to someday name Silent Hill 3 as having had an influence on them. Um, they did. They have. And some of them even made some really good games. And some of them made Silent Hill Ascension. Mizuochi suggests going for 100 stars and getting a perfect score. Mizuochi, you fucking troll, asshole, liar, motherfucker. There is not 100 stars. There are 10. That's the highest possible score you can get. <laughs> don't troll your your players like this instead of simply playing straight through the game Hantakeda recommends slowing down once in a while to look around as there are discoveries to be made yeah speedrunners who's the world record holder right now uh Matt Matt Gale probably I don't know I'm not gonna <laughs> Slow down and look around. Why don't you?
Um, Yuri says not to be distracted by the cutscenes or subtitles and to look closely at the characters. Waku says, huh? The scenario? Not, don't be distracted by the cutscenes or subtitles. Look closely at the characters. <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> and then Owaku. Huh? The scenario. <laughs> you basically have the character designer, Chingo Yuri, saying, hey, pay attention to the character models and ignore the story. And then the story writer saying, wait. <laughs> so good what if it's 10 sets of 10 stars which would be 100 stars I guess there are 10 levels of extreme difficulty that you can get 10 stars in all of them but you can also get 10 stars in hard mode which would make it 110 stars which is still wrong you can't get 10 star on normal or low Saw you retweet out things from one of the guys who worked on some of the technical aspects of Silent Hill 3. Um, uh, from one of the women, yes. Um, Hiro Usuda. Hiroko Usuda. Been, uh, been following her much closely now that I recently found out she streams on Twitch and she's very active on Twitter. So that's been really cool. Uh, following her lately definitely been retweeting a lot of her neat information and stuff lately same for uh usagi tanaka to anyone who is introduced to silent hill by the third game yamaoka recommends playing the first two games in the series after finishing silent hill 3 i also recommend that for anybody who's gotten into the silent hill series at all regardless of what your first experience was getting into the series Take Yamaoka's advice. Go go play the first games. They're worth it. Don't wait for the remake. The remake's gonna be different. Play the originals. Silent Hill. Yug. Yugwe. Suggestion of cards. So now we're getting into a bunch of extra stuff. Excuse me. But before we get into that, my throat is absolutely decimated from reading all of this so far, and I still want to read through all of this. I'm going to take a short break before we get into uh, the cards, the tarot cards as well as uh, the inspirational works that influenced Team Silent. Didn't even know someone like that was on Twitter, an original Team Silent member, instant follow. Um, yeah, so here, I'm about to go on break anyway. Let's put this here, put this up. And um, so Hiro Usuda, is on Twitter, definitely follow, and she's on Twitch. So, shout outs to Hiro Usuda. There's her uh, Twitch channel as well. She's pretty active, uh, does a lot of her painting and art commissions. Um, but yeah, Hiro Usuda is, is on Twitter and on Twitch and very active. So much like Ito, uh, a good uh, original Team Silent member who's around and, and answers questions and gives information from time to time, shares information and stories on Twitter. Um, and uh, Usagi Tanaka is also on, uh, on Twitter, uh, who did the character design and uh, some creature design. Uh, she's the one who designed Robbie the Rabbit. So, some interesting people to follow for uh, 
for Silent Hill information, as far as the original devs go. But, okay, I'm going to go uh, stretch my legs, grab a drink, give my throat a bit of a rest, and then we will continue reading Lost Memories Silent Hill Chronicle, official Konami Silent Hill lore guide for Silent Hill 1 through 3. Back in a bit. Well, let's get back into it. This is the Silent Hill Lost Memories official lore guide for Silent Hill 1 through 3, published by Konami back in 2003. This was released in Japan only as part of a strategy guide for Silent Hill 3. It was uh, translated and made into this nice website format. by fans and you can find through silenthillmemories.net which is a great resource for Silent Hill information in general I highly recommend hosted there and there is also a downloadable version if you want to have it offline uh, along with original scans from that uh, from the the physical book excellent source of info silenthillmemories.net and that's what we're reading through we just finished reading all of the lost memories chapter uh, kind of an overview introduction of the town and the history um, as well as the chapters covering Silent Hill 1, 2, and 3. So we're now into all of the extras. Tarot cards appear in Silent Hill 3 as key items that open the final door. The truth is that these cards hint at characters that appear in the game. Although their origin is shrouded in mystery, tarot cards have been given profound significance since ancient times and have come to be used for fortune telling. In order to decipher the Silent Hill series, this section will introduce keywords and liken them to corresponding cards from the tarot. Part Zero, The Fool, Heather. A summary of the reincarnations of Heather, who has the memories of three people. Heather, who obtained an immortal body as a result of being impregnated with God, possesses the memories of three people. Alessa, who received severe burns due to Dahlia's ritual. Cheryl, who was separated from Alessa as a result of the ritual and raised by Harry. And Heather, real name Cheryl, who was born as a result of Alessa uh, of Alessa's and Cheryl's return to a single body. The dialogue and events that take place in the game should become easier to understand if a summary of each of these facts is arranged. At the final stage of the game, the memories that Heather recovers are reflected in the other world. One of the few areas in Silent Hill 3 where it is a recreation of a, an iconic Silent Hill 1 room, Alessa's sick room, uh, in the basement of Alcamilla Hospital. That room and the lighting for that recreation of that room was done by Hiro Usuda. So again, those uh, really cool recreations in Silent Hill 3 where I'm like, oh, these areas that look like Silent Hill 1 areas, I wish there was more of that. Well, the ones that are there, the little bits of Midwitch, the little bits of Alcamilla like this, those were done by Hiro Usuda. So if you didn't have enough reason to uh, follow her Twitter and Twitch before, he's done so much for these games, so much iconic work. An overview of Alessa's reincarnations. Alessa is born, seven years, Dahlia's ritual, Cheryl is born, seven years. Heather is born, Silent Hill 1. 17 years pass, Silent Hill 3. So this gives you the 
age disparity from Alessa's birth to the events of Silent Hill 3 is 31 years. From Cheryl's birth to the events of Silent Hill 3 is 24 years. And then from the end of Silent Hill 1 to Silent Hill 3 is 17 years. A murder case that Harry was involved in 12 years ago. After the first game, Harry lived an ordinary life in Portland with his daughter. 12 years ago, however, the religious organization, which had regained influence, uh, formulated a plan to abduct the young girl who had been reincarnated. This ended in Harry killing a cult member. Thereafter, in order to hide from the cult, Cheryl was called by the assumed name Heather, and her black hair was dyed blonde. The murder case of 12 years ago is mentioned in Douglas's notebook, but it doesn't relate all the particulars of the case. So yeah, you do read about this in Silent Hill 3 if you read the optional Douglas's notebook that you find in the Lakeside Amusement Park. Uh, it's on a chair in the fortune teller's hut. But um, that gives you this backstory of Harry and Cheryl living in Portland. Someone from the cult found them. Harry shot them and killed them. And that's why Cheryl goes by Heather and dyes her hair. <clears throat> Still doesn't specify if they moved out of Portland or not. Heather is awakened by the religious organization uh, equals Alessa's abilities. Heather, the protagonist of Silent Hill 3, is the reincarnation of the two young girls who appeared in Silent Hill, Alessa and Cheryl. This girl, who carries God inside her body as a result of the ritual that Dahlia once conducted, assumed an alias and dyed her hair to conceal her whereabouts. However, 17 years later, because her body had matured enough for her to take on the role of the mother, her existence was perceived by the religious organization. One can think that Vincent's line, the time has come, also signifies the fact that Heather's body has matured as the mother of God. Gross. Don't think about Heather's body maturing, Vincent. Additionally, Heather's abilities as the Mother of God are awakened as she regains her past memories in the game, and a premonition of this is already apparent even in the bad dream that immediately follows the opening. What becomes the scene of the beginning of her nightmare is the amusement park that also appears in the latter, in the latter half of the game. One can think that Heather is endowed with precognitive abilities and that this dream was a warning that she sent to herself. So more than just being a, a dream that coincidentally happened to happen in real life, um, she's psychic. She's a reincarnation of, of Alessa, who had psychic abilities. So she knew. Subconsciously, she knew. I know they just used Heather's actress's last name on the back of the game to hide the fact it's a sequel. Uh, but I like to think that Harry changed their last name from Mason to Morris to escape the cult. If it was mentioned anywhere else and it wasn't confirmed to just literally be a mistake, I would consider that. That's also only on, I think it's the PAL version of Silent Hill 3. It's only on certain regions, like certain releases have uh, call her Heather Morris. And other regions, it just says Heather. It doesn't give a last name at all. Um, creator's Commentary. The Fool card in the game suggests Heather. Sorry, Heather, you're the Fool. This card means departure, potentially uh, potentiality, and recklessness. I think that her recklessness in fighting against Claudia, and in a certain sense, her genu her genuineness, are applicable to the fool. Quote from Hiroyuki Owaku. <clears throat> on your PAL version, it says Heather. It just says Heather on the back. 
It doesn't say Heather Morris. I know some specific region uh, has, it says Heather Morris. It's not on all, all Silent Hill 3 cases. I just don't remember which one specifically it is. Uh, at the beginning of the game, the scene at the amusement park is a premoni- uh, is a premonitory dream. It's a premonition. It warns, it warns of the danger that is imminent in Heather's future. Heather's age varies depending on the interpretation. Telephone twenty four and thirty one. Yeah, it's like some kind of deadly premonition. The voice on the phone from the hospital locker uh, blesses Heather for being 24 and 31 years old. If one adds her seven years as Cheryl to Heather's true age of 17, her age becomes 24, and if one adds her seven years as Alessa, her age becomes 31. Birthday card. You find uh, a birthday card in Brookhaven. 14 plus 7 plus 17 equals 38. 14, the first number, is the period before Alessa returned to a single existence in the first game. A weird specific way to say that is just Alessa's age. <laughs> uh, 7 is the period before Cheryl returned to a single existence, and 17 indicates the length of time Heather was alive after the two girls returned to a single existence. Yep, all explained. They really wanted to make sure everyone understood the numbers. Douglas's note, 17, 24. The results of the investigation conducted by Douglas, the private detective, identified Heather's registered age as 24. One can infer that Harry raised Heather as the child he found seven years before the first game. In other words, that he raised her as Cheryl. The true nature of the voice's owner is shrouded in mystery. This is not answered. This is left intentionally ambiguous. It's specifically, the voice says it's not Leonard and it's not Stanley. Um, Leonard and Stanley don't seem to be the type to put on false voices or have multiple personalities. So, it is uh, sort of a mystery who this is supposed to be. The ha they're just the happy birthday caller. Puzzling numerical formula is written on the birthday card in the hospital. Yep, it's not that puzzling. It's just the ages of <laughs> Alessa, Cheryl, and Cheryl, too. And it's unsettling even to Douglas's observant eyes. According to the report, 24 years old. Client says looks 17. Plausible? So, yeah. Even even Douglas, as a detective, is like, eh, it's supposed to be 24, but looks 17. So even Douglas was confused by all of the ages. But it's okay. It's easy to understand once you know that she's an immortal who just constantly reincarnates. That's all. Next tarot card, The Magician. Valtiel, Vitali, Versace. A mysterious creature that is always lurking near Heather. What is his true purpose? Valtiel shadows Heather as if stalking her ever since her encounter with him in the shopping mall. While the strange creature observes Heather, he makes no effort to inflict harm upon her. The truth is that he has a unique purpose, a role he plays which enters into the game. The fact of the matter is that in the religious tradition of Silent Hill, Valtiel is a saintly being corresponding to an angel. Concerning that complex and profound reason for existence, let us consider such things as his design and behavior from various angles. So I was talking about that earlier. Um, with Vincent's comment, they look like monsters to you. Yeah. In the cult's beliefs, he's he's an angel, basically. All of the creatures are divine beings to people who believe in the cult's religion. Nub, I've got to ask, how come the PS2 Special Edition version doesn't have Maria's sub-scenario? 
but yet the platinum version has. So, with the PS2 release of of Silent Hill 2, it, they didn't have Born from a Wish done yet, but it was something they were working on and wanted to include. Um, so the, the original release of Silent Hill 2 did not have Born from a Wish, and it did not have the UFO ending. Uh, both of those were added on subsequent re-releases. So every other version of Silent Hill 2 that came out after that very first PS2 release, the Greatest Hits release, the Director's Cut, the PC port, HD collection, you know, Xbox version, depending on what region you live in, it's called different things, but it's all the same game. Uh, and it all includes that sub-scenario and uh, UFO ending. So when they did the special edition, uh, when you say special edition version, what do you mean the, the PAL collection? Um, because that just used all of the original releases for 2, 3, and 4, which means it's the original release of 2. It didn't have that. That's how that works. Um, so yeah, Baltiel, we're considering his design and behavior from various angles. Whenever there is a shift to the other world, Valtiel appears before Heather. Uh, it can be said that this being is a guide to the other world. So he could be acting, we were kind of speculating, discussing that a little bit earlier, but could also just be acting as a guide to the other world. First encounter in the shopping mall's uh, elevator. This is after Heather was found for the first time. Really brief time that you see Valtiel there too um, when she's getting on the elevator, but he's there. Watcher. To ensure the protection of the unborn deity, he watches Heather, mother of God. Since the name Valtiel means attendant, by way of the English word valet, his existence as an angel is derived from suffixing L in uh, E-L. So that's supposed to imply that he's an angel. He's a valet angel. In short, he is the being that attends to and watches over God for the purpose of carrying out his duty of watching and protecting the mother until the time comes for God to be born. He does not harm Heather. Altiel persists in watching Heather in the church near the end of the game. Messenger, an angel in the town's religious organization that governs the cycle of rebirth, he appears as a symbol of the other world. Valtiel's intentions have little to do with Heather. His concern is primarily with the god that sleeps inside her. It can be thought that in order to restore God to this world, every time Heather, Alessa, dies, he is the one responsible for resurrecting her many times over. Additionally, the valve handle that Valtiel turns with his left hand represents the idea that God can be reborn any number of times, which can be thought of as having significance to the basis of the sect's doctrine. So there's your explanation for the, the valve that we were talking about earlier. Somebody was also suggesting the symbolism of that being the cyclical nature and reincarnation. There it is, explained pretty much just like that. If Heather should die, Valtiel takes action to resurrect the Mother of God. And again, we get one of those optional scenes where occasionally, depending on the room and circumstance where you die in Silent Hill 3, you'll get a uh, short cutscene of Valtiel showing up and dragging Heather's body away. Audia assumes the role as mother and takes the necessary steps to birth God. She eats that fetus. In many places, Valtiel is seen turning the handle, which signifies the cycle of rebirth. Especially here, where you've also got the legs of Alessa and Cheryl dangling above him. Deciphering the meaning hidden in the design uh, of the being that ties together the three works of the series. In the long-standing religious tradition of Silent Hill, 
Baltiel is worshipped as a being that is close to God, and so even in the previous works of the series, Baltiel has appeared in different forms. In other words, this is why Baltiel ties together various events that have taken place in Silent Hill. In the case that any events transpire in Silent Hill in the future, Baltiel may again appear before players in another form. He certainly shows up in future games. At the very least, he shows up in Book of Memories. Noting the significance of Valtiel's design, the relevance between the three works becomes clear. From Silent Hill, Ceremonial Robes. There's the caged ceremonial robed figures that you can find in various parts of Silent Hill 1. In the school's other world, a number of body-shaped figures can be seen. If one looks closely, it becomes clear that there is something familiar about what the figure is wearing. What looks like a body bag is actually the ceremonial robe of the town's religion. This robe is modeled after the appearance of an angel from Silent Hill's traditions, namely Valtiel. The rags the figures appear to be wrapped in are actually ceremonial robes. Pyramid Head from Silent Hill 2 One notable connection between Pyramid Head and Valtiel is the fact they both stalk the protagonist persistently. If the helmet that conceals Pyramid Head's face were to be removed, it would become apparent that the designs of the two are surprisingly similar. When the executioner's outfit that is Pyramid Head was designed, it was modeled after Valtiel, an angel from the indigenous religion. Pyramid Head's gloves are very similar to Valtiel's. Certainly are. The back of the garment Pyramid Head wears, there is a mark where the cloth is stitched together, which is also a shared characteristic. Remember, chat, they ain't fucking. That's right. This is not fucking. He ain't fucking. Creator's Commentary in Silent Hill 3, the connection to the first game is quite clear, but the point of contact with the second game isn't so obvious. I created Valtiel because I wanted to relate the works of the series through a creature. In the religion of Silent Hill, Valtiel exists as one who is close to God, and Pyramid Head takes the shape of Valtiel's reason for existence. That is to say, the Pyramid Head character was born from the townspeople's idolatrous ideologies, say that three times fast. In the first game, the ceremonial robes were an homage to Valtiel. Quote Masahiro Ito. Also, he ain't fucking. Quote Masahiro Ito. Making of Valtiel. One of the early designs of Valtiel turning the valve handle. The central hole closely resembles the one in the final church. A rough sketch of a design in which multiple creatures seem to be intertwined. The hole at the top of the creature's head is the same as in the final design. There's also a scene in the elevator with a giant propeller and Valtiel. The propeller has a handle as well, which has the same implication as the valve. Gotta love those Ito original sketches. I love his sketchy, like, style. I love all his concept art. I mean, I love his final pieces and stuff too, but there's something very striking about his his black and whites, his his sketches and stuff. Next tarot card. Card number two, the High Priestess, aka Claudia Wolf. Trying to give my throat a little bit of a break. A faith which is too pure invites a new tragedy. Claudia, a priestess in the religious organization, appears in the game as Heather's adversary. As the game progresses, it becomes known that she was once friends with Alessa when the two of them were young. Even though she kills Harry, Heather's father, as well as Vincent, who is supposedly of the same faith in upholding her cause of the revival of God and the establishment of paradise. No, Vincent disagrees with those parts. He makes that pretty clear at the end. 
Uh, her actions are rooted in genuine piety in that she desires the salvation of people's souls. Hers is a sorrowful existence, which cannot be simply tucked away into the category of villain. And I agree with that. I, I don't think they did as good of a job making you sympathize with Claudia as they did when Silent Hill 4 came out. Uh, making you sympathize with Walter where you're kind of given some perspective and some understanding as to why they're doing the things that they're doing from their standpoint they're not villains like they're they're trying to accomplish what they think is a noble goal um, even if in Walter's case it's more selfish it's just his mother but yeah, it's hard to sympathize with her when she kills Harry. Exactly. Creator's Commentary. The High Priestess card in the game suggests Claudia. This card means mystery, faith, and dogmatism. Doesn't it seem that the self-righteous way that Claudia behaves as a consequence of being too genuine is in accordance with the meaning of the card? Quote Hiroyuki Owaku. She's willing to take any steps necessary to attain her goal of creating paradise. An unhappy connection with Leonard, her father, which is the cause of her self-righteous personality. The one who guided Claudia to the town's indigenous religion was her father, Leonard. It seems that Leonard, who held strict religious views, forced his beliefs onto his daughter and inflicted physical punishment upon her for irreligious behavior. From an episode in which he stabbed a patient because of a religious dispute and from the radical memo in which he calls himself a protector of the seal, it can be surmised that Leonard possesses extremely elitist ideas. Claudia has come to hope for a salvation in which not only the Chosen Ones, but everyone is saved, which is completely opposite from Leonard's ideas. One can think that in the background, there were feelings of repulsion and hatred towards her strict father. Leonard is a very complicated and interesting character when you factor in all of that, along with Claudia's backstory. Yeah, the fact that they were, you know, opposed in their personal beliefs, uh, interpretations of the cult's beliefs, that Leonard thought paradise was only for the most faithful of the cult members, whereas Claudia, she wanted to kill everybody. He wants to birth a god that ends human existence. But she wants to do it so that everybody can enjoy paradise, even the people who don't believe. You're still talking about extinction. But I get it. It's noble. She, she wants suffering to stop. And Leonard is like, no. Only the chosen people get paradise. Everyone else? Too bad. Leonard's strict attitude towards Claudia on the phone indicates the extremist nature of his piety. Vincent seems to have witnessed the physical punishment inflicted upon Claudia by her father. Could Leonard's violence have been well known even inside the religious organization? Clearly. Well, people feared Leonard... He, he got his respect through the cult through fear. And that was very apparent through the abuse that uh, Claudia would have sustained by his hand. And Vincent, the way Vincent describes it, this scene, it's all the way he hit you, kicked you, and made you cry. He doesn't just say that. Vincent says that it's forever burned into his mind. It's like... It's, it's such a specific and intense violence that he cannot forget it. 
unique abilities as a sorceress that sleep inside Claudia. In the early stages of the game, the other world appears even though Heather has not yet awakened as Alessa. This is undoubtedly due to Claudia's power. Let's inspect a few instances that indicate her abilities. Claudia issued the instruction to kill Harry. It seems that she can manipulate the hearts and minds of believers. Again, that's sort of reinforcing the idea that the missionary uh, is a sort of warped, distorted version of a, of a cultist, of a believer. The shopping mall being swallowed by the other world was due to Claudia's influence as well. So, one can imagine that the god growing inside of Heather is also having an impact on that, since we th see things related to the god, related to Heather, not just Claudia, during those other world instances as well. But Claudia could possibly be the one who's, like, instigating it. You know, she's the one causing the god to react to her presence, her power. Who recorded the audio cassette tape, or is it manifested by the town? Like the videotapes in Silent Hill 1 and 2. The tape of Vincent speaking with a, an unnamed member of the cult? I don't know. Um, you're supposed to assume that that room where you find it is a room that belongs to that unnamed cultist. She may have recorded it to try to, I don't know, cover her ass if, if Vincent said anything. Um, it could just be manifested like the videotapes in Silent Hill 1 and 2, um, where it's just the town kind of giving you the option to hear and experience a little conversation, a piece of history, something that happened there. But rather than present it as like a hallucination or something like that, it's through a tape, you know, some, some physical form. Could be. Could be. It seems that her abilities were feared along with her profound devotion. Yeah, that's the uh, unnamed cult member referring to Sister Claudia. The truth is Sister Claudia frightens me a little. Witch from 17 years ago, Dahlia Gillespie. In the first game, Dahlia Gillespie was a priestess like Claudia who attempted to revive God. Faith in God is a tradition that has been handed down over the years in Silent Hill and separated by a period of 17 years. Each of these two women who belonged to the same religious organization took steps to bring about God's revival. However, to Dahlia, God is an object to be exploited, while to Claudia, God is a being that will bring salvation. That's a very good point. Just the the intentions, the difference in intentions behind Dahlia and Claudia's actions, the way they view God very differently. Although they use a common means of reviving God, their intentions are fundamentally different. In order to arrange the differences between the two of them, let's look back at the first game, the case of Dahlia from Silent Hill 1. Dahlia's intention is to destroy and negate existing concepts by reviving God. However, she has no concept of salvation through the establishment of paradise. The revival of God is strictly a means to destroy the present world and for her to personally command power. For this reason, she finally comes to make her own daughter a sacrifice. It is evident that her thought patterns exploit people she can take advantage of, such as Kaufman and Harry, to the fullest extent possible. So yeah, she's being very directly manipulative. She wants to control God. She wants her daughter to be the mother of God so that she can have that, that command over the power. Or at least in her mind, that's how she thinks it'll go. In reality, God zaps the shit out of her at the end of Silent Hill 1 and just fucking kills her and does not give any fucks about her being the mother of mother of God. 
the case of Claudia from Silent Hill 3. As with Silent Hill's long-standing tradition, Claudia's intention is to remake the present world into paradise by reviving God. Because of her experiences during her childhood, she perceives the world as being full of suffering and in order to save everyone, she attempts to create paradise. And so one can think that for everyone to be saved, some sacrifices like Harry and Vincent are unavoidable. Yep. They go into that detail. Uh, you find Claudia's old room, all the books that she's read about child slaves and all of these horrible things in the world. And she just views the world as like, uh, every, everyone is suffering. Everyone is suffering, and the only way to stop it, the only way to save everyone, is to kill everyone. <laughs> All of them go to the cult's idea of paradise. Although they are both priestesses who aim to revive God, their motives are fundamentally different. Through the entire game, Dahlia never speaks the word salvation. That's very true. Her genuine faith is the cause of her actions, and she has no intention to try to exploit God. That is the thing, Claudia, she's got a very twisted view of things, but yeah, she's genuine in her personal and faith, you know, beliefs. Uh, hey, Mateko Wolf. Silent Hill in-depth playthroughs are amazing. Since you made so many in-depth playthroughs already, I imagine you're not as motivated to repeat them anytime soon. Um, I mean, I'll still be doing them. Uh, I'll, I'll always still do story playthroughs and uh, in-depth playthroughs for the series. Uh, I definitely don't do them as frequently as I used to, because I have done them so many times over the years. But, um, yeah, I mean, uh, it's something that will always be a part of my channel, even if it's in a smaller uh, smaller capacity, less often. Um, but I am interested in still doing stuff like this. There's a lot of things we did uh, uh, listen to and, and review and, and kind of react to uh, a podcast interview with Silent Hill Homecoming's writers a couple of nights ago, and then tonight we're reading through this, The Book of Lost Memories, um, an official Konami lore guide for Silent Hill 1 through 3, so I, I kind of, now that I've gone through the games and done those types of playthroughs and, and in-depth things so many times, I figured this type of content will also be really interesting to a lot of people who want to know more, delve a little bit deeper, um, more than just playing the games, looking, having a closer look at all of the information and supplementary material where I get my information from. The, the conclusions and the things that I come to and that I talk about during all of those story playthroughs over the years, that comes from information sources like this. So, this is kind of something I haven't really done over the years. It's, it's still in the same vein of the informative story playthroughs, but instead kind of breaking down the sources of my information directly. So hopefully you still find this entertaining. Hopefully you guys are still uh, interested while we've been doing this read-through and similar content like this, because I plan on doing more of this, more reading through guides, reading interviews, watching and reacting to interviews, and sort of talking and discussing information sources rather than necessarily playing through the games and repeating the same stuff that we know by now. Um, tarot card three, the Empress. Alessa, the suffering of a young girl who is unable to die as a result of being impregnated with God. Alessa attempts to release Heather from the suffering that God would surely cause her. Ever since she was born, the original Alessa had unique abilities. 
The direct cause of her undying state is the seed of God that was implanted within her by means of a ritual that Dahlia conducted in order to bring about God's descent. Heather, who is Alessa's reincarnation, is finally drawn to the town of Silent Hill when her body has matured enough for her to take on the role of the mother. It becomes clear that Claudia and the original Alessa were childhood friends. Yeah, they make that pretty clear. That um, Heather, when she regains her memories as Alessa, tries to sort of exploit that fact. She tries to deceive Claudia in this scene. Um, Heather regains Alessa's memories, but the will that dictates her actions still differs from hers. And it shows the sequence, this this message that Alessa leaves to herself, to her, the version of her that is Heather, that is Cheryl, uh, right after the memory of Alessa. See, this is, this right here is why I've always described during my story playthroughs, my interpretation of Heather getting her memories back really happens at this moment. Like it's been happening little by little over the course of the game up until that moment. Every time she interacts with a save point with a halo of the sun, she kind of remembers a little bit more, a little bit more, but it's just little fragments. It's not until memory of Alessa where she seems to really recall everything about her past lives as Alessa and as Cheryl. So earlier in this exact same book, it talks about those memories coming back the more the god is growing, that it's related to the god becoming more and more grown and ready to be born, that that's causing correlated to the memories coming back. But the way this is written, the way like with this screenshot, this moment in the game and this description, Heather regains Alessa's memories, but the will that dictates her actions still differs from hers. Heather is her own person, even though she can remember her past lives as Alessa, and it seems like this is the moment being described. So that's why I always interpreted it that way. This is this is what I mean. I, the 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 logic behind my story playthrough uh, comes from this sort of stuff. So that's why I wanted to go through a lot of these uh, sources of information and just kind of break them down with everybody directly. You got Duck Station to work on your tablet PC. Testing out Silent Hill 1. Hell yeah, Yoshio. Just remember there there is still issues if you're using visual enhancements. The game will crash on Duck Station when you first meet Dahlia in the Balkan Church, when you use the drawbridge key, and right before the Lisa Nowhere cutscene, where she does the eye twitch. So, if you're testing those areas, make sure to disable any visual enhancement, or the game will freeze. Creator's Commentary Alessa, who lies dormant inside Heather, makes appearances in various places as her memories are revived. The reason why her behavior differs depending on the place is in accordance with what's written in the occult magazine that was dropped in the subway. The principle behind her behavior is that she desires to escape from suffering. It will become easier to understand if I say to die. Hiroyuki Owaku so that's always, again, kind of an interesting aspect. The idea that more than just the same person being reincarnated, it's not just Alessa over and over again. They are distinct. Individual people. Different thoughts, different feelings. But that's cool. A little reference to the magazine in the subway is supposed to kind of refer to these little appearances, little little things kind of nodding towards Alessa still existing, a part of her still existing inside of Heather. 
In order to escape from her suffering, she attempts to return to a single body. From Silent Hill 1. In order to understand Alessa's situation, it is necessary to look back at what happened in Silent Hill 17 years ago. Alessa, who received extensive burns as a result of the ritual that brought about the descent of God, finds her other self in order to escape from her eternal suffering and, because of God's revival, <clears throat> attempts to destroy herself. However, Dahlia uses Harry to prevent her from carrying out her plans. Alessa's power grew to the extent that it exceeded Dahlia's control. For that reason, Dahlia uses Harry. So I've mentioned that during uh, story playthroughs of Silent Hill 1. Dahlia saying, that's why I couldn't catch you all by myself. So Alessa's powers have essentially been increasing and growing. Dahlia couldn't get to her just herself, but by motivating Harry to try to pursue her in a certain way, while also being in possession of the Seal of Metatron. Uh, or excuse me, the Flauros, um, it gave Dahlia that opportunity. The church that materializes as a guide for Heather equals Alessa as a young girl. In the church that is the final stage of the game, a young girl's crying voice and footsteps materialize, as well as a map that is reminiscent of childlike scribbling. Although these phenomena act as a guide for Heather, the simplistically drawn map and forlorn sobbing are not there to lead her. Rather, the explanation comes to light if one imagines that Alessa's thoughts from her childhood linger in the church. It may be that the younger version of Alessa, who is teased and called witch, is wandering aimlessly about the church. While the Alessa that appears at the amusement park is an entirely different person, if it's the younger version of Alessa from before she encountered... Uh, the fire, then there is no need to destroy herself who is suffering from the pain. In this way, one can imagine that Alessa's purpose and the form that she takes differs greatly depending on the place. So that's why you get sort of different inclinations of Alessa at different parts of her life. This, the Alessa that is the memory of Alessa when you're encountering her for that is kind of the older, more tortured aspect of her, whereas the younger crying, the footsteps, the map, alluding to Alessa. Yeah, bef after she had been bullied, she was still not exactly living the happiest of lives, but before being burned, being kept in a horrible nightmare, Footprints walk along the corridor accompanied by the sound of sobbing. They are most likely not showing Heather the way, but simply wandering aimlessly about the church. Although it does reveal that there is a hidden door behind the painting, so it is showing the way. Chapel, a map that is drawn with childlike simplicity. Alessa, whose mother was Dahlia, must have visited this church. I've always been so caught up in the part where we pick up this map, talking about the map itself, because it is an actual child's drawing. A member of Team Silent had uh, uh, took a drawing that their child had done, and they used a professional artist put the the map overlay on it. You know, this part was added in, but the sun, the house, the bunny, like all of this, is an actual child's drawing um, and all of these little details the crease in the paper the smudges and stuff that are part of the texture are just from scanning in that drawing they're all real uh, and it's one of those things that I point out because so many horror games like to kind of do the trope of child drawing and it's always always very easily able you know to be identified as as a professional artist drawing something poorly on purpose to make it look like a child's drawing as opposed to just having an actual drawing that a child drew. Do we know which Team Silent Members kid drew it? No, I'll have to go through my interviews and notes 
and find where that that mention uh, comes from, that, that bit of info comes from. Um, because I think it's it's from a developer interview, but the developers it's multiple developers, and it doesn't say specifically which one of the three like said it. So, and it's not it's not any of their kids if I remember correctly. I I know I don't know exactly who it is. I'll have to do some diving on that that fact. That's the problem. I'm getting too old. All this information is in my head, rattling around, and some of it at this point, I'm I'm not sure what the source, what the original source was. Uh, to end her perpetual suffering, Alessa's obsession materializes. At the merry-go-round in the amusement park, the memory of Alessa, Alessa's obsession, appears. In accordance with her name, she is not Alessa herself, but her profoundly dark emotion that clings to this place. Her intention is to escape from the pain in which she was perpetually made to live by destroying herself, and so for that reason, she acts out of a sense of kindness in that she wants to spare Heather from that same suffering. In the first game, Alessa's aspirations were never realized, and her obsession adhered to this place for a period of 17 years. So that's, a, again, kind of giving the context this memory, this aspect, the left behind dark emotions from Alessa that sort of linger just in the place, in the location. And that she she wanted to spare Heather from the same type of suffering that she went through. That's why she's trying to kill Heather. She wants to just end it there and not let uh, not let Heather continue down the same path that she did. You're not too old. It's a ton of notes and sources to remember, and I'm grateful you share them with all of us. Uh, the The age thing is more so. I'm I'm acutely aware of how much better categorized this information was in my mind um, 10 years ago <laughs> compared to now um, that's uh, that's just part of getting older I'm not that old I'm not I'm not even 40 yet I'm 36 but I'm I'm self-aware enough to recognize aspects of my mind are not as sharp as they once were. Especially when it comes to recalling specific information. I mean, given what I do on a regular basis with Silent Hill, I would say I'm I'm, I'm not in any danger of of having issues recalling things, but anyway uh, the event that occurs in the hospital's storeroom in which Heather's reflection in the mirror freezes in place is an omen embodying Alessa's obsession excellent excellent moment Silent Hill 3 iconic the, the Brookhaven mirror room one of the most memorable, scariest parts of Silent Hill 3 for many, many people. The object of Alessa's obsession was only for herself to cease to exist. It is a sentiment that is rooted in benevolence. The fact that she comes to attack many times over with different weapons indicates the depth of her suffering. Oh, I just thought it was cool giving her a bunch of phases with different weapons. But no. Even that, it's an indication of the depth of her suffering that she pulls a machine gun out of her ass and fucking lights you up. Tarot card number four, the Emperor, visual concept. The mist and darkness that blur the line between dream and reality. Is the Brookhaven mirror room a reused asset from the room you meet 
Lisa in with James. You mean Angela in Silent Hill 2. Uh, no, it is not a reused asset. It is a different mirror with a different uh, texture, different detail, different dimensions, as well as a different way that they're handling the reflection effect. Slightly different so, uh, textures. But uh, nope, it's different. Not a reused asset. Slightly reused effect, uh, but not a reused asset. Mist and darkness have become symbols of the Silent Hill series. It is not the case that these elements are present merely to frighten the player. Mist and darkness obstruct the horizon by creating a condition in which visibility is limited. In other words, the boundary between heaven and earth is obscured, which suggests a blurring of the line between dream and reality. In the first game, the production used hardware limitations to an advantage. Oh yeah, the mist. The idea, the concept for the mist and the darkness hiding draw distance was a result of hardware limitations, but obviously had very specific atmosphere and lore implications as well. The mist is a symbol of Silent Hill. It can also be interpreted as the thoughts of the dead, rising up from the lake and settling over the town. Um, I believe you find a plaque that describes it that way in Silent Hill 2. The darkness that deprives one of the uh, one of one's field of vision evokes an instinctual terror. Yep darkness and not being able to see things around you is is a scary thing it's basic it's simple but effective when done correctly noise and camera work that represent mental distortion and blur while on one hand elements such as mist and darkness are plainly visible when these elements are presented uh, production design is included even in technical effects for example, the noise that produces a sense of reality and atmosphere expresses the grittiness of the psychological aspect involved and heightens the intensity in accordance with the progression of the story. Additionally, if one pays attention to the camera work, one might notice that the way it shifts to the protagonist's point of view at times expresses a sense of confusion and anxiety. They definitely are able to portray a lot just through particular camera angles. Another one of those things that is cause for concern for things like the Silent Hill 2 remake because right down to the camera work is all very intentional to evoke a particular feeling from the player. And if that's not done in the same way or if it's not done to the same effect something as simple as changing a camera angle or a perspective on something can profoundly change the meaning of it the context of it the feeling that the player uh, gets from seeing it experiencing it in the first game from the outset the camera position moves freely and draws in the player noise. The purpose of this effect is to eliminate any CG-ishness, but it also manages to disturb the player's psyche. I really like that they use this particular screenshot, this filter uh, in particular, because in the Silent Hill HD collection, this effect is completely missing. They didn't put that in. This effect that they have a screenshot of talking about how important it is in a Team Silent created Silent Hill 1 through 3 lore guide and this effect was completely left out of the Silent Hill 3 HD collection version. Framing A demo scene from Silent Hill 2 that makes use of a particularly slanted point of view them Dutch angles it indicates the mental state of the characters that appear in the scene. 
I've got to find my mama. Yeah, everything's a little bit off. Everything is skewed. And the, the Dutch angle changes. This whole scene, from a like, cinematography point of view, James and Angela interacting in front of this mirror. Also, here's the mirror for context, mentioning that that was not a, a repeating uh, asset. You can see it. The It's got a different border, a different frame, different... Um, size but yeah all of this stuff very 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 interesting and again how specific something like the camera um, really is to these scenes to the overall feeling that you get Five, the Hierophant. The High Hierophant Green. Key items. We managed to make it five chapters in on tarot cards before I made a JoJo reference. Please applaud my self-restraint. I, I can't make it through the entire thing. I tried. Made it, made it to five. Key items. The many items with magical properties that give depth to the story. The works of the series are tied together through the town called Silent Hill and the long-standing religious tradition native to the region. I'm going to read this again. The works of the series are tied together through the town called Silent Hill and the long-standing religious tradition native to the region, the cult's beliefs. This is no longer the series. This one line, this one concept has been done away with, and I think that's my biggest issue with the Silent Hill series at the moment. Because things are no longer tied or related to the, the town, other than just through bait Silent Hill phenomenon notes, like the bare minimum of connection that you could possibly do. And the long-standing religious tradition and the cult's beliefs are like all but gone in place of strange, I guess like, you know, they try and emulate that in things like Ascension with the fucking foundation or whatever, but that's sad. It's it doesn't feel like this anymore. It doesn't feel like the series is tied together through these common things. The town called Silent Hill and the cult beliefs, like those main aspects, those that kind of defined this the series is basically not necessary anymore under the current views of the the current overall series producer those things are not necessary anymore i disagree anyway little rant over as might be expected from such prevalent themes as the other world resurrection of the dead as well as occult elements and other phenomena hey look they said it Various religious items, such as charms and equipment used in rituals, appear widely in the games. There are items that are referenced from various religions and folklore, and of course, there are original ones as well. These religious items give a unique depth to the story. Let us examine this using a few representatives. If one acquires more information on the subject, one should be able to gain a deeper appreciation for the series. The Halo of the Sun and Talisman the two crests of the series are deceptively similar. On the talisman, the seal that appears in the first game is inscribed. Seal of the Metatron. The Halo of the Sun is the crest of the religious organization. The difference between the two seals has an important significance in the series. Because, yeah, the Halo of the Sun is more specific to past, present, future with the three circles. With... Um, reincarnation 
being an overall theme, the, the cyclical nature of St. Alessa's existence represented through the symbol. And then the seal of Metatron being um, sort of a, a protection, a, a, a ward, a, a rune of protection against darker forces. A glophitis. I thought I got rid of that. A red liquid that appears in the first and third games, made from a medicinal herb, it seems to have the effect of repelling evil spirits, based on real-life occultism stuff. Uh, it would seem that after the first game, Harry once again procured some of the liquid for the sake of his daughter. So this in infers that Harry would... He got some more. He got some more liquid for the sake of his daughter. Like, at some point between the ending of Silent Hill 1 and the beginning of Silent Hill 3... Harry went and found more Aglophitus somewhere. I propose that that's not even necessary. I don't think, theoretically, he wouldn't have needed to go and find more because he already had some. So this guide says that the good ending, not the good plus ending, but the good ending, is the correct ending for Silent Hill 1 that leads into Silent Hill 3. That's what this book says. Um, and I also follow in line with that theory as a fan, for what it's worth. So if you take the good ending from Silent Hill 1, Sybil dies. You kill Sybil. You save Kaufman, but you don't understand what a Glophitus is enough to use it on Sybil. Harry doesn't, anyway. So, theoretically, Harry picks up the Aglophitus in the hospital. He does not use it on Sybil because he doesn't know what it is. Kills Sybil. Saves Kaufman. Gets to the end of the game. Confronts Alessa, Dahlia. Sees Kaufman use Aglophitus to force the demon out of Alessa. And that's where Harry learns what it is, what it does. So he collected it in the hospital. He never used it. He sees Kaufman use it. He knows what it does. He gets the baby. He leaves the town. He still has it in his inventory. He doesn't need to go find more. If the good ending is the correct ending, he already has the Aglophitus that he would give to Heather. He would never need to go find more. It makes sense. Harry receives the Flowros from Dahlia. He sure does. Remember? You remember? There is a Flowros, and he took it. A section of this thick book is quoted in each of these three games. Oh yeah, the Book of Lost Memories. The Flowros, a charm that appears in the first game. It has the ability to break the continuity of the boundary that surrounds Alessa. Supposedly, the Flowros is also capable of doing other things, but this is like the only thing it's used for that we really see in Silent Hill 1. The Book of Lost Memories. That's this book that I'm reading. See? That's the reference, by the way. That's why they call this lore guide Lost Memories. It's named after this item that appears in Silent Hill 2. An original book written about the history of the town. It appears in the second game, Restless Dreams, and the third game. They have to specify Restless Dreams because of uh, Born from a Wish, funny enough. The White Chrism and Obsidian Goblet. Items used in rituals required to see the rebirth ending in the second game. Supposedly, they are used to resurrect the dead. Details concerning the ritual to bring the dead back to life are written in the Book of Crimson Ceremony. So that's again the logical progression of things for the rebirth ending in Silent Hill 2. 
James discovers in order, he finds White Chrism, he finds the Book of Lost Memories, which details the history of the town and the power. He finds the Obsidian Goblet, and then he finds the Crimson Ceremony Book, where it details the ritual and how to use the items that he's already picked up. So he has the items he needs, he has the instructions he needs, and that's what allows him to at least attempt you know, the rebirth ending. Although we never see the attempt, we just know that James thinks he knows enough and has the items to at least try. An examination of the names of key items reveals an influence from various religions. The seal of Metatron, according to the Kabbalah, Jewish mysticism, the angels Metatron and Samael originally shared the same existence. So that's why we get our reference to Metatron and Samael, the Mark of Samael, as Dahlia calls it. Aglophytus, a medicinal herb that appears in the Kabbalah. It's used to expel demons from the possessed and can also be used for a magical array. The Flauros. One of the 72 demons that appears in the Lemageton a book of magic said to have been compiled from the writings of King Solomon of Israel. All these real world various things, occultism and, and religious belief, mysticism that it's all pulled from. The Book of Crimson Ceremony. The roots of the Crimson Ceremony lie in Mayan and Aztec rituals. At one time, the ritual of human sacrifice was quite prevalent. They also used some of those Mayan and Aztec uh, themes when naming some of their deities that are referenced in those books, like uh, Zuchilpaba and Zuchilbara. Card number six. We're here. We still have so much. The Lovers. Love, deciphering the love and hatred behind the terror. Although the Silent Hill series has consistently come to portray terror as a central theme, the fact that behind this, love is invariably depicted is, infrequent, is frequently overlooked. One aspect that has become particularly prevalent is the attachment between parent and child. Up to this point in the series, the love between parent and child has brought about a great deal of drama and has even become a great driving force in the development of the story. In the first and third games, a contrast between each parent and child relationship is portrayed. In Silent Hill 2, the profound suffering of a man who has killed his wife, which becomes the theme of the game, is a consequence of love. It's true, James didn't just, like, kill Mary out of hatred. Love is a very important theme. From Silent Hill 1, a mother who uses her real daughter and a father who loves his adopted daughter. In the first game, two pairs of parents and children appear, Harry and Cheryl, as well as Dahlia and Alessa. One of these is a parent who has a strong love for his daughter, which is in contrast with the other parent who is unloving and uses her daughter for her own personal gain. It is a point of interest that the relationship between Harry and Cheryl is unaffected by their lack of blood relation. In fact, the two of them are tied together by a close bond. From the start, Harry the protagonist primarily acts in accordance with his role as a parent. He does his best. He does some questionable things. But I think Harry's always meant well and done his best. From Silent Hill 3, a daughter who loves her father and a daughter who detests her father, each of them are in pursuit of something. On the other hand, two relationships are contrasted in the third game, that of Harry and Heather with that of Leonard and Claudia. Heather, the daughter who is loved by her father, and Claudia, the unloved daughter, become the principal axis of the story. It is a point worth noting that a complete contrast is formed by their respective actions 
and intentions. Another great aspect of Silent Hill 3, there are so many parallels between Claudia and Heather, uh, or Alessa, and the history, the, the way that they experienced their childhoods sort of formed them into very different people. Simultaneously with the love between parent and child, the elements of life and rebirth are also closely related to the theme. A relationship between Harry and Sybil, the heroine of the first game. In the good plus ending of Silent Hill, Harry and Sybil escape the town together. Although one could interpret this in such a way as to envision a connection between the two of them, Sybil doesn't appear in Silent Hill 3. The alteration of the opening after clearing the game with the good plus ending invites various speculations. It sure does. Creator's commentary. Sybil is not involved with Silent Hill 3. What happens to her afterwards is left to players' imaginations. Hiroyuki Owaku. But this is one of those important things that's worth pointing out. Even though, personally, I agree with the good ending being the canon ending of Silent Hill 1 message, Earlier in this book, it is expressed through the text that, you know, Silent Hill 1, it describes it as, um, you know, being the correct ending, whereas this direct quote from Owaku is more like, eh, leave it open to the player. So in, in a situation like this, I would, I would pretty much always consider the information that it has a direct quote from a developer rather than something like this where it's written without knowing who is the author of that part of the book um, we don't know if that was a member of Team Silent or someone who directly worked on the game or just an intern who was given notes uh, from somebody else to compile so worth pointing these kind of discrepancies out because a lot of times I have to take that into consideration with bits of information regarding the series uh, and try to make mention of that during my story playthroughs and stuff like that so Hiroyuki Owaku says it's open to your imagination what happens to Sybil if you go by the good ending being canon then Harry killed Sybil because he didn't know what else to do um so, that, uh, where that goes. Tarot card seven. The chariot. Symbols. Negative images related to the pain that Alessa suffered. Since the first game, stretchers and wheelchairs appear as symbols of the other world. These objects are not there merely for the sake of invoking an element of weirdness. You hear that? You hear that every Silent Hill game after this one? Even Silent Hill 4? I guess Silent Hill 4 still is somewhat related to Alessa since Walter was in the same orphanage, whatever. You hear that other Silent Hill games after 4? The wheelchairs aren't there just to be weird. They, they originally had a fucking purpose. The truth is that they are an important hint that indicates the reason why the other world itself exists. Alessa, who originally suffered from severe burns, is the one whose delusions produced the other world in the first and third games. One can think that images related to fire, hospitals, and the like indicate the pain that she constantly endured. Let's introduce a few examples. Flame. God manipulating flame has to do with the fact that Alessa was burned in the ritual of resurrection. The setting sun. After the bad dream in the opening, Heather awakens in the blood-like red of the setting sun. Wheelchairs. The wheelchair is an image that has to do with Alessa during her hospitalization, hospitals, and death. Writhing shadows. The writhing shadows on the surfaces of walls and creatures are related to the burns that Alessa received. So all of those moving, writhing textures, all of that significant to Alessa. 
an afterimage of the nurse Lisa appears in the Otherworld's hospital. Forebodingly, a video image that appears in the first game is inserted during the interval when the hospital undergoes the shift from the right side to the reverse side. Lisa appears along with Valtiel. Could it be that her spirit must continue to endure endless suffering? So this was actually contested for a long time, many years, by many fans. This part of the guide referencing the nurse while you're climbing the ladder here, as you're about to encounter Valtiel, uh, or you see Valtiel spinning the valve, and then you see Valtiel grab this nurse and pull her back uh, from inside this wall once you get to the top of the ladder and go through the door. Uh, it's very easy to miss because you have to turn around and change your camera to see it. But this whole sequence here, it refers to this nurse as Lisa. And that was contested for a long time. Since then, more recently, Masahiro Ito has gone on record uh, on Twitter and stuff and said, yes, this was supposed to be Lisa. The fact that you get the flashback to the videotape with Lisa right before the sequence and everything leading up to it is supposed to infer that this nurse is Lisa. Um, originally, Masahiro Ito said that they were going to create a Lisa model for this nurse, but they ran out of time, so they had to use an asset that they already had made, which is a Fukuro nurse. So the Fukuro nurse, this sort of scantily clad nurse with the short black bob cut hair, comes from an animation short, a music video, that Team Silent made shortly after the release of Silent Hill 2. Um, and that little animation is called Fukuro. Um, so that's what this nurse model comes from. It was just a pre-existing asset that they had already made for a different thing that they had to use in lieu of creating an entire new model to represent Lisa. So this is confirmed now to to be Lisa. The nurse that you see Valtiel constantly torturing throughout Silent Hill 3 is Lisa, Lisa Garland. Her spirit must continue to endure endless suffering, poor slutty Lisa. Creator's commentary. Just before the shift to the other world in the hospital, the nurse Lisa, who appears in the first game, can be seen. The purpose of including this is to show that Alessa's influence on the other world grows stronger as she, reg as she regains her memories. It indicates that even after the first game, she continues to suffer in the other world. Although a nurse appears in a similar fashion in the church as well, this does not have anything to do with Lisa. So... This nurse is Lisa. The exact same nurse later in the church is not. Even though it's the exact same model. That's the one that Valtiel is like, he's doing curls with. <laughs> he's like hanging on to a metal grate and holding her down, like, over a, a, a void, a, a huge drop. And he's, like, constantly lifting her, and then, like, it looks like he's doing exercises. He's, like, curling her up and down. But, okay, Ito, if you say so. This one is Lisa. The later ones are not Lisa. Card 8. Strength. Power of the town. Just what is the effect of the mysterious power of this town that was revered as a sacred place? Originally, Silent Hill was a holy place to the area's former inhabitants. It would seem that although the power of the town was not evil in nature, due to a number of factors including the spread of an epidemic and executions at the prison, the power that this place held was greatly distorted. Furthermore, Due to the large-scale shift to the other world that occurred in the first game, the town has become a great catalyst for the manifestation of people's unconscious minds. It appears to have become a place that beckons to those who hold darkness in their hearts. 
wonderful, succinct description of the town and its power. Silent Hill was once revered as a sacred place. That power has been completely twisted over the course of history. Embody, the materialization of the darkness that sleeps in people's hearts. In the town of Silent Hill, a power exists that gives discernible form to people's innermost thoughts. As for the other world that appears in the series, the town is not merely showing the characters their nightmares, but actually manifesting elements of their unconscious minds. That's a very important distinction. They're not just being shown illusions. It is manifesting them. It is creating them. It's forming real physical beings out of unconscious thought. If the subject's mind is in a state of turmoil, the state of the other world will be chaotic as well. Calling. Those who have guilt are summoned. Due to the appearance of the other world on a massive scale in the first game, the town has become uh, the town has come to be a place that calls those who hold a profound darkness in their hearts. It seems that people with afflicted minds are easily drawn to the other world. So this is something that there's also a lot of sort of debate among fans whether or not the town's power is sentient the way this describes it it seems like the town drawing people towards it is almost just an after effect it's it's a symptom of the distortion that the power has over has undergone over the course of many many years as opposed to the town being sentient and like specifically calling to people, it just so happens to draw people with this profound darkness in their hearts to it, sort of naturally now. Hence why James and Eddie and Angela wind up there and sort of describe it that way. Eddie describes it, and James describes it that way, as like the town has called them. The town calls to those who bear the weight of some crime and shows them what is in their hearts. See, and there's the scene of Eddie telling James, this town called you, you too. Link, he come to town, come to save the Princess Zelda. Transcending time, minds are connected. It would seem that in the other world, time and physical limitations are transcended and people's thoughts are communicated. In accordance with this are the enigmatic phone conversation and Stanley's letters in the third game, as well as the director's letters, among other things, in the second game, the hospital director. It seems that in the other world, the flow of time has no continuity. And yeah, we definitely get that impression from all three games where Time seems to, the, the way time works goes out the window when the other world is, is really ramped up and, uh, and taking effect. The darkness of Silent Hill transcends the boundaries of the town. In the third game, the other world appears even in the shopping mall and subway outside of the town called Silent Hill. It is possible that this is due to Claudia's abilities. However, if one imagines that the human mind is where the other world dwells and holds power, then perhaps the shift to the other side could occur regardless of the location. Well, there you go. All that matters is the human mind where the other world dwells and holds power. Even this is so much nicer and well written of an idea compared to what is presented in something like Silent Hill Ascension's description of a withering, or Silent Hill the Short Message's description of a Silent Hill phenomenon. Even this as an explanation for things occurring outside of the town just because the mind is where the otherworld power ultimately lies, you know, it could occur anywhere, regardless of location, as long as there is a, a tie, a link, between the mind and the other world. Um, that is already so much better. That's so much more satisfying. 
of an answer for like things, strange things happening outside the boundaries of the town compared to like some of the new games so far explaining why things are happening outside of the town. Like it's, I feel like when, when, when giga nerds like me complain about new games taking place away from the town, I think a lot of outside views, uh, outside fans from another perspective just view that as like, oh, you're overreacting. Like, clearly the games can't all just take place in this one location. Like, things have to branch out. And and you're... The idea is that fans with with my thought process are, are overreacting to, you know, ah, the, the games can't take place anywhere other than Silent Hill when that's not the case. I'm very much for different locations and different settings being okay. Just the difference in writing quality, the reason for it happening somewhere else, being a satisfying answer versus being a throwaway line in a note in something like the short message, like, there's a big difference there. <laughs> yeah, and then the writers for Homecoming, <laughs> it's up to you to figure it out. Creator's Commentary. The shift to the other world that takes place outside the town depends entirely upon a unique power. The power that absorbs and reflects what people hold in their hearts is established as being exclusive to the town of Silent Hill. That's from Hiroyuki Owaku. So, despite this basically saying the exact opposite, <laughs> I would trust the Owaku quote. Again, this is how I break down information. I would trust this guy's quote. I would always take Owaku's quote over this from Nameless Author. The shift to the other world that takes place outside the town depends entirely upon a unique power. So the shift can happen outside of the town, but that requires a unique power. The power that absorbs and reflects what people hold in their hearts you know, the stuff that makes everything in Silent Hill 1 and 2 happen is established as being exclusive to the town of Silent Hill. So, like, things can happen outside of the town. The unique, a unique power can cause strange events to occur outside of the boundaries of the town. But the what the town does specifically is unique to that location. And I think that's a good interpretation of it, that the other world you're experiencing outside of Silent Hill in Silent Hill 3 is a completely different power. It's something entirely different than what the town does. It's similar because in nature, it sort of comes from the same source, but it is different. It is distinct. The occult magazine that was dropped in the subway has an article regarding lingering thoughts. These spirits have lost their human senses and memories and can only keep replaying the pain and sadness of the moment they died. More of an allusion to the sequence in the subway of the, the ghost pushing Heather, but it also does play a bit of a parallel to lingering feelings, sort of the, the idea that someone's ghost, even just the feelings of someone being somewhere can remain and be strong enough to cause strange phenomena to happen. Card 9, the Hermit Sound Effects. The meticulously refined sound effects of the Silent Hill series. And they've got a, a fucking pendulum right here. A mechanical sound that is reminiscent of construction site evokes a sense of urgency. There are some really good, creepy, atmospheric sounds throughout the underpass. Lots of random, loud bangs and scrapes echoing through these sort of hallways. 
A sound that is unpleasant in a very visceral way is mixed into the noise. Yeah, no shit. <laughs> These are one of the most unpleasant things to listen to. Fucking uh, pendulums. Creator's Commentary When it comes to sound, what I pursue in particular is a sense of reality. There's a sense that it's not so much music as it is the creation of something that stimulates one sense of hearing, wouldn't you say? There are also places where there is no sound at all. And it isn't that sound hasn't been added, it's that silence is simply the sound of that particular place. Akira Yamaoka. That is a very important aspect of Silent Hill's design philosophy. Uh, the absence of sound or visual. Something simply being a void or silence um, plays such a huge role. It emphasizes everything that comes before and after it. Um, so those moments are and visuals and times of silence are really, really important to the atmosphere of the original Silent Hill games. And again, that's something that I feel has remained fairly consistent throughout the games, even the Western games, mostly because Akira Yamaoka was involved with most of the Western developed games. He's the, like the only person who really stuck around. So the, the music and sound for all of the games that Yamaoka was involved in is, is usually still pretty, uh, pretty good quality. Obviously, it varies a little bit. You can tell Yamaoka put more effort into something like Silent Hill 3's sound and soundtrack compared to, you know, Origins, right? A sound effect design that is inlaid throughout the entire game. The first floor of the shopping mall. While walking down the corridor in front of the payphones, heavy footsteps are heard as if something is being carried. The fourth floor of the office building. When Heather gets off the elevator at the fourth floor, suddenly out of nowhere, a scream like that of a wild beast is heard. And if you've played these moments in the games and, and you're familiar with these, like you should, I, I am perfectly, I know exactly what sounds they're referring to. These are very distinct uh, atmospheric noises that play only in these moments. Creator's commentary. In daily life, complete silence in one's environment is unusual, wouldn't you say? And so, in the same way, things like footsteps and people stirring are inlaid even in the game. One responds to sounds that are not related to the game, and once one is pulled back to reality, one is immersed more deeply into the game world. These sorts of effects are what I'm aiming for. The probability of their occurrence is random so the point at which these sounds are heard should differ depending on the player. Without the importance placed on atmosphere in Silent Hill, its production wouldn't be possible. Right? 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 Kiriyamoka. And I'm glad that this, he emphasizes this, because it's something that I point out in my playthroughs, um, particular sound effects and occurrences, are randomized. Not all of them. A lot of them are very specific triggers and things that can be replicated and done the same way each time, but there are absolutely lots of little random things too. Um, just to add to that personal experience, one person might hear a whisper when they walk into a particular apartment room in Silent Hill 2 when another person might not hear it. So then when you go to like talk to that person about your shared experiences, things don't line up exactly. It adds that little bit of doubt. Um, there's, a, there's a very unique charm about something as simple as a randomized sound effect in the background that can add so much to an experience, not only for one person, but for many people, especially when they come together to share their experiences. The fifth floor of the construction site. Footsteps are heard from the floor above, but the building is only five stories high. That's a good point. I don't think I ever 
really consciously made note of that. When you go in there, I, I've gone in that bathroom. I've listened to those footsteps because they're really well recorded. Like the 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 3D effect of them sounding like footsteps. This is one of those sound effects where I'm like, it makes you take your headphones off. Because if you're wearing headphones when you hear it, it sounds like someone is stomping around above you in real life. And you have to sort of like take the headphones off for a second to be like, that's in the game, right? You have Your brain needs to connect. Like that is not a sound in real life. I'm hearing that in the game. But the effect of it is very convincing. Um, I never, I was so focused on how convincing that effect is. I never really consciously made the connection. Um, I mean, I guess I must have because I've read this book before, but yeah. The building's only five stories high. Where Who's stomping around on the roof? Extra creepy. Hazel Street Station. The payphone rings for just an instant when Heather approaches it. This is one of my favorite things in Silent Hill 3. And the first time I played Silent Hill 3, this very, very simple thing scared the fuck out of me. Uh, that That's one of those jump scare moments that... There's very few jump scares in Silent Hill that stick out to me uh, that I really, really remember from like first playthroughs. I vividly remember Silent Hill 3 playing the first time, walking through the subway. The subway is so quiet. This is one of those moments where Akira Yamaoka is using that silence where all you hear is Heather's echoing footsteps off of those walls. You know, the sound of her boots kind of clicking on those subway tiles and it's so quiet and then you get close to this payphone and it loudly rings once it doesn't ring multiple times it's not like a full ring it very abruptly just rings like one quick time just enough to be like oh fuck like cut through that silence of exploring everything else around and only hearing heather's footsteps such a good moment of audio design and anticipating how the player will explore the area and adding in something to sort of scare them for that. Remember when games had thought? <laughs> it, it Like, this is the type of shit that, that depresses me because it's so rare to play games in the last several years where I feel like even a fraction of this amount of thought went into it. Like, yeah, it's got nice graphics or whatever, but, you know, there's not as much thought put into it. A set piece is sort of just a set piece without thinking about how the sound and the visuals and how the player will explore all of those things are going to come together. And all of the members of Team Silent responsible for these different aspects are working together closely enough and on the same page creatively enough to make all of these things work together to create a memorable experience. The art, the visuals, the camera design, the character animations, the sound design, you know, all of it coming together to create that experience. Um, with a lot of intention and thought behind it. Things don't feel that intentional anymore. You know? Maybe that's just me. I'm jaded and bitter and don't appreciate new games because I'm blinded by uh, nostalgia. We'll go with that. Hey, I just noticed that there are random facts in the original Japanese scans that were not translated. Under this page, it says the sentence, what a wonderful world on the walls in the hospital is an homage to the Exorcist 3. Um, I've read that fact in other sources, um, but yeah, that's also good to note. So uh, there are some things on the Japanese scans that are not translated on this. Damn. I'll have to go back through and, and do some more fair comparisons of 
the Japanese scans? Not tonight, as we're already almost eight hours into this. Oh, excuse me. But uh, we, I might make an addendum to this, uh, this stream, this video, and add uh, some of those little extra things. Thank you for bringing that up, Dr. Freeman. Near the elevator in the church, a piercing shriek like a bird's cry is heard. I know that sound. It does not sound like a bird. Card 10, The Wheel of Fortune. Loop. The immortal Alessa repeats an infinite loop of birth and death. In addition to terror, motifs that have to do with life, such as birth and reincarnation, also become major themes in Silent Hill 3. It may fairly be said that like rotating objects and the crest which is used as a save point, a cycle of rebirth motif is inlaid throughout the game, and Silent Hill 3 is thoroughly filled with this loop. It is worth contemplating the proposition that this cycle is closely linked not only to the work itself, but also to the act of playing the game. The possibility of various profoundly meaningful interpretations is hidden in what Heather says after she understands the significance of the religious organization's crest. And I'm glad that they point this out, too. So that's one of those interesting things about Silent Hill 3, the way that you read notes and the way that Heather comments on things. So there is a book in the Otherworld Church that explains the symbolism of the Halo of the Sun. It explains what the symbol represents. The three inner circles being past, present, and future, and the outer circles representing rebirth and reincarnation. So... That book, if you read that book first and then come into this room where you where the large halo of the sun is surrounded by the paintings of Saint Alessa uh, and the other cult uh, people of reverence. But um, if you read that book and then come and examine this circle, Heather comments on it based on the information that she just read in the book. So she understands what it's supposed to represent, and it gives her some extra profound, meaningful dialogue, how she has come to understand what the symbol means and how it relates to her. She says it herself when you examine this after reading the book. But if you come to this room and examine this circle first without reading the book, Heather's dialogue is completely different because she doesn't have the full understanding of what the symbol represents and how it relates to her. Really cool details like that. Just the order in which you examine things will have an impact on how Heather responds to examining it. How much information she has about it. What could the reason be for choosing a merry-go-round as the setting for the fight with the memory of Alessa? Silent Hill 1 parallels. Because remember fighting Sybil on the merry-go-round? Pretty much it. <laughs> that's, that's my guess for the reason. The, hitting, the hidden meaning of rotating objects. Beginning with the merry-go-round in the opening, and then the handle that Valtiel operates, as well as giant electric fans, rotating objects appear everywhere in the game. It can be thought that these objects suggest the circular passage of time. The revolving merry-go-round symbolizes the repeated reincarnation of Alessa herself. Even the giant ventilation fans that appear since the first game can be seen as overlapping with this cycle. Even the development of the story is inevitably similar. The story of the first game begins with a nightmare, passes through an amusement park, and concludes in nowhere. The third game also starts from a nightmare, and finally comes to an end in a church. One should reach an understanding if one imagines that even the story development, which is similar to a surprising degree, is a phenomenon that loops. Exactly like the first game, in the, beginning of the, uh, in the beginning of Silent Hill 3, the protagonist is just about to awaken from a bad dream. Even more so than that, it's the same environment. 
Harry wakes up from a nightmare in a diner. Heather wakes up from a nightmare in a Happy Burger. Um, the, the condiments on their table are the same. There are so many little detail parallels between Silent Hill 1 and Silent Hill 3 that once you've got a really good eye, a really good thorough understanding of both Silent Hill 1 and 3, uh, you start to notice more and more things that are um, parallels to each other. Again, sort of giving the idea of this looping sort of storytelling. In the final stage of the game, the protagonist comes to wander about nowhere, a realm which is formed from memories. Even including some Silent Hill 1 locations, such as Alessa's bedroom. Again, this uh, location was created originally in Silent Hill 1 and then recreated for Silent Hill 3 by uh, Hiro Usuda. Save and load. Save points equal the crest of the religious organization, which signifies resurrection and the flow of time. According to a book that can be read in the church, the crest of the religious organization is known as the halo of the sun. The three circles drawn in its inner part signify present, past, and future. Couldn't it be that there are two meanings in the fact that this crest appears as a save point, namely that Heather regains her memories as a result of looking at the crest and her time is managed by the player. So there's like a cool double meaning to that. It's not just Heather seeing the halo of the sun and regaining her memories, but because the halo is also a significant symbol representing time, you're saving, you know, as a player, you're sort of pausing time when you save and then continue it. Replaying through it is, again, feeding into this whole cycle, cyclical nature of things. I like when, when it gets kind of meta, beyond just the lore of the game. Aspects of the, the game, the, the player playing the game, are also intertwined into the themes. Even if it's just through something like save points. Each time the player loads a game in the real world, Heather comes back to life again in the game. She's just reincarnating. Every time you load a game, every time you hit continue after she dies, Heather's real, and you're forcing her to live and die over and over again. The crest of the religious organization signifies charity and resurrection, as well as present, past, and future. There it is. There's the note as it appears in Silent Hill 3, this little s segment of a book it kind of explains, or directly explains, what the halo of the sun represents. Creator's commentary. Given that the crest of the religious organization symbolizes resurrection, and save and load are perceived as a cycle of rebirth, it seems that a link to the real world is created. After she understands the significance of the crest, Heather remarks, even if I die, it's not the end. That's certainly convenient, I think. But somehow, I can't help but feel that this is terribly unpleasant. That's dialogue when you examine this big uh, Halo of the Sun here. Uh, the truth is that this is a message to the player. In short, it means as far as the player is concerned, starting over again and again is convenient, but for Heather herself, this is painful. You guys, we can't play Silent Hill 3 ever again. We're causing Heather so much pain. just for our own convenience. Game over and restart. Valtiel, who drags Heather away, is an angel that governs the cycle of rebirth. Upon receiving Game Over in places such as the church and amusement park, a demonstration of Valtiel dragging Heather's body away occurs. Although his purpose is to restore life to Heather, whose body is where God resides, if one shifts one's attention to the real world, it is possible to interpret Game Over and Restart as a kind of death and rebirth. Regardless of Heather's own will, she is brought back to life again by the player, and the story must continue. At the moment of Game Over, Valtiel appears. He drags Heather off somewhere to restore life to the body of the Mother of God. 
Again, these are uh, scenes that do not always occur, but uh, if you play Silent Hill 3 and die in specific areas, in specific uh, situations, you'll get an extra little sequence like this of Valtiel dragging her body off. The handle that Valtiel turns suggests all of these looping phenomena. Creator's Commentary In the religious tradition native to Silent Hill, Valtiel is a being that is close to God. In other words, he is established as an angel. Simultaneously with acting as an agent of God, Valtiel takes on the role of watching over the body of the mother until God's revival. For this reason, he continues to observe Heather without harming her. When a game over occurs, he takes Heather away to restore life to the body of the Mother of God. In this case, there are two meanings to Heather's rebirth. One is that she is reborn as Alessa's reincarnation in the game scenario. The other is that she is reborn when the player retries the game another time. Hiroyuki Owaku. Turning game overs into a canon aspect is terrifying. Isn't it, Jonathan Joestar? It adds a whole nother meta level to the the player experience doesn't it heather is experiencing a painful death and rebirth every time you load the game every time you die and continue Valtiel's like all right bringing her back what in the fact that the developers were even conscious to think of things in those terms It's just, that's so, that's such another level, you know? Such an interesting creative mindset to be in. Okay, card number 11, Justice. Uh, before we continue with Just Ice, um, Card number 11 out of 22. This is basically our halfway point for this this section of the book. So I'm going to take a brief moment so that I can give my vocal cords a little bit of a break. I can refresh my drink, go stretch my legs for a bit. And uh, we will continue on with more Lost Memories, the Silent Hill Chronicle, the official Konami published lore guide for Silent Hill 1 through 3. <laughs> 